have to, first of all, send the stuff to Arbo, and secondly, we have to make sure they're in there. So at the end of the lecture, they have to put their tracker number in the quiz and just enter, and then we it's kind of an attendance sheet. Got um, it. If they, don't, if they don't have a tracker number okay. in the lecture. Oh, there we go. So they have, okay, let's see. It takes 15 seconds or so, Gretchen. So there you go. Good. You're good. Oh, no baseball cap today. <laughs> no, no baseball cap no. for me. So um, we lost everybody who was in the room. So hopefully we can tell them to refresh the page and then they'll get back to us and we'll be here. So Steve, I don't know if you want to do that for folks so they can actually see us. Okay. Okay. You just, you just held your nose, Ed. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing you live now? You are seeing me live. Okay. Also do that in the rooms, you know, the uh, lecture halls. Yep. Yeah, definitely let them know. It's it's running now. Sorry about that. One thing, Gretchen, we can't private message in this, this interface like we used to. So if I have to give a heads up, I'll call or text um, Adam or you. Adam. Okay, so Steve, this concerns you. Uh, I got a call for a, a writing from Ann, Anup Panjawi. Where do I put Arbo CE number in? Did not if see look, it on the okay. registration everybody, page. Everybody, everybody, hold on, hold on. No questions yet. Hold on, everybody. Hello. Oh, I took <laughs> I took care of it. Don't worry, Paul. Okay. 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 Hello, everyone. <laughs> and thank you for tuning in. The technical problem is over, and now we are getting started. Um, thank you for coming out again to see Wire 2020. Um, as you can see, sitting next to me, uh, that's not actually Gretchen Bailey. I know that's surprising to some. Um, but um, in an ironic twist, though, I will tell you this, that my son, when he plopped this thing down next to me, I asked him what the thing's name was, and he said Bailey. So I'm not sure, if he, was, I'm not sure if he was being a wise ass or if that really is the thing's name, but there it is. So, but, um, you know, thank you for all coming out here uh, today again. Um, I didn't expect to be doing this again. I don't think any of us did. Uh, the last time we did see Wire Live, you know, was in February. None of this stuff had happened with this global pandemic, and we didn't expect to be doing the show again. Of course, we are, um, just because obviously now everyone needs CE, so we decided to run it live one more time. So thanks so much for being here today. Um, even though I have this other Bailey next to me, uh, we're fortunate to have the real Bailey, Gretchen Bailey, on the phone. How's it going, Gretchen? Good morning. Good morning. Yes. And so your son thinks I'm a dog. That's okay. I, I still love him. Good morning, Reed. I like I like the haircut, Gretchen. I thought it was good. You know what? That hair on that dog looks better than my hair now. I when I looked in the mirror this morning, I thought, oh my God, I'm going back to my '80s roots because I'm I'm looking a little poofy on top. So. Um, yeah, I think all of our video for anyone doing this, there's a ton of webinars, a ton of Zooms. People are really jumping on to technology that we're going to see either A, lots of bad hair, or B, lots of hats. And what you said about roots uh -huh. is true. 80s roots or maybe 90s roots are a different connotation. They could either be very gray or very dark with blonde hair on the outside. So yep. Yeah, so I'm talking about my, my 80s hair style as well as so my... The highlight. <laughs> uh, Paul here. I, I, so I have an existential optometric question. So if the beauty parlors open up, the salons open up at the same time as the optometrists, who would you visit first? Um, well, me personally, it would depend. <laughs> well, on... you're you're a lady with hair problems. <laughs> well, I am not yet due for an exam, so. <laughs> I would, I would likely go to my hairstylist first because I do not have an eye problem and I am not due for an exam yet, so I am good. I may, however, be visiting my dentist soon because I think I'm going to need another root canal. So um, oh I will be sure to, to update everyone. And just to put a little context there, uh, I had the dubious honor of having an emergency root canal during Hurricane Sandy a few years ago. So, Steve, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. Um, they know, but yes. That, where'd you find somebody open with, with, with electricity? Well, my dentist, who had retired last year, and I saw him for 20 years, he was fabulous. He offered to come into the office for me, and I said I didn't want to put him at risk. So we we waited a day. He called me in an antibiotic, and then I got in the next day when we had a little bit of electricity. But um, 
It was tough to go. We had no power and it was cold. So I told my husband, I can do no heat, no power with pain. I can't do all three at once. I can do one, but not all at the same time. It was not pretty. So. Oh my goodness. <laughs> all right. So guys, b before we, uh, you know, get into the, the dubious chat here, we gotta, we gotta do some ground, <laughs> some ground rules here and, and some grad, some housekeeping before we get going. Uh, I, Kat's told me if I don't do this, then we're all in trouble. So, um, so again, thank you everyone for being here. By the way, the voice is on the phone. If you couldn't figure it out already, I have the infographic up. So it's Gretchen, it's Steve Silverberg and Paul Farkas. So the usual crew is here remotely, thankfully. Uh, they made it because I would die actually doing this on my own. So thank you all for being here. Um, so um, I just wanted to also thank everybody who's attending today. Now, Steve knows this because we talked about it right before we got online. The attendance at the show has been gigantic. Uh, you know, Steve, I don't know what the exact number is today, but it's, um, it's just... It, it's going through the roof. I, I've, I, every time I refresh, there's a lot more people. People need this stuff, and uh, I'm glad we're able to do it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so it's, we couldn't do it without all you guys out there. Obviously, without people coming to the conference, there wouldn't be a conference. So thank, thank you so much for showing up today. Um, importantly, you can plan your day. You can download the course schedule. So again, go to the CUR 2020 site, click on Courses. Download the printable course schedule. It's the easiest way to see what's going on. Um, remember that you can't be in two places at once for your live credits today, right? You have to watch these lectures through one at a time. Um, but uh, we alluded to it earlier. We're planning to redo this event again and again <laughs> and possibly again. And again. <laughs> uh, live, <laughs> if we can get the speakers to agree to it, since Arbo has sort of bent the rules now for a while where you can get these live credits online. So, you know, you might only be able to do 18 or 10 or whatever this weekend, but don't worry, you can come on back on another weekend and we'll have details about that coming up. Um, One thing that comes up, Adam. Mm -hmm. Adam, I, I just have to answer, Paul. One thing that comes up, there are a, a lot of husband and wife teams that think they can watch the lectures together on the same computer. They can't because they have to put in separate numbers. They have to log into with their own logins, which they have, on separate computers, watch it, and then put their, their tracker number in uh, where the quiz uh, is provided so they all get credits for the lectures. So don't watch it together if you're a, a husband and wife or a father and son, etc. cetera. Right. And, yeah, and, um, and it's a 50-minute hour, correct? Correct. Yeah. And there's plenty of time to navigate in the hour to the next course, 10 minutes, and it takes about 20 seconds, if not less, to get into the next course. Right. But, now, but they, they should stay on for 50 minutes. Okay, so, Dad, here's, don't, here's don't up, on the, up on the screen right now. So everyone needs okay. to look at this and understand this and internalize this. And, in fact, Kat asked me to put this up uh, Perhaps we can get it onto the actual conference tomorrow when people walk in in the morning, they can actually see this if they don't hear it today. So, rules for successfully completing live CE. Um, you need to watch the entire lecture. Do not leave early. Watch the entire 50 minutes. Sit there and sit through the whole thing. The computer monitors you. It knows if, that your browser window is open and that you have it um, open and you're watching. So. You know, it doesn't, doesn't uh, turn your camera on and watch you, but it knows that the browser window is open at least, and that's how it tracks your time. At the end of the, the lecture, you'll see a, it's not a quiz. It's, it looks like a quiz, but it's not. It's just got two questions for you. First, you're going to enter your Arbo OE tracker number if you know it. Um, and if you don't have a tracker, which is a question that's come up numerous times overnight uh, that I've answered for folks, put in your license number. Right? You just need something there. Your license number is a great thing to put in if you don't have a tracker number. Because if you put your license number in, you can always look at your transcript yourself and submit it yourself. Right, Because there's a link inside of your control panel where you can get all your credits. Right, They have the transcript. Um, anyway, put in your tracker number or license number. There will also be a box that will ask you, did you actually watch this lecture? <laughs> Obviously, the answer you want to put is yes. Um, and again, this is very much like a sign-in form that you might get at Live C. In fact, it's almost identical to it, right? It's just the online analog of it. And literally, that is all you need to do to get the credit. Once you do those two things, your credit is in and it's processed. Um, there are no quizzes for live credit as long as these new Arbo rules are in effect. And Steve, I believe uh, you told me yesterday they're going to be in effect, what, all the way through summer? Uh, yeah, they will. You, you is that official, or we up to, up until now it's official for for June thirtieth. June thirtieth, but the inclination is that um, as things go, they're going to extend it. So uh, my source said probably ninety percent, which should, in the next couple of weeks be a hundred percent. 
Yeah, so at the very least through June, but probably longer. So again, that's why we're probably going to be repeating these live conferences over and over again a few times. We want to give people value. You can come back as many times as you want. You know, you don't have to pay again. People have been emailing me a ton asking me that too. You don't need to pay again. Your pass and your login is good all the way through October 1st. So you can keep coming back over and over again uh, if you need to. So, um, and, and you can only take 16 hours over this weekend. However, once, once we do it again, you can take another 16 hours. Exactly. So you should have more than enough time to take all your courses for the year. Exactly. And what I'm going to try to do, actually, is get the speakers to agree to similar times for the next time we do it live and the next time so that people, if there are two competing lectures that are up against each other right now, they'll still be competing against each other. So if you watched one at one time, you then can watch the other that's running at the same time the next time. You get what I mean? So I'm going to try to make Good the schedules. Idea. I'm going to try to make the schedules as similar as possible between the live events. Uh, again, it's going to be up to our speakers to want to play along with us. We'll see if we can <laughs> get them to do it. Who knows, right? Um, okay. And um, before we launch into our speakers, um, uh, I think we have a guest coming on. Am I? Am I? Uh, Am I think I, we do. I, I think Ben might be here yeah. now. I think, I okay, so hang on a second. Let me, let me see here. So, uh, so yeah, so before we start talking about the sponsors and stuff, I want to actually turn it on over. Ben, are you there? Hey, guys. Good morning. Hey, how's hey. it going, Ben? Good, man. How are y'all? Doing well. Same Thank old, you same for old. having me. So, so Ben, the reason, yeah, right. The, so, Ben, the reason that I, I asked you here, besides the fact that it's always great to hear from you and it's like a, it's great to hear a voice that's that's from, as we say here in the house, from the before times, from before we were trapped in the house now for <laughs> six weeks. <laughs> um, a time when giant optometrists roamed the face of the earth. Yes. Well, you know, you are actually running a series, which is why I wanted to talk to you. If people go to the Optometry Times website, maybe I can browse over there right now and show people. You're running a series, like a video series, about what your life has been like, um, you know, during this time. And it's, it's pretty cool. Wait, let me see if I can find it over on a... See, Gretchen, you should show me where it is on, on the website. <laughs> Just go to optometrytimes.com. Oh, here it is, week five. Scroll down because all of our new content sits there. Yeah. And we're on week five now. So, Ben, you're looking increasingly bedraggled as the weeks move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's putting it nicely. Um, so every, um, Monday morning ish, uh, for five going on 47 weeks now, uh, I have, um, I have been, uh, just, just walking back outside into the parking lot and, um, updating, uh, updating my, um, experiences with, um, uh, with, um, navigating through the payroll protection loan process and, uh, how I'm handling that, um, how I'm handling staff, how I'm um, how I'm prepping for the the so-called new normal, and I mean I'm not gonna say it hasn't been fun. Uh, I, I wish the alternative was that I was seeing patients on uh, a Monday morning, but uh, it it uh, it is what it is, and um, I don't know how helpful any of the uh, videos have been, but what I really have tried to hammer home is that we're not alone. We're all going through this and I define small business. I've got like four employees. So I'm, I, I, I define the little guy and, um, and we've, 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 we've had as much fun with it as one can have. <laughs> well, I appreciate you doing it Ben, because I think, um, what you say is true. You're showing that people are not alone and you're just giving a little snapshot into how things are working in your practice because most optometrists are in small businesses, whether they're employees, yeah. whether they're owners. Um, a great majority of bodies are in small businesses and they're going through something very similar to what you're doing. And I know it's, it's not fun. Uh, for everybody going through it, but I think it just provides a little look into what somebody else is going through. And even though it doesn't alleviate any of the hardships that people are going through, it does it, it does help a little bit, I think, to know that you're not alone. I I I, I think that it's helped me. I mean, I think it's been it's been sort of pseudo uh, pseudo uh, cathartic. I I I I. I 
talking about it, 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 it it's, it's, it's just a lot, you know? It's a lot. I, I have a liberal arts degree as my, as my undergraduate, and I'm an optometrist. I, I, don't, I never took a business class, you know? Uh, I, I, I turn in all of my work to my CPA once a month, and they say, give us some money and sign here, and my corporate taxes are done. And that's, uh, it, I, I, having to navigate through this process, it's been... It's been a uh, trial by fire for um, a lot of us, you know, and I think that um, I think that there may be some people out there who 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 want to appear overtly like they've got it all under control and that this is what you do and 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 everything's fine. And my trials and tribulations along the way, I think maybe um, maybe they've helped somebody think, well, you know, this guy, this guy's hitting some bumps in the road and, and he seems to think he's going to be okay. Maybe I'm going to be okay too, because we're all going to be okay. Right. We're all going to be really busy. It's just a function of when, and that's complicated by the fact that I live in Georgia. I was just about to ask you that, Ben, um, and keeping the politics out of it, of course, which is hard to do regardless of wherever people sit. Georgia. Good luck is, and Godspeed. <laughs> Georgia is one of those states that's been opening up a little before others. And I know that there's even um, disagreement with leaders in Georgia about when to do that. So what what's your status? Are you going to be opening up soon? And do you need to follow regulations if you agree with them or don't agree with them? What does that mean for you? OK, so my status is um, um, I am. I am adhering to essentially two guidelines here. Uh, I am adhering to AOA through CDC, and I am adhering to my own internal common sense. Uh, If you asked me a month ago, I would have said, yeah, it looks like around the beginning of May, we're going to be slam boozled. There's no way I'm seeing 50 patients next Friday. It's, it's, It's just not going to happen. So I uh, applaud the AOA and I applaud the CDC for um, taking some emotion out of it. You know, we have to we have to follow guidelines. We have to get PPE. We have to. Um, I'm having a couple of polycarbonate sneeze guards made by a glass maker down the street from my office. We 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 have to prep for this. And my opening is going to be a soft opening. And I know that all over the news they're saying, you know, Georgia's opening up. Um, we opened up yesterday. Uh, barbers were allowed to open um, uh, 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 salons, bowling alleys were itemized, uh, theaters were itemized. Um, it, but the real reality of it is that is that the great majority of us are still hunkered down. We're still doing our part, and um, and that's and that's basically where we are. Do I am not open curbed? for routine care. <laughs> Do you, oh, you have curbside um, uh, admissions where people um, stay in their car and then you tell them when to come in? Yeah, so we have um, we have a a um, our building is weird. 120 years ago, it was a movie theater. 60 years ago, it was a bank, um, and it heats and cools like an old building. Uh, but um, we've got these these old double doors up front from when it was a bank. And so you come in, it's kind of like a New York City restaurant where you come in one set of doors and you can get warm and then you go through a second set of doors. There's a little nave there. And, and we're using that as a partition. We're, we're, we're keeping the doors locked now. Um, and if somebody needs to come pick up something, we're just handing it to them through the door. Um, as far as curbside, uh, Augusta's weird. A few hundred thousand people live here, but it's kind of like a big neighborhood. And honestly, I've just been putting on a pair of gloves and I've been putting glasses and contacts in a lot of people's mailboxes. And and we're only doing payments um, over the phone. And and that's um, allowed us to still help people out who need their glasses and need their contacts. But it's allowed us to uh, social distance as well. We're all figuring it out. Ben, do you think that when you do open up that patients will be coming back? Or do you think that uh, patients will be hesitant to jump back into life and come in only still if there's an emergency and put off some routine stuff just because 
you know, just because things are opened up doesn't mean people want to, you know, jump back in and be in a bunch of crowds. You know, that's a really good question, Gretchen. And I want to say that they'll come jumping back. Um, but I also don't want to say that out loud and, and I don't want to jinx myself. Um, I, I, I do think that if we make it overt that we are following guidelines and that, and that we're going above and beyond standards with, with respect to their safety and frankly, the safety of us and our staffs, uh, I think, I, I, I don't think that there will be a, a, a physical hermit crab milieu that will translate into the doctor's office. I don't foresee that, but I just don't know. Yeah. And I think now it's, mm -hmm. oh, I was going to say, I think that big unknown with everything is what's causing so much stress. I think that if everybody knew that, okay, by June 30th or insert whatever date here, everything will be fine. We can go back to quote unquote normal because as humans, we crave normalcy. I mean, we try to create the familiar to make things be normal. And if we knew that we had X amount of weeks or months to get through this, then we could, but it's the unknown that is raising so much anxiety in everyone from um, just socially, when are we going to get out and also financially and economically, when is my business going to come back? When can I go back to work? And that's the really, really hard part that nobody can predict it. And it also changes from area to area, New York versus Florida versus Seattle and Portland versus Kansas. It's all different. You know, Gretchen, I, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. We're all afraid of the dark here. And why are we afraid of the dark? Because we can't see what's in front of us. We're afraid of the unknown. And and it's complicated in my neck of the woods because there is right now, there is a, and this is so sad, there's a political debate in Georgia as to when the peak of the virus happened. People on one side are saying it happened on April the 7th and they have their data. And then people on the other side are saying that it's going to happen in a few days and they have their data. And, and we just don't know. And, and I think you're so spot on. If Dr. Fauci got on TV and said, look, you're going to be able to see, you know, on June the 17th, see a patient every half hour do that for three weeks and then phase up. And if, if we had that structure in front of us, we would be more comfortable in our clinical lives, our fiscal lives, and frankly, our personal lives. Right. The other thing too, I think, um, is that people need to remember just because you hit the peak, it doesn't mean we're done. If it took us oh. X amount of time to get to the peak, it's going to take us X amount of time plus more to come through on the other side. The peak means the middle. So you ramp up and then you ramp down. Just because you hit the peak it, doesn't mean we're done. It, it, and you have to get, when you get on, on the peak and then you get over the peak, you also have to mentally prepare that every time you turn on network news, you're going to hear the death toll continues to rise. People right. are people are continuing to get what well, yes it's going to go up but it's going to go up at 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 a slower rate and it just depends on how you spin it but the peak is certainly certainly a milestone uh i i i can tell you just just from having a family member who's a pulmonary critical care doctor he works in an icu a flu uh, a few blocks down from me we have not hit the peak in georgia yet and we hope too soon, um, but it's just amazing to think a few months ago, flattening the curve, uh, social distancing. I'd never heard any of these. I don't think the term social distancing even existed. <laughs> yeah, I think it's something it's, new that we had for this. Can I pivot back a minute to ask you about your practice? Um, are you, so you absolutely. Said you, had, you said you had four employees. And so yep. are all four still with you? And do you think that all four will be with you when you open? So all four are still with me. Uh, and, and I'll tell you exactly how I'm doing it. Um, our, we used to be a, a movie theater. It's a weird building. It's about 4,000 square feet. So there's room to social distance. I'm there. Um, Monday through Thursday, 
from 9 until 12, and that is to see emergency patients, which I've averaged uh, between one and two a week, um, and and just to answer phone, just to answer the phones, uh, and to keep keep on rescheduling patients as we get different information as to when we can quote unquote open back up. So I've got two employees are towards the front of my office, and they have their own workstation, and they're about 10 feet apart. Um, and they're there from 9 to 12. And then while we are not there, from 1 to 4 in the afternoon, I have an employee with a small child and no child care. And so she comes in from 1 to 4. Of course, we disinfect everything when we leave. And she and her child come in from 1 to 4, and she basically answers the phone and continues to reschedule patients and shift patients around. And... And um, and she's there with her child, and they're the only ones in the building. Um, so, fortunately, I haven't um, I haven't had to um, furlough anybody. Uh, I haven't had to decrease uh, pay. I'm using the payroll protection plan loan in the complete spirit of the bill. But I'm such a small business that I don't have a huge, massive payroll. I mean, what I was asking the government for was was a a a small percentage of what the average loan was. So, yeah, every now and then it's good to be small potatoes. Well, ben, did they also reimburse the doctors for their, say, associate doctors? Um, I know it's up to, I think, uh, $100,000. Did they include that in the loans? Yes, yes. I, uh, I think you, um, uh, you, you adjust your salary to $99,999. Um, and, um, they included uh, that. Uh, they included um, what I pay for my office health insurance. Uh, they include. Um, they um, they 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 come up with uh, a monthly figure for what I contributed to retirement in in 2019. Let's see what else. That was about it. Uh, salaries, uh, state and federal payroll tax, uh, health Rent, insurance, utilities and retirement. So that all that all falls under. And if I use 75% of this loan over over eight weeks towards payroll and the rest towards utilities um, and rent, which uh, I own the practice, my father owns the building, then then it is um, seems to be essentially like a grant. Now what happens if you open up fully? It might not happen in four weeks. You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You're seeing patients yeah. you did. You've got eight weeks of. How does that work into the equation that they're giving you? That's the question I always have. I don't. I don't know that it does. On uh, page two of the loan application, which it's only a two-page application, um, on on page two, you sign basically a good faith um, statement that your business has been adversely impacted by this. Okay. Um, now, if I open back up. Um, I I don't think it means that I haven't been adversely impacted because we're over five weeks now of of I've seen between one and two patients a day. So I'm functioning at less than I've been I've been functioning for five weeks now at less than one percent of my normal patient load. And so I I don't foresee that being an issue for me personally. Now right. if somebody gets the loan for you know, the maximum to get ten million dollars and they're still open and they're still Turning a big profit, I don't know what happens then, uh, and mm -hmm. and frankly, I don't know that the government knows what happens then. I would assume they'll get a knock on their door. Yep. Ben, uh, Paul Farkas, Paul Farkas here. Hey, Dr. Farkas. I'm, I'm just like hi. I'm looking at, at uh, the Leeds stories in the Optometry Times. Why I wear scrubs in the office. Uh, yes. And it, it just the. It, it, it goes with a topic we're doing on OD Wire about all the accoutrements that you need to practice. So the shields, the gowns, yeah, uh, the, the gloves. And, and my question of, to the group has been, and I'm asking you the same question, how do you function with all this space age stuff on you? And are you slowly going to, to, to dis, disrobe as you find you can't work with all the stuff on? What do you think you're going to do? Um, 
You know, that's a really good question. Um, I'm in Augusta, Georgia. I wear khaki pants and a dry fit golf shirt to work. Uh, and, and on the one hand, I, I'm, I'm looking at going to a scrub top just because I think that gloves and a face shield juxtaposed against a master's golf shirt is, 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 is just odd looking. Um, but I, uh, you know, it's a really good question. And I think I'm going to hop on the scrubs uh, train per se. I don't know that any of my gear is going to be quite frankly, sterically hindering. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm used to gloving up the face shield is going to be a little bit different. I'm interested to see how that's going to work with my slit lamp. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the notion of possibly having a, a plastic partition constructed as a shield on my slit lamp. And, um, and, um, and I'm looking to see if anybody it either, either has those or is willing to manufacture one that would, that would take some of the edge off of me. Um, and going forward in the future, I think it's going to just depend on what the virus does, whether we, uh, whether we slowly disrobe in some sort of months long game of strip poker with (laughs) (laughs) COVID-19. But I hope so because I miss the way that things used to be. But I mean, this is, this is our, this is our Spanish flu moment. This is our, you know, hopefully this is my generation's defining moment. Hopefully nothing like this happens again, but I'm, I'm, I'm preparing myself for this is just how it's going to be. Amazing. Ben, can I ask you a question that uh, doesn't relate to the virus? You're of so course. prolific on optometry <clears throat> times, and I, I write articles also. As you know, I had one published, I'll have one soon. How do you have time when your practice is running fully like you normally would and produce two, three, four articles a month along with the footnoting that Gretchen's such an evil person to get me to do right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm glad that you asked. One thing that I learned really quickly when I bought the business from dad is that seeing patients is the easiest part of my day. Um, Dealing with staff is probably the most difficult part of my day. Uh, And uh, dealing with payers is probably the most time consuming part of my day. With that said, um, I do, uh, I do a, a fair chunk of it after the kids go to bed at night and, and I do, I do a lot of it in between patients, to be honest. Ideals will pop up and I'll write it on a sticky note and I'll jot down a couple of hundred words into a, a Word document and I'll just have little puzzle pieces like that going at the same time. Um, and I get into spurts where I'll really churn out like a couple of things at once and then I'll, and then I'll have a dry period for a week or two. And, and, and I know that that gives Gretchen heartburn. Um, <laughs> A perfect example of that, I was a week overdue on my glaucoma column for July, and I ended up scrapping it because I had written it all about the coronavirus, and then I thought to myself, this is being published in July. Who on earth knows what we're going to be talking about in the middle of July? And and so so that was a little bit of a setback, but uh, I get a lot of it done um, on the fly. But thank you for acknowledging that because yes. it's, 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 it's just, you just have to be present in your task and you just ca- kind of always have to have it at least on the back burner. I know how hard it is and to get it, you know, published perfectly um, is, is extremely time consuming. So uh, you're a better man than I am, Ben. Right. And Ben, <laughs> oh my gosh, on, ben, you know, and a big shout out to our, yes, yes. I, I was just going to say, you know, if you want to see how prolific Ben is, if you're looking at the screen right now, take a look at these seven pages of articles in Optometry Times. <laughs> well, Steve, to answer your question, um, it also <laughs> helps if you have Gretchen nagging you for stuff. So it's one thing to do it of your own accord and when the spirit moves you. But when I'm saying, dude, I need your crap like now and I get kind of bitchy about it. Well, you know, that's a little incentive. Yeah, well, um, Gretchen says I, I never encountered seven that. articles by this afternoon or you're done. <laughs> well, and I also I never have to nag Ben. I give Ben a gentle suggestion well. and. He is very, very on top of things. He's rarely late. So kudos to him. He does run a business. Thank you. He has two kids at home. Uh, and that's, 
he does produce when he needs to. He's rarely late. But yeah, I can be a bitch. Well, you need to. You be are my little, optimistic especially... rock. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, I'm dealing with 63 speakers here, 63 credits. So sometimes I have oh my the gosh. Um, uh, same thing. Well, Ben, you're a pleasure, but some people, it's always the same ones. I'll name, mention no names that are um, challenging. <laughs> yeah, that's Silverberg. Right. He's a real jerk. Planes, yeah. Sil Silverberg is always late. <laughs> <laughs> always. <laughs> I don't want to be called late. late Silver. again. <laughs> it does happen, absolutely. And Steve, that's my life with trying to produce a publication. Um, there are people who have more time and who really are interested in writing. And let's also acknowledge that writing is not easy for everybody. Some people are great at it. Some people aren't. For some, it comes naturally. For some, it doesn't. And also, too, this isn't everybody's day job. I mean, your first job is to see patients and to carry your business. And you have family and other things going on. So this frequently is not at the top of everybody's priority list. And I understand that. You know, life just gets in the way and it makes it hard. But I also have a job to do myself. So that's when I nag. <laughs> it bees that way, as we would say in Georgia. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. So do you have any good news to share about what's going on, Ben? Uh, it's a beautiful day today. <laughs> it's <laughs> 78 degrees and the sun's out. Uh, yeah, um, there's, there's, there's always a, a silver lining, I suppose. Um, you know, a good bit of news from me personally is that I've really enjoyed um, having more time with my family. Um, our, our, our kids are nine and 10 and, and they're just really wonderful kids. We've been very blessed on the homeschool front. They're, uh, they're both quite independent with their work and we've been playing, a playing a lot of card games and it's just, it's, it's, it's callously sad to say that a global pandemic had to happen for me to spend more time with my family, but it's been really, really great. I did hear a rumor that the CDC, um, may be saying, um, maybe saying something about um about seeing more than just emergency patients uh if they've already said it i haven't checked this morning yet uh, so more on that to come um and um i just hope that the worst of it gets over real quick and i want to give a big shout out to all my uh former colleagues in uh, the new york city area i want want all them to know that i'm thinking about them as well Absolutely. All yep. right. Well, Ben, thanks for uh, coming on here today. So uh, I hope, uh, you know, you have your big opioid class coming up, right? That two hour uh, epic, which is one of the most widely talked about uh, talks here at CEWire. So I hope it goes well for you today. Oh, man. Well, if they say anything bad, you can't prove a thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's especially needed now, Ben. Uh, many states require it and you've uh, did a tremendous service with it. You hit all the bases that they require on the state boards, at least the ones I've contacted. So, thank you very well, much. Well, thank you very, very much. It's it, it's it it is it is my pleasure to help out. I mean, it's it's I I think I've written less than one prescription a year for these, but there's some ODs that are writing them a lot more than that. And it's if 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 you want to have a a seat at the table, you got to you got to play ball. So here we go. I'm looking forward to it. Now I'll see. I'll see everybody I don't in a few wanna, minutes in that class. I, I, I don't want to give you stage frights, Ben. But uh, Steve, how, what sort of attendance is a class is coming? Ben, it's it's amazing. Have a couple, um, <laughs> yeah, it's you're going to have the biggest most, audience you've ever had. I'm <laughs> juggling seven things at the same time without telling you guys. Um, yes. Um, normally, when we run uh, our convention like we did in February, we'll have the first hour four, maybe 500 people. We've got 2,000 people in these rooms now, and um, wow. a lot of them are, are it's new to them, and they have to be you know, schooled through it. Also, it's a different interface now. I'll tell everybody who's listening, um, previously you had to take a quiz. Well, for the live um, lecture, you don't need a quiz, but we have to know who you are. So they have to enter their OE tracker number in the quiz box or a state license number. So I... People are getting it now, and I think by the end of the day, they'll, they'll be on on track, for lack of a better word. But uh, the tremendous is uh, – well, I think it's, it's it's higher because this is live, and live is live is much more important. You only have 16 hours of this weekend to do live, and so that's why we haven't got – and the interface didn't break down, so the, the bandwidth is supporting it. So not, not would that it, it did work out. 
Yep. Don't jinx oh, it. A lot of, a lot of questions. It. A lot of questions see? and um, in, the, in the regular lectures and, and as you can see on, on this one, but more in the regular lectures. And, um, but people understand once you uh, write it once, they understand what to do, but uh, it, it, they're very well attended. Uh, one of them, uh, who's is the um, one by Madonna, has over a thousand people in it now. <laughs> wow. So there's Madonna. <laughs> so I, I want to, I'll, I'll let you guys know since, you know, we're just, just talking amongst friends, right? I was crunching the numbers last night based on the number of people that have registered. Not only is this conference now bigger than Vision Expo East, bigger than Vision Expo West, certainly bigger than the AOA, it's just exceeded the size of the Academy meeting. Um, oh. And as, far, Ooh, as, as wow. far as we know, it's bigger than SECO too in terms of the number of ODs that have showed up. As far as I can tell, it's either close to being or is the largest conference ever for optometrists. I think we're uh, wow. approaching the NFL draft also, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you have some more. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I don't should put hands on before my lecture. <laughs> don't brag too much. They're going to close us down. Uh, yeah, I'm sure they will. They're going to shut you down. <laughs> hey, and thank you all for doing this. Thank you for oh. doing this. This is a big service. And thank you for um, you know being part of the service. Yeah, I mean, it, we couldn't Thanks do it without you guys. Me. You know, with have, uh, having great speakers, obviously no one would show up because they certainly don't show up to hear us talk. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> uh, gosh. All right, Ben. Well, listen, guys. Uh, much, ben. Thank you all I'm so much. Good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to anticipate questions for my next lecture. All right. Yep. Thanks, Ben. Catch you later, Ben. Enjoy. Hey, thanks, nice guys. Day. Have a great day. Okay. Y'all too. Bye-bye. All righty. You know, Gretchen, I just know him for a little bit. He's one of those truly nice guys that when you meet him once, you know he's just a real person, not a phony, and just a, a sweetheart. I'm sure you know him a lot better than I do. Am I right? I am really, really, really glad that Ben is um, helping out with Optometry Times. He is a really great guy, and I've had the pleasure of seeing his practice. I've been to Augusta twice to have planning sessions with him. His wife is a doll. His kids are adorable. Um, and it's, yeah, he's just what we call good people. He's genuine. He's honest. He doesn't bullshit you. He's got a sense of humor. He's got clinical chops. And he he really does anything that I ask him to. And he always says, how can I help you when he's got a right. lot on his own plate? So, um, yeah. And also not to sell our fabulous editor emeritus short, Ernie Bowling. Um, Ernie was fabulous and still is fabulous to work with. And it was Ernie who brought Ben on board when I came on to Optometry Times. And then I brought Ernie on board. And one of the first things he did was suggest Ben Casella to write our glaucoma department. And then Ben took over when Ernie stepped down as chief optometric editor. So I really have Ernie to thank for introducing me to Ben. And yeah, he really is good people. Yep. Okay, so. So let me, uh, while I have you guys here in a compromising position here, let me actually, since we're in between folks, let me uh, let everyone, re remind everyone how we pay our bills here. So, boink. So, um, this, this year's show happened to have a huge number of sponsors. Uh, as you're looking at the screen right now, uh, you can see the whole list of them up there. We have a bunch of new ones as well that have come on for this sort of extended show. So. You know, I thought by this point I would just be sleeping, right? Um, you know, by the time April rolls around, you're like, oh, I'm see wires done. I can do nothing for a couple months. That didn't happen. Um, and once we announced that this conference was coming back, a few companies decided to jump on board. So you can see like Conan Medical and Optos um, and Luno Technology, MacuHealth. So we have these new companies that came on. And if you uh, haven't had a chance to go to the exhibit hall, I highly recommend it. I'm heading on over there. So. You know, you just click on the link that says uh, Exhibition Hall right at the top, and then you can go into any one of their rooms. Um, a lot of the companies will have staff standing by ready to answer questions for you. And, you know, I can just quickly run through the list of what they're all doing. And, and uh, so first and foremost, thank you to Marco for sponsoring this live stream yet again. Right. I think this is what the sixth or seventh time we've done it now. Um, so Marco, for the first time, set up a booth here as well in the exhibit hall to show off their stuff. Always before they just would 
have the little Marco meatball up in the corner of the live stream and we talk about them. But now they actually have a booth where you can check out what they're doing. Um, and they're more than just auto refractors now too. They have things like the ion camera that you can go check out. So it's pretty neat stuff. Uh, so Marco. I mentioned Optos. Um, they came on board. So you all know uh, of their instrument that takes really wide field pictures. Um, they also have a booth again. Um, one thing that's really interesting about them and, and with most of the companies too, they're not really focusing so much on product right now as they are education, right? So, you know, they, they're part of the global community too. They see what's happening to everyone. Um, so if you go to their booth, I'm sure that they'll talk to you about sales and stuff, but that's not really why they're here. They want to put up a bunch of educational material. So if you go to their booth, you'll see that as well. Um, and I think there are a couple of lectures about wide field stuff uh, at CE Wire today as well. Uh, again, Conan Medical, they came on board. Um, we did a couple of webinars actually for them recently with Craig Thomas, and uh, he'll actually be talking to us tomorrow. They have a bunch of stuff um, that they have on sale in their booth. I don't want to run through it all right now because <clears throat> the list is extensive, but go to their booth and check it out if you're, if you're interested uh, in what they're doing. Uh, Mackie Health, again, new sponsor, um, supplement company, so you can go check out their booth as well. Um, you know, this is, the, I think, the second supplement company that we've had do this. And Steve, I think you're, uh, you use their product in your office, right? Yep. Great, great product. Um, uh, we got it about five years ago, the cell counter, and uh, we also um, uh, used a couple of their little devices, and uh, it changed our practice. Uh, we picked up a lot more uh, Fuchs Histofree. Uh, we were sc scanning pretty much Health. Mackie Health. Um, uh, I love John Nolan. His lectures are fantastic. He's brilliant. A PhD out of um, Ireland. Uh, uh, the the concept he's using is that there's three pigments, and he proves scientifically that the zeaxanthine is much more important than lutein and zeaxanthine um, separately. And his science is impeccable. And he doesn't work for the company. He's an independent uh, scientist. So, um, and I love his. Uh, his Irish brogue also when you listen to his lectures. <laughs> I was going to jump in and say that, Steve, that even just listening to his lecture, simply to hear him speak in his accent is worth your time. <laughs> oh, and we just had a question. So sorry to interrupt. We just had a question in the live stream that I really feel like I need to answer because it might not be clear enough. When you're in uh, the conference, there's a link that says exhibition hall at the top, and that's where all the booths are located. So go into your CUI interface, you can see it on the screen right now. I have mine up. Click on Exhibition Hall, and then you'll see all the sponsors' booths, and you just click on it. So, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> um, so, I guess we can continue on. So, Luno Technology, another company that has decided to jump on here uh, at the last moment, which is fantastic. So, um, Paul, even you might be familiar with some of these brand names from, from the good old days, like Brio. Um, but they, Luno is basically a bunch of these companies all put together uh, and they have a wide variety of technology that you can use in your office. What they're really focusing on right now, you know, as, as Ben was discussing, the sort of new normal of staying away from people and doing social dis distancing, um, a lot of their products can actually help with that. So uh, you could check out the different technology that they have um, in terms of the refractive technologies to try to sort of um, you know, distance yourself from patients, at least, uh, you know, in the short term, I think it's going to be a very important thing, if only for the uh, peace of mind that the patients have when they see you. So HOG, again, thank you for sponsoring the conference. They're back again. You know them for their octopus and other products. Check out their booth. I actually uh, tried contacting them late last night because I wanted to make sure their discounts were still good. Uh, when I find out, I will let you know. Um, Neurovisual Medicine Institute, again, this is a, an interesting new concept. Um, talking about Prism and Steve, you know, you're, you're the optics man, right? You're, mis you know, you're, you're, the, you're the MIT guy. Um, yes. Um, <laughs> so you want to, what do you want to know? Uh, I, in, I mean, in, um, I, I look at this and I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but you, you probably do. Um, you know, so the, the idea yep. of, of Prism uh, and strain. Uh, it, it, absolutely. And uh, it, it's a lot more complex than neurovisual uh, uh, Institute does a great job of explaining it far better than I do. So I, I know the basics. Um, I, I learned it in both uh, uh, graduate school and in optometry school, and the science has come a long way since. Uh, and a lot of it is uh, neurology, a lot of it is psychology, but uh, apparently the people who uh, uh, 
learn from this institute really uh, will love it, and it's uh, a great enhancement in, in binocular vision. So yes, the 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 concept is not the typical four-year prescribed prism, and and the person feels better. It's a lot more complex than that. Um, but when you when you do take their courses, uh, you understand more of how to prescribe, and you'll have a lot happier patient base. Uh, you'll have a lot more success, and and you'll set yourself apart from other ODs and MDs for that matter. Yep. Um, tear care. So again, the tear care device, and uh, I should probably put it up on the screen for people who've never seen one of these things. Let's see if I can get it up there for people. So this is for MGD, and let's see if I can get their site up. Slowly but surely. Oh, did COVID get to their site? Maybe. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so this is a device for MGD, and uh, see if we can actually show some pictures of it. So, uh, real easy to use, small, which is the, to me one of the most interesting things, right? You look at the industrial design of this thing, and you think about where these products were years ago and where they are now. And not only are they much cheaper than the olden days, but they are also much smaller. Um, so Tear Care, you can check them out as well. And let's uh, pull up our next one here. Okay, and so VTI, so Natural View, um, so they make a, a custom multifocal lens. And, you know, between you, me, and the lamppost, people use this for myopia control, or should I say myopia management. Um, so, Steve, is this something that, that uh, you ever engage in? Adam, you know me. I didn't engage in it. I started it. Actually, <laughs> not, not to blow my own horn, I, I started doing um, CRT, which was the original ortho K, uh, back about 15 years ago, doing it just so kids didn't have to wear glasses. And later on, the signs came out um, that um, it does do something with the cornea too, uh, not to get too complex, but it does something where the peripheral rays focus in such a way where the eye doesn't grow. Um, I've done lectures many times, uh, mainly with my uh, partner, Tammy Petrosian, and uh, it was on myopia control using uh, all three methods, <clears throat> one of them being the natural view lens, that lens um, does the same thing as the orthokeratology in terms of the science, and then there's atropine that you can use also. But uh, we have been using this lens, and it does work really well. And for children who don't want to wear the, um, I shouldn't say children, adults want to do it also sometimes, uh, but who don't want to wear the lenses at night to reshape their cornea, it works, um, we think, statistically as well. Now, there's no double-blind studies yet, but they're coming out. Uh, Jeff Cooper's talking about this uh, in the lecture today, and uh, it's a fabulous product, easy to use. It's also just a, a one-day lens. And it's also good just for simply people with uh, presbyopia. Uh, it works really well uh, compared to a lot of other multifocal lenses on the market. Right. So, yes, I've uh, been doing it for years and uh, uh, tremendous success. Uh, the, I, I'd say in the upper 90 percent, people are happy with what happened. You're not going to cure it. You're, you're not going to stop it completely in many cases, but you're going to certainly slow it down. And the final outcome of the patient is just better. Right. One of the great, one, of the great uh, one, one question. My question would be, well, while you're on this subject, do you find that the Asian market is easier to convince us about orthokeratology? I purposely didn't do that in this day and age because they'll be accusing me of racism or whatever, but we live in a well, community. Well, we'll be am among friends. <laughs> among friends and, and truthfully, we live in a community uh, where there's a large uh, affluent Asian population. Probably the first five years, because they a lot of them came from China, the parents, uh, either Taiwan, mainland China, or Hong Kong, was 95 to 97% of our patients, and they would refer other people. Over time, it's maybe 80%. So the answer is yes, they take to it. They're more knowledgeable about it, and they understand the science, because most of these are uh, software engineers, et cetera. So absolutely yes, the Asian population, if you live in the community of that, we gave a talk at an Asian um, uh, Chinese school, not Chinese in the respect of uh, Chinese, Chinese with the fact they were learning Mandarin. And the next day we had 30 calls to come in. And, and since then, we, we give a talk every single year to that same school and others. So if you cultivate that population, they have friends who are uh, other 
ethnic backgrounds, and they will uh, tend to refer them. Uh, so ab absolutely, if you have a, if you're on one of the coasts, uh, California, Washington, Port, uh, Oregon, where you are, I know I pronounced it wrong. I'm sorry. Or on the East Coast, where I am, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, there's a large Asian population, and uh, cultivated. They're nice people. They're smart. Um, they are very smart. They're challenging, and they, they do understand the science, which makes it a lot easy to present. Right. Well, you know, so, Steve, absolutely. I think Jeff Cooper hits on it a little bit in his lecture that we in the United States are actually far behind what they're doing in Asia, yep. where most of the, the trials are coming from. I mean, that's where he drew a lot of his work from in his lecture. Yep. I think what will open it up is Cooper. Unfortunately, that lens was supposed to be uh, released, the MySight lens, mm. uh, as we speak. I think it was June, and that's the first Remember, all the stuff that we've been doing is off-label, whether it be natural view, whether it be orthokeratology, whether it be atropine, has been off-label use to control myopia. The MySight lens is the first approved lens uh, for myopia control. Unfortunately, it, uh, I, I assume they're going to delay the release because nobody's going to be fitting it. Uh, but that will open the doorway, I think, to the general American public because they'll promote it, they'll market it, and people will understand what myopia control is and we can get into which is best. Sometimes I, I actually would do combinations, by the way. I, I lectured with Mark Bolimore at the Academy a few years ago, and I was the first one to propose, um, I think I was, the, to use the combination of soft contact lenses, maybe with orthokeratology, maybe with atropine, because it seems like one plus one equals three, and now um, all the gurus are doing it. I did it because I just thought it was uh, common sense. Uh, not, well, I won't get into politics. And, <laughs> too many easy things. And, to and, <laughs> and just for, so everyone knows, we're going to be talking to Mark Bullimore tomorrow. He's giving a lecture here, and we're going to catch up with him on what the very latest science is around myopia yep. control. So that'll be pretty cool. Um, okay, so let's let's move on here. We have a lot of sponsors this year, man. <laughs> um, so Zeiss, of course, Zeiss is one of the, the big supporters of the show, and thank you to them. We're going to be speaking to the folks from Zeiss today and tomorrow uh, as well about their different devices and what they're up to. I think uh, many of you actually probably attended a little show we did for Zeiss a couple weeks ago, um, you know, right, right when the, the pandemic was just revving up. Uh, Zeiss came in and offered a ton of educational content for people who were trapped at home. Um, so thank you to them. Zeiss actually does have a bunch of offers in their booth, um, both on their, their OCTs and their wide field cameras and so forth, and even their forum software. So go into their booth to check them out. Um, I can't possibly run everything down here because it is extensive. So again, just go to the exhibit hall link um, and then click on the Zeiss logo and you can get in and see what they're doing. So pretty cool stuff. Um, you know, they've been a great supporter of the show and I can't thank them enough. Um, I also can't thank them enough for giving us a lot of educational content too. Uh, you know, they, they are churning out a ton of it and I know that just from the statistics, the lectures that we do on OCT are some of the most popular, even the basic ones, uh, like Mark Fried, Friedberg's lecture on OCT, incredibly well attended. Um, so it's definitely a popular topic, so check it out. Yep. We'll have 2,000 people this, uh, today. Jeez. But it, it's amazing, and people just going in uh, in droves. I, I was worried about the interface, but uh, let's well, just take a look. I'll, I'll share something with you guys. I was actually up last night sweating bullets, worrying about the software. Um, forget about the live stream conking out. That doesn't matter to me as much. I was really worried about the, the core software um, because, as Steve, as you noted last night, we just got a flood of people coming in. Uh, registering even overnight like I was up because I couldn't sleep and I saw people registering even at 3 in the morning and I'm like wow <laughs> this is uh, you know going to be challenging but the software is, has held up really well so you know knock wood um, so AB Max for anterior blepharitis it's that little uh, Dremel looking moto tool kind of thing um, so check them out at the show. They also are running discounts, and i got to find what they are here. They have show specials going. We're going to be talking to John Choate from AB Max later in the day, I believe, or tomorrow, one of these days, um, talking about what they've been doing, you know, with everything that's going on in the world uh, and how the company is going. So um, one of the nice things about their device versus the competing device, whose name I won't mention, is that the consumables for this one are much cheaper. And I, I think they're almost half or something like that. Um, so you might want to go check them out. Oh, their offer is they're offering a free device if you invest in six boxes of tips. And they're giving two additional boxes of tips to practice with during your time at home. So you can practice on your family members. <laughs> um, they're also providing certifications for as many staff members as practices would like and providing zero financing on the device for 90 days. So. I don't, don't do anything. I 
So okay. let's see. Uh, I have a little issue, so I have to deal with the the tra the quiz in Dr. Nolan's lecture doesn't um, come up, so I'm going to uh, email Cat now to get rid of it. Okay. To get, take care of this version. Yep. Uh, yeah, Dr. Nolan. <clears throat> Okay, well, I'll keep going here while you do that, Steve. So, yeah, Kat is around, and she's, she's, she's running back and forth, so she's doing a really great job taking care of everyone. Um, I'm going to try to I'm gonna yeah. call her on my cell phone, yeah. but you talk ahead. I'll okay, so Neuralens. So, again, you know, we were talking about PRISM before, uh, and Neuralens makes a complete system. So, um, essentially, it's a device that can actually measure how much PRISM uh, to put into a, a pair of specs, and then they also manufacture the lenses as well. Uh, we've, you know, I have a pair here. They're they're great. Um, Gretchen, I know you have a pair as well, um, and uh, you know we. Yep, I, sorry, I was I was muted. I do have a pair, and I thank Neuralens, and I sit in front of a laptop all day long. Well, actually, my big monitor, and I have noticed a difference. It does feel. I guess I I, my, my eyes feel a little more relaxed, and I haven't gotten as many headaches. So, right. I'm going to mute Steve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he forgot that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's it's funny, you know. I wonder if because of the way we're using devices more and more these days, if if this is a thing, you know, that Neuralens, it's sort of time has come. Uh, whereas back in the old days, perhaps people like you and me wouldn't have spent like this extreme amount of time in front of a computer, where we wouldn't have noticed as much. Exactly. Yeah. And also we're in, in a position where we can hear about these new technologies and have the opportunity to try them. So I am an N of one and I have found that it worked and it might be simply because of other visual problems I had as a kid because I did have and I still have a little bit of resultant amblyopia. So that could be it. It also could be because I am sitting in front of uh, a monitor for far longer than other people do. But I found that they work for me and I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to try them. Yep. So check them out. So Oculus, another great friend of the conference. They've been here with us, I think, since the beginning. Um, you know, we're going to talk to Barry Iden later in the day today. Uh, and maybe talk a little bit about how he's using their instruments in his practice. So obviously he's a big contact lens practitioner, uh, also does a lot of dry eye stuff. So check out their booth as well. Um, you know, I've had direct experience with uh, with the the Pentacam as Charlie McBride tried to fit me in scleral lenses. We wanted to see what it was like for someone with a normal cornea to wear a scleral multifocal. So it was a really cool experience. Um, so, you know, more and more docs are using uh, the sort of advanced features of Oculus's instruments to fit sclerals much more easily. So check it out. Uh, Science-based health supplement manufacturer, they make Hydro Eye. So again, you want to check them out as well in uh, their booth to see what kind of specials they're offering um, on their supplements as well. And then when Steve comes back, I think he can speak a little bit to this one too. So nice to have him, Steve, around because he can actually speak to these things in his practice and how he's implemented them. Um, Covalent Careers, so this is the number one site if you're looking to uh, get a job in eye care or looking to hire someone, an optometrist or optician, um, in eye care. And I'll, I'll unmute Steve just, just in case he's, uh, he's back. So, <laughs> Sorry about that, Steve. Um, so what happens is that if... Uh, I'm going to mute him again. <laughs> he's trying to explain to Kat what's going on. Um, so anyway, Covalent Careers, so number one job site in eye care. Um, they're offering right now, if you go to their booth, 10% off if you want to put a job listing uh, on their site. Um, so you might want to check that out. Covalent's also been great um, during this whole uh, you know, COVID-19 pandemic. They're running a great series of articles on their site about how doctors can navigate you know, issues around basically what Ben spoke, spoke about, right? Keeping your practice running, obtaining loans and so forth. They're keeping abreast of all that and summarizing it in a very clear way for docs. Um, so definitely uh, check them out. iCare Live. So this is another company that uh, in the COVID-19 era has sort of come, come uh, into the fore because they make telemedicine software. Um, so you can actually do telehealth at home. And I've spoken to a bunch of people now who since February have implemented their system and are using it to see patients. Um, again, instead of just using an unstructured tool, something like Skype, they're using this, which is very structured uh, and can really integrate itself into your practice. Um, so I Care Live, you might want to check it out, especially if you're doing a lot of remote exams now. 
uh, iCare Pro. So again, if you have a practice and you need to market it online, and everyone does, don't try to do it alone. Do it with someone who actually does this for a living. Um, they can help position you on social media better. They can help promote your website. You know, make it so when you show up on Google Maps, people will actually see you and see decent reviews. <laughs> Um, because these days that's a very important thing, right? How you appear on Google or Yelp can determine whether or not people even give you a second look. Um, and right now, in fact, since you have some downtime, right, since most of us are sort of trapped at home, this might be a good time to reevaluate your social presence. So when this is all over, uh, you're coming out of it in a better spot. And it's clearly something you can do from home, right? You don't have to go into the office even to work on this. So cool stuff. So Lac Rivera, maker of punctal plugs, they are offering a huge number of discounts. So big, in fact, that I can't run down the entire list. But if you go into their booth, they have a huge price list with discounts for the show. So go in and check them out. And Optometry Times. Gretchen, do you want to say a few words about your esteemed publication? It is certainly esteemed, Adam, and yes, I will. Um, first, thank you so much for the opportunity to allow us to help support CE Wire and for allowing me to join you on the live stream. So Optometry Times, we are written by practitioners for practitioners, and we provide content anywhere that ODs want to consume it. So if you want print, we got you. You want email, we've got three email newsletters a week, sometimes a little bit more. Right now we have a special one going out on Sundays that's summarizing all of our COVID-19 coverage. And we also have a digital edition. Um, we've got podcasts, we've got videos. So any way that you like to consume content, we have you covered. And also to anybody who's interested in writing, I'm always looking for new perspectives but we aim to give you what you need to know in short, easily consumable, easily digestible chunks. So thanks very much for reading, and I'd love to hear from you. All right, and thank you for being here, Gretchen. You know, we couldn't do it without Gretchen, you. Gretchen, I, I have a question about uh, where English is their second language. Do you assist uh, any of the writers to help edit their product so they're, they'd be comfortable submitting, but they're not 100% sure of the grammar Etc. Do you, oh, you assist? That's a good question, Paul. And actually, the answer is yes. And that applies to anybody. I edit everything that goes into the publication. And if there are any errors, they land squarely on my desk. Sometimes it goes through the editing process a few times, depending upon who the author is, what the content is. Sometimes we send it out for people to review. But I think it's part of my job to help develop new writers, whether that person is a student, a resident, an established OD, or somebody who doesn't speak English as a first language. And we have had some authors uh, where I've needed to edit a little more heavily because somebody isn't a great writer for regardless of the reason, whether it's language or not. Some people just aren't great writers, but have great ideas to communicate. It's my job to help those people get their information out there. So absolutely, yes, I will work with people if they need help with grammar or if they even don't know where to start. That's my job. Well, fun fact about Gretchen, she'll edit you whether you want it or not. I mean, I've written press releases <laughs> before and she just tore them to shreds. It was like a sea of red ink. So it's uh, she's very <laughs> thorough and, that's why I, and that is why Optometry <laughs> Times reads so well. That's why it's, it's the journal that it is. Um, also, another thing, you never want to play boggle with her, ever. Don't just just <laughs> do not <laughs> unless you want to feel really bad about yourself. Oh, come on. <laughs> Reed still talks about it. The Great Boggle Massacres. So anyway. <laughs> oh, poor Reed. <laughs> um, well, Gretchen, thank you for being here, though, because, uh, you know, we really couldn't do this without you. You know, the dog is no replacement. So um... <laughs> I will take that as a high compliment. <laughs> so uh, optometry time. So let's. Um, move forward here, Vision Equipment Inc. So this is Leo Hadley's company. He's gonna be talking to us later this afternoon. And <laughs> I sent him an email earlier in the day. He was frantic. Um, you know, they have a bunch of equipment now that is um, sort of bank owned <laughs> since February. <laughs> How do I say that nicely? <laughs> um, so, you know, Leo's stock and trade is used equipment. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of practices have gone under. And so there's nearly new equipment that's floating around out there. And he's going to tell us all about what he's got and sort of, he's not happy about this either. You know, obviously he wants to see people succeed. So when he was telling me this, you know, I could almost 
I could almost just see the, the pain look on his face while he was writing it. But, you know, obviously he's got all this equipment now, so we'll talk to him about it. Um, and that's it. So those are our sponsors. So thank you to, uh, to everybody. And hopefully... Hey, Adam, mm -hmm. I'm seeing a, a question in the live stream about um, what happens after you complete a course. Would you be able to quickly review that? I'm thinking we might need to do that maybe after every time you run through the sponsors Indeed. just because new people are joining in. Yeah, let me pull that up again and, and show people. Uh, and in fact, what I want to do is actually I'm going to put this as a promo when this day is over today. I'm going to put it so when they walk into the classrooms tomorrow, they'll be able to uh, to see this. Uh, let me put it up here because this is a, it's a huge issue that people aren't, and, and I get why they're confused, right? Because this is an Arbo thing. Um, so if you take a look here, when you take a lecture, if you want credit for it, step one, watch the whole thing. Do not leave early. The system is tracking you. Uh, it's making sure that you're actually watching the whole thing. So do not go anywhere. Um, number two, when it's done, you'll see a, a little form. It's not a quiz. It's just a place where you fill out your Arbo OE tracker number. If you don't have one of those, put in your license number. You got to put in something. Um, there's also a box that you need to fill out that asks you, did you actually watch this? <laughs> and obviously you should put yes. Um, and that's all you need to do. If you take that, that step, the credit will be recorded properly. We're going to submit it to Arbo if you give us a tracker number. And also in your web interface, you have a spot with your certificates that you could actually download yourself if you want to, because some people like to submit them manually. And that's all you need to do for live credit. Again, this is just for live credit and just because of Arbo's temporary rule change around live CE credit online. If you watch on demand, the quizzes will come back. You will have to take them in order to get a certificate. So thank, thank you for that, Gretchen, because yes, it is really important that we remind people. Oh, hey, Adam, um, I have a an update to the question. So a couple of people are saying is that there is no spot to uh, to input the OE tracker number. So it, it just asked if you attended. Uh, so shall I alert Steve and he can let Kat know so that everyone, every lecture should have a place to enter the tracker number? Correct. It's possible that on a couple of the lectures they omitted that form, but definitely let Steve know if you can. Um, okay, will do. Yeah. And again, this is all sort of happening so quickly for us. We've never had to do this before. When Arbo made this rule change, it all of a sudden, CWire was still running when Arbo made this change. And we had to, in the software that's actually still running, we had to make these changes live. So it's not the kind of thing where this happened in the off season and we had time to tinker with the software. No, 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 we had to do this while the software was still running. So we might have a glitch or two on this first day, but we'll figure it out. Um, okay, we'll and, get into it. Okay, thank you. And I think that we have another call coming up right now. And let me check this out. I think, I think, well, let me look here. Hang on for one second. Sorry about that. I'm just uh, trying to figure this it's out. It's Jocelyn Hamilton from Marco. Yes. But that's not Jocelyn. Thank you, Paul. That's We're not... all juggling so many different things. <laughs> yeah. So hang on one second. Let me change this. Yeah, this has been, it's been quite a day. Um, quite a day, actually, for us here. It's just been... <laughs> Let me find uh, Jocelyn's picture. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Okay. Yeah, I've had... Uh, going to need a stiff drink when this is all over, so... A stiff drink, singular, Adam? Numerous, numerous stiff drinks. Okay, there we go. And let me fix this. So you're watching this in real time. There we go. <laughs> okay, that looks better. Okay, excellent. Hey, Adam? Yep. You need to unmute Steve because he's calling to tell me that he can address this and um, you okay. still have him. Okay, let me unmute him before we get to Jocelyn. Let me, Steve, what's the word? 
Okay. Can you hear me on this? Yep. Okay. The word is this. It's not a problem. All the quizzes are there, but you have to say it's the quiz box that they have to enter into. When they enter into that, often it's a 10, 15 second delay. It churns. You have that little um, uh, circle on the left-hand side of the quiz, and then the two questions appear. One is a box that you just put your OE tracker number in, and one says, yes, you attended the lecture. But they have to wait sometimes 10 or 15 seconds. I had to do it also myself. And if they don't, they just have a blank screen. So you have to, it's the quiz tab that they have to click to enter their OE tracker number, and then they answer another question. Now, it is true, by the way, I did it on myself because I didn't attend some of the lectures. When I didn't attend the lectures, um, and I tried to um, verify the quiz, I got a message, no, you didn't attend this lecture. So it is doing the right thing of timing people out. Good. So simply put, they have to uh, be patient and wait, and the quiz box will appear, but it doesn't appear immediately. Um, it takes about 10 to 15 seconds on my computer, and I guess it depends on the bandwidth and the speed of your, your connection. All right. That's good the, that's good to know. Good to know. Thank you, Stephen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually cut a little video so tomorrow when people enter the classrooms in the morning, they'll have that notice. Um, and again, um, this is all just because we had to do, do this on the fly because of Arbo's rule changes. So, all right. So, Steve, if you want to let everyone know in the chat sessions and everywhere else what's going on with that, that would be great. Yep. Okay. I'm going to all the rooms and, and doing it now. No problem. Okay, cool. So, with all that said, um, so, uh, Jocelyn, are you there? Hi, yes, I am here. Ah, perfect. Hello, Jocelyn. Thank you for coming morning. this morning. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> the picture was pretty funny there. Yeah, that was funny. Yeah, so what what happened was we were and this is literally seat of the pants. We've never we've never had an experience like this before. You know, suddenly we we had like a, a crush of new people and new rules that we had to process for this weekend. So it's been kind of crazy here. Um so thank you for for coming out though. I know this is your first experience with CEWire. Hopefully it's been amusing so far. <laughs> Yes, it's been great. Thank you so much for having me. So, you know, I, I asked you here because I wanted to kind of know what Marco has been up to, you know, over these, these past few months. Um, you know, we've all been trapped in our houses, and I'm kind of wondering what, what's been going on with the company. Yeah, um, exactly. I know these last few weeks have really felt like uh, several months. Um, uh, you know, for us, it's it's been challenging, just like everyone else. Uh, we've had to adapt and kind of do things differently. Um, with the direct sales team across the country, it's been a big shift. Uh, you know, it's not a good selling environment anymore. So it's really shifted into education and doing things as a company, educating um, through webinars and uh, really taking the opportunity with staff having a lot of downtime within the practices of doing a lot of virtual trainings, uh, things with our customers to uh, just give them a, a better advanced uh, skill set for the technology that they had already had in their practices um, and just you know doing things that other companies uh, this morning have mentioned with CE and things of that nature um, and just just really just kind of being there to support the, the practices and the doctors out there right and you know you have a great overview of the entire market right because you know whereas individual doctors know what's going on in their own practices you're getting to see what's going on across the country can you sort of tell us what, what you're seeing and sort of the best practices that you're seeing out there right now for, for doctors? Yeah, certainly. So, um, you know, doctors, uh, I think I think everyone's getting sick of being cooped up for so long. And, um, you know, some, some practices have been seeing the emergency patients. But I think overall, um, we're hearing across the country a lot of uh, practices wanting to get back to work and start seeing patients again um, and start being there to... Um, uh, meet all the needs of their patients. So um, we're we've been looking at what what are the best practices of what we can do to um, assist with that, and and where we're the experts really, or when it comes to the exam room and the eye exam specifically, uh, referring to refraction and the slit lamp portion of the exam. Um, so really, we're we're kind of breaking it down almost to three different levels um, of stages rather that we see. So uh, like for example, the refraction portion. So we have uh, the TRS is one of our many refraction systems. And what the TRS can allow you to do is incorporate that social distance that everyone's talking about into the exam room uh, because the keypad for the controller for the floor after 
literally allows you to sit six feet back from the patient. Uh, so, you know, that's obviously key right now. Um, as well as uh, on the slit lamp, we have what's called the ion imaging system. So the ion uh, incorporates the Apple technology and allows you to use a heads up display and that still give you about two to three feet back from the patient. Now, as one of the things that we're learning is, you know, it's the obvious, right? For the slit lamp, you can instruct the patient not to talk and you have a breath shield there. Um, but on the refraction portion, obviously the patient needs to be talking and giving feedback. So, you know, that's the six feet uh, comes key into play there. So that would be what we're recommending is kind of the level one stage um, of applying that social distance in the exam room. But then to take it to level two, what's really cool and it's kind of kind of jump started what we're we're doing with our products are um, the any customer of Marcos that has the refraction system already, not just the newer model, the 6100, but our previous model, the 5100, those uh, refraction systems were already built with the ability to have remote operation. So those customers already have that capability. So we're really now educating them to what they actually have now and how important it can be with just a simple addition of uh, a software that we have. And it's, it's finalized, it's complete, and it's ready to implement and it's called Infinity. And so what Infinity would allow a Marco customer to do right now is remote capability of that four after. So it would be the same as if they were in that exam room, but they can actually do it from say a back room in the practice or even from their home if they need to. Uh, so then um, the same thing with slit lamp, which is, would be networked and you could just use like a mirror 360 or team viewer. And again, allow you to do that uh, from another remote room. And so that would be level two, where you're gonna minimize the doctor's time in that exam room, you know, which is also key. So I can envision that happening if you have a high risk patient that you're seeing, or if the doctor you know, comes down with a cold or is exposed to COVID-19 themselves, um, or you know, even just having that ability where Let's say you're, it's a Saturday or Sunday and you have the, a patient comes into the practice and you need to do that quick refraction. You can actually do it from home versus, uh, you know, having to run into the practice to do that. Um, so that's what I would kind of categorize as a level two. And then bringing it to a level three would be what I would explain as that's going full um, telemedicine, which uh, the refraction systems also have that capability. Um, and that would be implementing or partnering up with uh, a third-party company that's a full telemedicine. Um, there's two big companies out there now, um, 2020 Now or uh, Digital Optometrics, um, which our products work with both. And I see that as being key where, um, say, a, a practice wants to go um, just full telemedicine and doing remote exams uh, with everything, you know, for diabetics and full comprehensive exams, and even use, utilizing then their solutions for um, for example, they have, uh, you know, um, staff to do uh, remote refractions and utilizing their staff or even their doctors. So that would kind of be a, that full level, which again, um, the, the doctor, depending on their comfort level, can be prescribing themselves utilizing the remote staff. Or, um, you know, I've heard doctors say uh, that they're anticipating after not seeing patients for six or seven weeks that they're going to have a huge backlog when they do return to work and there's going to be a lot of patients that need to be seen. So they want to see have the practice running seeing patients say on Saturdays and Sundays, which then without them giving up their family time, they can utilize those uh, options or solutions to have a remote doctor continue seeing patients on the weekends, for example. Right. So I think there's a lot of options and just we uh, we're really the only company to be able to out offer the different flexibility of what a practice can choose to do. Right. And I guess the big question is for people who'd been putting this off, you know, sort of these solutions for a long time, how can they sort of get started with it now without breaking the bank, right? You know, if they, if they can't go whole hog right now and get everything, where should they start? Yeah, absolutely. And we're very sensitive to that. Um, so one of the things that we're doing to help uh, doctors be able to get into this type of technology to have the options is 
Um, we're doing special pricing and we're also doing a zero money down six month deferral finance option, which is really ideal um, because that'll help them get in and get started and, and start seeing patients safely right away. But also um, a lot of our customers can speak to the fact that aside from the current environment, that technology really pays for itself uh, just through increasing you know, the, the things outside of what I've been talking about, but just increase, increasing our sales and through the optical and efficiency. And, you know, of course, let's not forget about the ergonomics, right? Saving the, the shoulder and back from using manual four after. So there's so many other benefits. Uh, so it's, it's kind of right now just a, a full package that really addresses a lot of different variables. Right. Cool. All right. Well, you know, I think what people might want to do is check out your booth and just sort of see see what the options are. And I know that Paul, if, if he's still around, you know, he <laughs> he was one of the users of Marco stuff. I, I don't even know. I mean, he was talking about the avocado green stuff he used to have back in the 70s. Um, so we certainly know. Oh, I, not only did I use it, but I I was on David's airplane. <laughs> I used to I used to fly around. So. And, and you survived. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's a he's good pilot. He, he always had an assistant in the other seat. So, <laughs> yes, uh, and yeah, Dr. Parkes, I think you way back when I first started with the company, I think uh, you were one of the first uh, practices that um, I had met. So it was a very long time ago, but yes, uh, so it's good to hear from you again. Mm -hmm. we, we we don't want to talk about our age, you know. We got to well, be careful. But you, but it's important <laughs> to put it in context, right? Because Marco's equipment tends to be have, have a long life, and you know, especially these days, you sort of feel like a lot of the equipment you're using and it's gone relatively quickly. And I'm glad that you're actually supporting the remote functions on the older devices, right, that are sort of out of production now, um, you know, because a lot of times companies, I mean, even, you know, big companies like Apple, right, if you own an old device, it's like, oh, forget it. <laughs> exactly, it right. Gretchen, are you there? Yes, I said uh, Apple calls their older devices vintage, and it doesn't take long to get that uh, demarcation from Apple. So your point is very well taken about supporting uh, older products that are still working well and are still in use every day in practices around the country. Yeah, vintage. That is insulting. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, especially when you go to the Genius Bar to get support for a device and you are told, gee, sorry, it's vintage. So <laughs> kudos to you guys for uh, for staying on top of it. You're better than Apple in that respect. <laughs> wow, thank you. All right, cool. So do you have any, any other sort of messages you want to get out there to everyone about Marco and, and you know what they can expect in the, the weeks and months to come? Sure. Um, really, it's, it's just um, you know, pretty simple that uh, we're here to help the practices and help support all the doctors uh, and anyone interested in learning what they may already have now and the, the options they can they have and might not know it or what it needs what they need in order to get into it. And really, we just want to educate them. Um, just reach out to the to Marco Direct or the the Marco area manager locally, and we can just set up a virtual demonstration and just walk them through it um, and we're just we're just here to help and and happy to support the practices to get back to seeing patients again great all right well thanks so much for being here today and I'm sure if questions pop up uh, we'll forward them on to you so so thanks again okay great thank you so much everyone bye bye Hey, Adam, can I jump in again with some questions people are having about the quiz? Sure. Okay, so we have uh, one person talking to us and saying that um, they click, this person clicked that uh, they took the quiz and then there was no place for the tracker number. So they said, yes, I was here. Um, you know, I sat in on the lecture and it says, thank you for taking the quiz. You have successfully passed the exam. Uh, your credits can be found in the Help Center by clicking on the Certificate of Completion link, mm -hmm. but there's no place for the number. Is Did that person yeah. miss the window for it, or what should that person do? So, huh? for, yeah, so I just... Gretchen, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Hey, Steve, what's going on? Um, yeah, I've been all over it, you know, because I have to. 
one of two things. Uh, all the boxes work now, so when they click, and it does take 10 or 15 seconds for the quiz, um, you shouldn't have called a quiz, for the OE tracker box to appear where you put the number in and then you say yes. However, if she took the course afterwards, then it went on demand. You see what I'm saying? And she, the, a quiz should never pop up. The quiz itself. No, it's not up. a quiz. It's just that this person certified, yes, I said, and on the class. Um, so you're saying that this person took it on demand, not live. So no, no, no. If, if, that, if she didn't take a quiz, that's fine. Then it, it should be, the, the yes should be good enough. Uh, Kat might have to, the support person might have to contact her for uh, a tracker number. But just saying yes, uh, and she has uh, who she was, and she can, we just can't submit it to Arbo. Now, when I'm doing it, um, there's a couple of caveats here because I've been all over the place this last hour or so. Um, when you click on that quiz button, you have to wait 10 or 15 seconds for it to fully load so that that box goes in to put the OE tracker number or your license number, and then that next question is you 10 yes. Now, I'm doing it for all lectures that just uh, start at 12 o'clock, and um, uh, it, it all appears. Interestingly enough, if I put my OE tracker number in and say yes, and I click save, it says, no, you didn't complete your requirement. You didn't listen to the lecture yet. So, uh, so it is working the way it should. The other um, issue is that CAT, this is a little bit harder. CAT said it works best with Chrome and Firefox. So if somebody's on uh, the Microsoft platform, uh, uh, it, uh, for some reason, I don't know why, uh, that would be very difficult for them to, to switch over at this point in time. But she just um, uh, text messaged me that it works uh, slightly better in, in Chrome and Firefox. Hmm. Uh, okay, um, Steve, would, when you have a moment, would you be able to pop over to the live stream chat? Somebody is having a problem and isn't listening to the live stream, but is in the next lecture. Lecture. So I just want to make, and I don't want to ask this person for uh, an email. I'm in broken, I have all the tabs up, so let, let me just see what you're talking about. This okay. is Ryan. All right, I just want to make sure that we address everybody's questions, because if yep. these people aren't able to get uh, credits, yep. I mean, that's why they're here. So yeah. I apologize for needing to jump in for troubleshooting. No, no. Uh, this is Ryan Kawadi. Um, yes, wonder... yes. So just scroll up a bit and read through it. And uh, so this person can't hear you because she's in another lecture. So if you can just address it on the chat, that would be fabulous. We'll do. Okay. It's a Ryan. Okay. I think it's a guy, right? Uh, I think it's uh, somebody saying Robin. I assume that it's a female, but I could be incorrect. Oh, so I'm saying Ryan, not Robin. Right. Scroll I'm up. A... You'll see it. Brian, uh, I can I hear you? What? Okay, uh, I'll try to address them in the chat. And see, I can't private message in this in this chat interface, so I would uh, contact them directly, but I can't. But uh, I'll you'll see me um, typing now. Okay. Thank I'm you here. so much Steve, for jumping in. Uh, I gotta go to one places because uh, it, it is a uh, challenge. I think I mean if they just wait ten or fifteen seconds, everything pops up. That was the problem I was having. Um, normally it pops up immediately, but I guess uh, with all these people attending, the bandwidth is is being um, challenged a little bit right right well my challenge is is that because i'm not doing it myself if this person got yep. uh a thank you um i don't know if there was a step missed in there or what so that's why i'm glad that you're answering it okay i'll, I'll um i'll leave my email okay you'll see me chat bye cool all right wow so adam we're already in the second uh the second set of courses so we've gone through four courses in the 11 a.m. hour, and now in the 12 o'clock hour, well, I'm also saying Eastern time here, I know it's earlier for you guys, that we are in the midst of four classes again, and one of them is Ben's two-hour class, so there's, uh, there's a lot cooking. Yep. And now if some people are taking a time off, what are the, what are the uh, course places are, are empty now when it says taking a break? You ought to visit right. the exhibit hall. That's now's your chance to get over there. Uh, these uh, vendors are anxious to deal. They haven't had any uh, opportunity to, to go to live conventions now for a couple of months. So it will be worth your while to get over to the uh, convention center and speak to them and see if you can come up with uh, some sort of deal. But when all, all this is over, you might get a good deal uh, from them. So visit. Absolutely, yeah. And also, in addition, not only are people not able to to buy, they're not able to sell. So this is a great time for people to uh, 
to see what's out there because if you miss seco well <laughs> you pretty much missed the boat so far this year no vision expo east um we've got no aoa coming up arvo is supposed to be starting shortly we've got no arvo so yeah we've had really a, a dearth of of gatherings for for people to engage with vendors in the exhibit hall and also for vendors to make any sales and connect with potential buyers yep yeah and and the, just to look into the future in germany the oktoberfest has been canceled so we can think about uh, what's going to happen in the fall. There's a very good chance uh, that some some of the uh, vendors will not be able to show in the fall as well, because the uh, conventions may be open, but who'll want to get on an airplane? Who's going to be first? So that well, that's, that's also an issue. That has been some discussion. So um, that was a very early cancellation, I think, for something in the fall. So we've got Expo West coming up in September. And then, of course, we have the Academy. And then also let's think about so many things that have been canceled throughout the, uh, the late winter, spring, and early summer that may potentially be rescheduled. First, are they going to be rescheduled? Um, and secondly, do people want to go somewhere? Uh, there are a bunch of reasons out there that may prevent doctors. So first of all, do you want to get on a plane? And secondly, do you want to stay in a hotel? Do you want to be in a convention area or big uh, group session area? And also, let's not forget about the finances, that doctors have been pulling in not a whole lot of revenue for a while. And even after they do open up, it's not going to be an immediate flip the switch, go back to normal. The so revenue will be slow to trickle in again. Will doctors be able to afford to pay for registration, pay for ho a hotel room, pay for a flight. So I think that's yep. a really good point, Paul. So even if Vision Expo West and Academy and other meetings that are going to be rescheduled from earlier, even if they are still on the docket, what will attendance look like? Yeah. Living strange times. Yep. But, uh... Yeah, I mean, it's going to be, I, I, I'm having a hard time visualizing Expo West happening. I don't know, maybe it's just me and I'm, I'm pessimistic about this whole thing, but, you know, I... Well, they, they've, they've opened up Las Vegas. I mean, the, the mayor of, uh, of Las Vegas wants people to come. Yeah, you, so. right. they want people to come, but, <laughs> but you know, I mean, are, are people going to come unless you're, you have a gambling problem and you feel like you need to be there? I'm kind of, Las Vegas is one of the last places I'd actually want to go right now, right? Sure. Well, Adam, though, um, I don't disagree with you personally, but there are a lot of people out there who are ready and willing to open up economies and think that um, perhaps just a mask and an occasional squirt of hand sanitizer are sufficient. And so I think that just like there are so many of us who were either crazy busy or crazy not, no in between. I think that there are so many people who are chomping at the bit to go do things and those who are not. So you might have pockets of people who are raring to go and I'm ready to hit it and then pockets of people who are not. So I, I think it's very, um, it's very black or white for a lot of these concerns. You're busy, you're not, you're raring to go, you're not, there's, there's not a lot of middle ground. So who knows? Yep. Yeah. The, the, the introverts of the world are quite happy. See, <laughs> we, we introverts don't really need too many people, even the best of times. So th this uh, is only a mild inconvenience for us. But extroverts, I don't know what you're doing. You must be jumping out of your skin. Well, I think those are two separate things. I think you're right that introverts are, are not having as hard of a time as extroverts are. But I think that that's, that's just a personality thing versus whether people are um, are thinking that it's time to open up the economy or whether you're thinking that it's better to hunker down and wait rather than have a rebound that may be worse than the original. So that's more of an ideological perspective and what you think should happen versus whether you want to hang out in your house or not. Sure, absolutely. So anyway, we'll, 
Who's who's the next speaker, Ed? You're going to be um, having yeah. So our some next, interesting our, people coming up. Yeah, so we're not going to be talking to someone for a little while. Um, but in the interim, let me actually pull up. Uh, let me pull up the schedule and see what's going on here today because I am so out of it. It's been uh, well. We've got half an hour. We have Barry Iden joining us in about half an hour. Um, so that is our next interview discussion. And if we take a look at the, hang on, here we go. So if we look at the schedule in terms of classes, we've got Clark Chang and Brandon Ayers talking about artificial iris implant surgery, when, why, and how. And we also have Ben Casella a quarter of the way through his two hour class on narcotics. And we are halfway through Crystal Browning's dry eye in the real world class. And so then at one o'clock, we've got Barry Iden joining us via phone. And then our one o'clock classes are Jeff Sonsino talking about optometry and the age of disruptors when patients are harmed. And we've got Clark Chang and Brandon Ayers again, a dynamic duo talking about cross-linking with keratoconus and the second half of Ben Casella's narcotics class. And then we've got Michael Trottini talking about ocular and orbit trauma. So all of those are coming up at one along with Barry Iden. So right now we have, it's just us for the next half hour. Okay, well, so I wanna we can actually, chat about. Well, I wanna, I wanna share something with everyone in one second here. Uh, hold on one second. Sorry, I'm just I'm trying to help everyone out too with the tech problems that they've been having. But for the most part, besides the little issue with the certificates, it's been going okay. And uh, no, no classes have exploded. Uh, no, I'm no, wondering how many how you handle the questions in ten minutes when you have a thousand people so in the audience. Most of the speakers are giving their email address so people can contact them afterwards if they want to as well. Um, so they're not letting it go that way. So that's good. Uh, this, you know, this, the classes themselves are streaming fine, and which is remarkable, right? Because there are thousands of people taking them now, um, which is something we've never seen before. It's just the matter of pulling up that one form where they attest to the fact that they were there. And people should know that the software is tracking that how long they're watching. So even if for some reason their tracker number doesn't get in there, it remembers uh, that they took the class, so we can get it straight for them later. Um, so I'm not actually entirely surprised by these teething pains in the first hour. Um, we, you know, are coping both with new Arbo rules that were just set, as well as a volume of people that we never thought we would have. <laughs> so um, uh, I'm not checking at him now. People are getting the habit; they're waiting. Um, so it shouldn't be a big problem going forward. And uh, a few people have emailed uh, Cat to take care of their credits, um, including Ken Lubanda, very important person. Yeah. I mean, Kat is probably going to be a very busy person fielding those requests, um, for better or worse. I mean, you know, it's uh, it's her job, <laughs> tragically. <laughs> so you might as well let it, let people let people know who who Kat is. Yeah. So if you email support keep at using CUR, the word. if you email support, they know because we've been chatting about it. If you email support at cur 2020com you're either going to get me or you're going to get her. Um, and for this particular thing, Kat will take over immediately. And make sure that your your credits are issued properly. This is this is her game for sure. Um, and you know we know what the issues are. We know that the software is tracking properly. You know that you're watching, and we'll we'll make sure that the credits get issued. You don't have to worry about that. I know sometimes people get concerned. Well, what's going to happen if they're not issued properly, and so on and so forth. But we're always here to make sure that they are. So it's really not a not a huge deal. Uh, we can always fix it. So may I make a suggestion? Sure. Sure. Is it possible at the beginning of each class to throw up a slide that says at the end of the lecture, follow, you know, step one, step two, step three, wait 15 to 30 seconds, you know, just so that you have it at the very beginning? Is that, I know it's kind of late in the game to do that, that but that might prevent a lot of. Uh, Gretchen, hardship. Gretchen, Gretchen. I've been doing, Gretchen, can you hear me? Yep. I've been doing that. I've been doing that at the beginning, then in the middle, and at the end. And now I add the wait the 10 seconds for the uh, OE trackers. I've been doing it um, in all the lectures, and I can keep on doing it. Well, my suggestion is that it's actually a slide so that people see it. Uh, mine's in the chat box. I, can, I, I can't generate a slide. So, Gretchen, this, uh, tomorrow what's going to happen is I'm going to film me with that little slide, the, the slide that I've been showing you, the wherever it is, the, the this one. 
uh, uh -huh. this one that's on the screen. So I'm going to just be, I'm going to film a little thing that when people walk in to the classes tomorrow morning, this video is going to pop up in their face no matter what, whether they want to see me or not. <laughs> oh, okay, good, good, good. All right, so we're on the same page and we have the same idea. Yeah. Well, right. I, was, I was going to do it this morning, but unfortunately we ran out of time because uh, this, this was a concern of mine even before we went on the air this morning. Um, but Kat couldn't actually get the thing transcoded and up before the classes started. So, um, yeah, because of course it's very early here, right? So even though I started working at like six in the morning. Um, yeah. Well, you know what? In the grand scheme of things, with pulling this together, I don't want to say at the last minute, but it certainly didn't have as much lead time as the first version. Um, and with transferring this all and making the coding changes, it's actually running fairly smoothly. If this is the only glitch, and it's simply because some people, um, it, they're encountering it for the first time, you know, as they get to class two and three, they're figuring it out. This isn't bad, you know, I'll take it. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I got an email in uh, from a fellow called Mo. He only his last name, he practices in Texas. He's an old guy, just about retiring. And this is his first experience online. So he was frightened to death. I must have, I am certainly the low bar for, for technology. So I, I was his hand holder, letting him know that it's not going to be tough. And I got an email in uh, from Mo who said, please have Dr. Nolan back for three hours next time. He was super. So even folks that are very uncomfortable with computers and online are happy. So. Uh, by the way, you can say something to us other than problems here in the box. So if you're happy with something or you have questions uh, about life in general, we're here to talk to you. We, we have a lot of air time to fill. Oh, by the way, so yeah, be, and, and feel free. And by the way, Gretchen, uh, uh, Craig Thomas wants to speak with us. Could you please email him the call-in number? I absolutely will. Yeah, he wants to, call, he wants to call in right now. So he's got things to say. Oh my God! <laughs> but but only less than a half hour, please. <laughs> I, I need to go get All a right. drink. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm okay. on. Okay, uh, okay. If he thanks. wants to share that, yeah. uh, for those of you that don't know Craig Thomas, uh, he is uh, one of the premier national speakers. He he's on the program. He practices in Texas. He has a mega practice. And he's not afraid to do very advanced optometry. So uh, he, he may want to talk about optometry. He may want to talk about life in general. Uh, and we're not uh, limited by COPE, ARBO in, in this conversation. <laughs> uh, only our courses are. So we can talk about anything here. So, yep. so, so I look forward to seeing what he has to say. <laughs> So we, might we, we want can to be talk careful about with that, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we, we, there's a ten minute delay, a ten second delay. Uh, that's why it's very difficult, by the way, for for those of you watching Adam on the screen and listening to us talk. Uh, he's he's ten seconds ahead of us, or more, I think. Adam, is it just ten seconds? I think it's fifteen. Yeah, it's it's like fifteen, something like that. What happens is they buffer seconds. it. Yeah, it's not for any censorship reasons. They buffer the streams and so that people don't get choppiness. So that's why they do it that way. Are you sure it's not Paul deciding that it's it's the uh, it's no, the no, uh, Gretchen drops it's, the it's, F-bomb? It's, it's, meant, it's meant for me, actually, because I, I talk about things that I shouldn't, so. <laughs> All right, so hopefully Craig will, will get the number and uh, get on the air. So. I just texted him, so okay, he great. should be. You should be coming momentarily. Excellent. Huh. So, uh, yeah, well, anyway, so, I mean, so far so good here today. You know, I apologize for the little, the minor tech glitches that people are having, but it's the sheer volume that we're coping with today that is something that's totally alien to us. I mean, CWire has always been large, but not like this. I mean, this is this is ridiculous just in terms of the number of people. You, had a, you oh, said there were signups in the middle of the, middle of the night signups? For the hundreds, insomniacs? hundreds of signups overnight last night. I mean, it's it's just a shocking number. People want their credits and uh, they're willing to get them. And you know, it's uh, I, I, hopefully the problems have straightened themselves out now. Steve and Cat are doing a good job talking to people. 
Um, hey, Craig, are you and, here? And I'm here. <clears throat> I have right. a, okay, Craig. Welcome. Well done. How you doing, man? Yeah. Am I supposed to be out tomorrow? Did I, did I miss up? Yeah, but you know what? We're just here talking for now, so we have about 20 minutes. Okay. So it's always good to talk right, to you, cool. man. All right, what you want to talk about? I, I want to know how you're doing. I mean, you know, with the whole world falling apart, how's everything in, in your world? Oh, man, this is, this is what we call outbreak optometry. <laughs> That's what we got right now. Uh, every single person I know is losing money, and I know a bunch of them. Uh, <laughs> Most of you got the range of being totally closed down, out of business. Uh, there's not too many guys like that around here, guys and ladies. Uh, most of us are doing the urgent care thing in Dallas. You know, there's 600 optometrists in Dallas, probably 500 ophthalmologists. Uh, so it's a bunch of eye doctors around here. Hardly anybody's trying to be normal from what I could see. So everybody's following the, the, the rules, pretty much doing essential care. I must say, I've talked to a few of my boys, you know, and I've sneered at them. You know, I talked to one friend of mine, close friend. I'm like, hey, man, you know, how's it going? He says, oh, we saw 12 yesterday. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I said, we haven't seen 12 this week. You know, it's all emergencies. Oh, no, no, no. He broke his glasses. This guy was a minus 10. This guy had he had 12 dots as a cylinder, axis 45. I'm like, come on, man. Really? Every one of them? He's like, yeah, every one of them. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like okay. So... A few people seem to be a tiny bit busier than others, but most of us, uh, the, and I thought the dozens of people, dozens of optometrists around here, uh, are into the urgent care mode, which, which is, uh, you know, I mean, I posted on it on the website a little bit. I mean, the, the bigger your practice is, uh, the harder it is to 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 not practice. Uh, you know, the day that we hit, I mean, what is the day? The twenty fourth. So we've 25th. been twenty fifth. So man, 20, and, man, and it's Saturday. And it's, yeah, so 25. All right, so I am now in my 42nd day of losing money. Hmm. Average of 500 to to $1,000 a day. It hurts you to say that, doesn't it? I'm getting pretty pissed off. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> and I'm running out of money pretty quick, too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you got to decide in the beginning. Everybody's already made their decision. Do you just shut it down? Just like, hey, we don't, we're not even here. Or do you recognize that if the government says tone it down, okay, they say tone it down on Tuesday. Well, Tuesday, I got like 75 trays in the lab. What am I supposed to do with them? Hmm. Okay. The first thing is I got to pay the guy to finish them. It's going to take a while. The second thing is I still got to call the people and let them know their 75 glasses are ready. How long is that going to take? Then they got to come get them and we got to hand them out to the door. And it's totally different. And that takes a while. It took two, three weeks just to burn through that. So I'm paying two, three, four. I mean, I had four people, sometimes five every day out of fifteen. You know, and we're not, and, we're, and all we would see, uh, you know, is three doctors. So we sent one doctor home. She just like, hey, bug out. You know, there's nothing there. And me and my partner, you know, we'd see an average of three to four a day each, all urgent or emergencies, foreign bodies, abrasions uveitis weird glaucoma stuff just i mean just gotta come okay you know changing out bandage contacts every two weeks okay three or four so i'm seeing three or four people a day uh you know but i'm paying three or four people to stay up here answer the phone uh you know again a big office and there's plenty of big offices even moderate size doesn't matter how big you are just you know just multiply it uh, if you're one doctor with five staff well that one person's got to make 20 phone calls a uh, day they were to reschedule patients. If you're a bigger office with three doctors, okay, three people got to make 20 phone calls. Okay, I mean, it's the same work. Uh, you just multiply the money that you're losing. Uh, so instead of losing $200 a day, you're losing $600 a day. So you got to decide that you stay in business, service everybody. You know, for us, you know, we get 200 phone calls the first two or three weeks. I mean, so I, I mean, I had two full-time receptionists answering the phone. Uh, you know, I got to pay to him. Uh, so it's been, it's been most unexpected. Okay. So from a financial point of view, uh, if you decide to stay open, almost always, you know, your, your goal is not even to break even, uh, you, you know, the only question is, are you going to lose a little bit of money or are you going to lose a lot of money? Uh, but you're going to lose money. So now I'm in my 42nd day of losing money, uh, which, you know, that hadn't happened in 30 some years. So that's pretty, pretty different. I'm not feeling too bad about it because I know why. You know, it's not my fault. 
Uh, it's not like I'm a bad optometrist. I just I didn't do anything wrong. Uh, I don't have six malpractice cases on me. It's nothing, you know. So so I don't. I'm not feeling it like that. But because we're all kind of in the same boat, as long as we all get our payment or our payroll protection program money, as long as we get that, we'll all be in the same boat. Uh, you know, the, I'm, I'm still waiting on mine. So I guess the second thing. So now the first thing. I've been ranting for seven minutes. Okay. Uh, so the first second thing. Uh, in top, on top of losing money for 42 days, and I don't care how much money you make, I don't care how much money you got. Uh, to me, it's hard to stay in business like that. Uh, that's just incompatible with with staying in business. Uh, and I told my staff, if I don't get this payroll stuff on this second round, we get ready to shut it down because uh, I'm, you know, this is nonsense. Uh, so I'm, I'm holding out because I've been paying people. Uh, everybody saw that big Medicare thing I got. You had some haterade going on. That's fine. I burned through that in three weeks. Okay, oh. it's a big office. Uh, so, you know, so you know, I kept that. You know, say I sent some home, but I've been paying people. Uh, you know, we've been here. We were here yesterday. I saw four patients yesterday. Uh, some lady had a piece of wood in her eye from out there gardening because she had it work. Uh, one, one. Uh, what was it? It was two or three pretty bad things. I mean, they had to come. Uh, and that's what it is every day. But I mean, you know, you're not gonna make any money like that. I think we sold two hundred dollars worth of contacts. Uh, so it was another day of losing money. I had two people here, and I sent them both home at twelve o'clock. <laughs> once I saw all the patients. Uh, so uh, second part is if we all get our money, you know, I think we'll be able to bridge it. Uh, and I'm already focused now on just trying to to what you know how we're going to practice going forward. Uh, I told the staff we're following government rules, uh, just to just make it simple. Just if the government says stay at home, we, we're going to do urgent care or shut down. Uh, if the government says we can peek out, then we're going to come out. Uh, I'm going to follow the government's lead, and you know I don't think you can go wrong with that. So here we're still at the stay at home, uh, for good or bad, for whatever reason. Uh, as recently as two hours ago. Uh, I, I was on a phone call with an optometrist from another part of the country, uh, and I've received several of those calls, quite a few, uh, over these past few weeks, both locally and, and around the country. You know, guys know me, kind of, and, and I'll get a phone call. Hey, Craig, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> hey, Craig, what are, you, what are y'all doing? What are y'all doing down there? You know, how, how, are, you, are, you, how are you making it? You know, you open, you close, you're normal, you're abnormal, you're busy, you're making money, you're losing money. What are you doing? Uh, inquiring minds want to know. All right, I took one of them phone calls today and spent 30 minutes on the phone with an optometrist who's a friend of mine because everybody knows I'm a friendly guy and I like optometrists. Uh, and people call me and, and we talked. So I, I reminded this optometrist, because this optometrist, all right, so there's some optometrists may be listening now. Okay, <laughs> This optometrist was tired of it, just like we all getting tired of it. And this optometrist uh, was, was in the position of, uh, I got three offices, I am losing money, uh, that stuff doesn't appear to be that bad around here, and I'm ready to go. Uh, my staff's ready to go. The patients are ready to go. Everybody's ready to go. Uh, we're getting ready to go. <laughs> you know, and, and I asked this optometrist, I say, what does the government say? And, and, and the optometrist said, well, the government says we're going to lift it in a few days. <clears throat> I said, is it lifted right now? And the optometrist said, no, not yet. I said, okay, do what you want. <laughs> I said, I'm going to do what the government says. Excuse me, I, I just think you know, if you're asking my opinion, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, everybody's position is different, financial, geographic, you know, disease prevalence, intensity, all that stuff, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, but I think at a base level, if somebody's calling and asking for my opinion, asking what I'm going to do, asking for my advice, asking for a recommendation, my first thing is I'm like, okay, whatever the government says. Uh, you know, that, that's been working so far. Well, well let me uh, think well, Hey, Craig, I have a question. Yeah. So you're saying that um, you are following what the government says, but you know what? What the government says differs from state to state. And I just what said is, that. Yeah. And what everybody, is everybody's different. And what isn't. And there are some guys who, and I use the term guys loosely, of course. There are yeah, some guys, guys who are still open for um, just routine care, like a regular exam, just doing day to day, maybe just spacing it out. Uh, what are your thoughts on people who are doing that? Because the CDC and AOA recommendations weren't all that clear. I mean, you guys are doctors and medical equi- uh, personnel are considered essential. So uh, I, I, I think my more- opinion is that is that like most things should be that individual decision is made up with 
to the individual doctor and the individual patient, and they can collectively decide if they wish to both take the risk involved in having that close personal encounter. Uh, it's up to them. It's America, a free country so far, mostly. And I would be leaning towards if a, if a doctor wanted to do an eye exam on a patient that he or she knew and you practiced as much infection control as you could and both people had masks on and you made the person wash their hands when they came in and you washed your hands in front of them and you wiped the equipment down before and after in front of them and did all of that stuff. Okay, yeah, I think you could do it. Uh, I think you could see one every 30 minutes, one every hour, six, seven, eight a day, space them out, control it. I think you could do it. Are you going to start doing that? Yeah. Huh? Are you going to start doing doing No, I ain't doing none of that. No, that's not me. I can't work like that. Why is that? Uh, I don't want to. Uh, when, when, when they say go to work, I'm going to go to work. When they say stay at home, I'm going to stay at home. Uh, the, if it's in the in-between like it is now, I'm going to come up here and lose money. Uh, if, if they say lift this thing in two weeks, okay, I'm going back to work in two weeks. Uh, to me, the only question maybe is I'm a, if I'm going to wear a mask or not. Uh, you know, to me, the, the, the conversation I had with the doctor this morning, <clears throat> uh, this is the premise, and I had, this, I had this discussion the other day with the staff. I said, number one, uh, you assume everybody has the disease. So, so you assume every person coming in has the disease. If you don't go with that as your base, everything's all nonsense to me. Uh, you got a disease that's invisible. You have a disease that can be subclinical in 20, 30 percent of the people, apparently. Uh, you have a disease that is contagious at all phases of its presentation in natural history. That's pretty unprecedented. Okay, if anybody got the magic test, whip it out. Okay, nobody got the magic test. So there'll be no identifying people with coronavirus. There'll be no asking of any questions. Have you been to Thailand last month? Were you on a cruise ship yesterday? Okay, whatever. So what? Okay, I got two of them little uh, infrared thermometers, you know, checking your forehead when you come in. We've already seen now, we've already seen it. There's a, there's a significant subset of patients that present with no fever. Dr. Farkas, yes or no? Yep, that is true. Okay. Okay, so, so the absence of a fever does not guarantee the absence of disease. Yes or no? Yeah. So, all you can do, so th- that's, all that you can th- do is, is, is yeah. acknowledge the risk yep. and then take steps to minimize it because you cannot eliminate it. The yeah. elimination, it, almost like an allergy, you know, avoidance therapy, okay, stay home. So in the hospital, <laughs> not, yeah, in a hospital setting, we refer to this as universal precautions, right? You have to assume that everyone yeah. has it. Just assume everyone has it, okay? Assume everyone has it, and if they're not hacking at you, then it's just subclinical. Uh, that's your base level of, of, you know, how do you start the day every morning, and then just decide how you're going to go from there. But to try to start questioning people and, and triaging them at the front desk or at the telephone, and, you know, to me, that's a waste of time. Uh, so well, you open Craig, it, you're not, um, and, you, and you assume people have it, and then you, then you go from there. Okay, yes, Gretchen. Yeah, but Craig, um, assuming everybody has it, it, I'm playing devil's advocate here, I know. So let's say the government says, and whatever you consider government, your city, your county, your state, national, whatever, government says open it up. That doesn't magically mean that coronavirus has been eliminated in our country. You still may have pockets. And you are exactly right. Very in. good point. Yes. So good what point. do you do so- so, so what, and that's excellent point. Okay, excellent point. Uh, for example, uh, as you've already commented on and noted, different jurisdictions around the country opening and closing at different times. Okay, so here in Dallas, the original order is supposed to expire on Thursday, April 30th. Uh, the, there's practically no thought that that's what's going to happen. Uh, the guy here is pretty strong willed. Most people seem to be behind him, me included. And we're, we're thinking it's going to go another two weeks. Okay. Uh, so, so it's going to it's going to go to the 13th. That's that's what's going to happen here. Uh, you know, just if if you if you try to see people before then, number one, my staff's not going to have it. Uh, I got 15 staff. I got about five of them say they ain't having it. Okay, I ain't, don't want to come up here, not yet. Okay, so I can call. I could say all clear, like it's like whatever. You know, I got young kids at home. Uh, did everybody see the news today? Okay. Did everybody see the five-month-old toddler, infant, young person that went yep. down with this virus? 
Nope. Five months old. Horrifying. Horrifying. Okay, my, 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 my young staff is scared, and I mean right now, okay? <laughs> they don't want to work. The, 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 the five I had up here, two of them wouldn't touch patients. They said they'd answer the phone. It looked at me like I was crazy. I, cause I had one, I said, I need an ERG the first couple of days. You know, this lady been with me 13 years. She's one of my best techs. <laughs> I said, Stephanie, uh, I had, you know, one of my four patients that day. I'm like, let me try to do something here. I said, Stephanie, I need an ERG on that lady in room three. She says, I'm not going in there. I'm like, Stephanie, this is, you know, just, just get your mask on. Go ahead. I'm not going in there. I'm not doing that. You can fire me if you want. So I'm not going in there. I'm like, okay. All right. I said, Chris, would you mind getting me that ERG? He's like, fine. But I mean, I got half of them. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to work. So, so you say, what are you going to do about it? Uh, the first thing is I'd have to follow my staff's lead. The second thing I'd have to follow my patient's lead. And I remember at the beginning of this thing, it, it hit here on March the 17th. That's when we got our stay at home order. I remember the 16th when it was getting all spooky. Man, we were, you know, Monday is always our busiest day. And, you know, probably 60, 70 patients every day. And uh, half of them uh, no-showed, rescheduled that Monday. It was weird. It was like like being invaded from outer space. I mean, it was like, man, something is happening, okay, right now, today. That was the day. And then that night they did the order, and it took effect midnight. And that next day we've been losing money ever since, and that was 42 days ago. But I remember that day before. It was like, hey, patients don't want to come. You know, and I got yeah, a, a, Frank, a, here, here's the thing that there are people who have differing opinions on all of it. And I don't want to get political. Um, no, no, I understand. Yeah. And some Me people neither. are saying it's it's time to open up. We can do it safely. Some people are saying we can't. And you have those two different people in the same areas who are saying that. So what happens when you have um, people, whether they're your staff or your patients, who are have differing feelings from what federal of what government regulations are. If government says open up and people don't want to, or people want to open up and the government doesn't want to, because I mean you have people protesting, open up the economy. Well, I, people I, I think who that's, are yeah, saying I don't care about that. Uh, I, I think that that you lean towards not being open as opposed to being open. Uh, if I had to lean one way. Uh, Again, I, I think you're gonna <clears throat> when it's when it's safe, everybody will feel it. I don't think it's gonna go by some person saying it. I think just like everybody felt it was unsafe collectively, the herd. I think the herd is gonna feel when it's safe. My gut feeling is that that's three or four weeks from now. That's my gut. Yeah, but feeling. Frank, you that's know what? what? You also realize that you may be in a different position uh, than many other ODs. You have a larger practice. Um, many practices are solo OD, and it also depends on each practice and individual's financial situation. Some have a bigger cushion. Uh, you said you're paying staff. Some docs can't do that. So some doctors maybe Ooh, I can't do it much longer. <laughs> okay. No, but you've gone yeah. 42 days, and not everybody can do that. So some doctors yeah. maybe oh, say, hey, opening trust me. up. You know, uh, you trust me, okay? I ain't going much longer. Uh, if I don't get this payroll money, we're shutting it down. Okay, I'm out of business. Yeah, but I'm other out, you know, I'd rather be out of business than losing a thousand dollars a day. Right. Uh, yeah. You know that. Or, so anyway, I'm not. I'm not. I don't want to fixate on that because I don't think that's what's going to happen. Uh, you know, you ask my opinion. That's what I think is going to happen. And I don't have a problem, honestly, with uh, you know some kind of limited provision of vision care. I mean, people got to see, uh, and there are numerous patients where that is essential. I got no problem with that. Uh, you know, now some person cramming that. in 25 a day and they're all packed in the same, like nothing's different. Okay. That's kind of bogus. But you know, if you want to, you know, kind of get going and, uh, you know, see one again to, to me, one an hour would be something to, you know, kind of dinosaur days, but you know, schedule patients out you know, where there are minimal people in the office, minimal people, you know, getting moved around the office. You got time to wipe stuff down between patients, you know, where you're making a pretty aggressive attempt at minimizing the risk of transmission from one person to another. You can't eliminate it, but, you, you know, you're trying hard. Uh, you know, I think you could try hard and get it done. So I don't have a problem with that. Uh, I don't practice like that. Uh, so, I mean, it's not going to work for me. Uh, I, I was, I was, 
whining about it yesterday or yeah, yesterday on Friday. Cause I, again, I saw four patients. I mean, the two of them were, you know, I had one young kid and he had this ulcerative blepharitis and I put my shield on my mask. I put the gloves on. I'm like, man, I'm tired of this. You know, I mean, it's, it was ridiculous. And it took a while. Uh, then, you know, then I was, I had them all here at once within two hours. I was bouncing from room to room and I went through like 12 masks in an hour. And I'm like, man, this, I'm going to, you know, I only got like 300. I got them from Dr. Mackler. Uh, paying cash like I'm buying drugs on the street. Hey, man, you got any masks? You know, <laughs> you got any masks? You got any masks? It's outrageous. It's outrageous. I'm buying masks on the street because I can't go get no masks. Oh, and fact- if I do it properly and, and do real infection control where I walk in the room, don't touch the patient, I give them a mask because I don't know if their mask is – so what if they come in with a mask? I don't know where that thing's been. They could have been at home. Somebody could have been infected, could have coughed on them as they put the thing on. Now it's got virus particles all on the front of it. I'm up there two feet away from them. Uh, you know, so I give them a mask. I put on a mask. I go in, start working on them. Okay, I figure out what's going on. Well, the lady in the next room got a piece of wood in her eye, so I got to walk out, take that mask off, wash my hands, put on a new mask, wash, go back in the room with the new lady, wash my hands again in front of her, start working on her, then figure out what's going on, walk out of that room, take that mask off, wash my hands again, go back in the first room with the lady I was working on. Can you imagine me trying to see 50, 60 patients a day doing that stuff? No, in fact, Craig, I have to actually put this up on the screen. So you mentioned our black market masks. Um, Let me put this up so people can see. So Dr. Mackler has done us a great public service. He wanted me to actually um, let everyone know about this. So um, he's able to get these paper surgical masks. Uh, and you can see his email address up on the screen right now, MacklerOptical at gmail.com. Uh, that goes to his daughter, Amy. So if you're a doc in need, um, apparently they have a supply. So now, now I'm feeling like a drug dealer too. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Here, here you go, Adam. Here's the real drug dealer part. Okay. Trust me. <laughs> so masks that I could have bought three months ago for seven cents. Okay, only because I had the hookup in Florida did I get my first batch. I mean, and these are coming straight from China. I mean, they got the Chinese labels on them. You know, it is, it's not made, they weren't intended to be distributed in America. Right. So I paid 80 cents a piece for those. So I burned through those. Now I've got some from Dr. Mackler, $1.20 a piece for those. And I'm sure he's making little to no profit. Okay, that's the definition of drug dealing. <laughs> Okay, getting some drugs for five dollars and selling them for five hundred. Right. That's how I heard it used to be. Okay. That's what that's what I remember when I was in college. What they used to talk about uh-huh. when they were talking about drugs. Uh huh. Uh huh. All right. Oh, so Craig, we actually have to let you go because we have Barry Iden coming on. So, but thank you for I calling on in that today. Note, on that note. On that note. Yes. But you know what? If you want to call back tomorrow, if you're going to be around, you know, doing your lecture, it's always fun to have you call. Well, in. Guys, I don't want to. Yeah, I thought I mean I was rushing up here trying to get. Yeah, yeah, just, just, yeah, hey, Craig, we want to talk to you again. You're yeah. always fun to talk to. Yeah. All right. Okay, let me get out of here. All right, man. Catch you later. <laughs> Bye. Bye oh, my gosh. Hey, Barry. Yeah. Barry, are you there? I am there. What a, what an introduction, man. <laughs> yeah, really. I, I come in right as you start talking about drug dealers. I feel like... Uh, Maybe I should be playing Don Johnson or something like that from Miami Vice. We could get some background music going here for you, Barry. I, I love it. You just beat my tubs. Oh don't my. don't tempt me. I'm going to go Google it now. Let's see what I can find. <laughs> so Barry, oh, don't tell me you're not old enough to know Miami Vice. <laughs> no, no, I am. I am. I am. <laughs> here we go. Thank you, Gretchen. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's awesome. So, Barry, what are you doing for masks? Have you found a street corner where they're selling them? <laughs> masks? Yeah. No. Damn. You know what? This is its really, it is really an issue. Thankfully, we had um, available in our practice a decent supply of masks anyway so because of procedures that we do. But we obviously needed a lot more, and I've been going all different places trying to find them. Interestingly enough, yesterday uh, I was on the phone with uh, a company that I placed a, a fairly large order from just to realize they had nothing to do with masks. This guy was some guy in Idaho who was a printer, and he was getting his printing supplies from China, and they 
changed their whole production over to masks and he was able to get it for people. And he is making next to nothing, which are most of the people who are ordering these are really making next to nothing. I don't know who's making these multiples, but everybody I speak to says they're, they're doing it, you know, just to help people. And uh, so luckily we got our order in just in time to get out of China. So it's actually a, on the way we hope within the next 10 days we'll get our next shipment and hopefully that'll hold us through for for a while but uh it's challenging yeah absolutely it's uh it's you know it's funny actually there's people you mentioned factory switching production i got an email from a company that makes jeans right they're actually turning mm -hmm. all of their denim production into making denim masks now in america so okay. you know they well i just hope you know the parts that were used for the crotch are not being used for the mask <laughs> i'm just hoping so. don't ask me to tell i don't want to know <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh so anyway you know we, we we have you here today and and by the way is, is your practice running okay you know i know you you have a very large practice are you guys just doing emergency care yeah. or are you seeing routine patients or at all so up until probably about another week from now, we're limited to emergency and urgent care and telehealth. Uh, we've been doing that since uh, Illinois was put kind of on lockdown. Um, now it's probably, what, five weeks, six weeks already? Uh, who can remember one week to the next? I don't even know what day is it today. I haven't the foggiest idea. Um, in any case, we just, um, of course, were notified that the stay-at-home order in Illinois was extended out to the 30th of May with some openings. Um, so there were two things that I was really happy about. Number one, probably by far number one, is we're reopening the golf courses. So this is critical <laughs> for my mental and physical sanity. So uh, actually, Wisconsin opened up um, this week, and tomorrow, uh, eight of us are heading up over the border to play around. And then on the first, our golf club here is going to be opening with a lot of restrictions. So that's number one. Uh, in terms of practice care, we all know that uh, some of the kind of national uh, opinions are that more routine, quote unquote, more routine under the right circumstances can open up. And our plan is starting on Monday, I believe it's the 4th, we'll, we're, we've had a schedule out through almost June, well, it's been out through June, uh, already established. And now we're just having to move from May 1st to May 4th and really kind of thin out the herd a little bit, so to speak, um, with the scheduling. So I've been involved over the last 48 hours and just coming up with our scheduling and plans with our administrators. It's been really, really stressful. So we're bringing in mostly our medically needy patients, our glaucoma patients, uh, active dry eye, medically necessary contacts, you know, that sort of thing as our um, high priority. We're only going to have one doctor there at a time. So we're running shifts and all of the things that everybody's doing. Uh, I think optometry should really be proud of themselves. I think we're really doing a great job in trying to, uh, trying to do our part, I guess. Sure. Well, you know, we, we asked you here today, I wanted to talk about a little bit, you know, I know it's hard to think about the future in some ways because it feels like we've, we've gone to an alternative reality where this is never gonna end. Um, but this will end, right, <laughs> sooner or later. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we, we have a bunch of companies here, and it's hilarious. I mean, not hilarious, but it, it is interesting dealing with all the companies because none of them are in a mode where they want to really talk about their equipment. <laughs> they don't want to talk about mm -hmm. selling stuff. They don't want to talk about the features. They just want to sort of talk about hanging on and, and doing what they can to help. But I've, I've sort of needled them. I'm like, look, we're here. People will be planning for what comes beyond, right? Something will. Um, and so we might want to talk about that, just about what's going on with all the companies, right, to try to maintain some degree yeah. of normalcy. So, um, you know, I was wondering, you know, Oculus obviously is one of the, the big sponsors of this conference, and they have been from the beginning for the past six years. Um, and I know you use them a lot in the practice. I was wondering maybe if you just wanted to speak a little bit about their equipment and what's going on with them, because I know well, that, sure. that, you know, their equipment is... Um, not only sophisticated, it's it's almost like a Swiss army knife, a lot of the, the equipment, and people don't really use it to its fullest, but of course you're in a specialty practice, so I have a feeling you're kind of probing the edges of what their equipment can do. 
Yeah, that's it's really true, and and it's interesting. I, I'd like to start out by kind of uh, sharing with the audience really what my history of working with this company has been. You know, many of us who are involved in, let's say, writing and lecturing, we're out there, and maybe your name is known a little bit. Um, typically, the companies will come to you because they want to use your name, and you have you're considered a KOL, a key opinion leader. Um, and so, you know, people start using technology, instrumentation or whatever based upon that. Well, my relationship with Oculus was actually the opposite. Um, I first purchased their instrumentation based upon what I believed was great technology. This was now over 10 years ago. We got our first Pentacam uh, about 10 years ago. I'd have to look at the exact date, but um, because I knew that this was really state-of-the-art in technology and measuring anterior segment and corneal shape factors and such because of our involvement in keratoconus, our involvement in refractive surgery. Well, I had such a great experience both with the instrument and the company that I actually reached out to them and said, listen, guys, I believe in your technology. Any way I can help, let me know. And that's how it all started then became, you know, got involved in speaking for them, got involved in some studies, got involved in some consulting, and that continues on to today. So, you know, it's kind of the opposite of what most KOLs get involved with companies. So I think it's, it is a testament to, to them. And your, your analogy of this Swiss Army knife, uh, Adam, is, is just like spot on. I've never seen technology and the software associated with technology that, that is just so developed and so wonderful. And as you said, there are features that most of us probably never use. There's just so much in there. Um, and, and it cuts across all of their instrumentation. They are really dedicated to, to providing the highest quality of, of instrumentation. I think that's really truly available out there in the ophthalmic world. Yep. And so what do you, what, which pieces of equipment do you actually use these days and, and what are you using it for? So, as I said, we started out with Pentacam and that's surely our, our workhorse. And for those of you who aren't familiar with today, most people are in optometry familiar with Pentacam. It's what we call a shine fluke tomographer. Um, and so it's able to take a 3D model of the anterior segment and represented it in sort of 2D slices like really tomography uh, does in general in medicine. Um, so we utilize that every day, multiple times a day uh, for all of our corneal cases, our contact lens cases and such, and even its application in glaucoma because you get really great views, 360 degrees of the anterior chamber angle and some of those structures. Um, so its ability to detect uh, irregular corneal shape is amazing. In keratoconus, it's, it's beyond amazing. It's actually considered state-of-the-art because it measures both the front and back of the cornea and also measures the global thickness of the cornea in very quantifiable ways. So our ability to detect early disease is made much better with that instrument as well as the ability to detect progression of disease, which today with the advent of cross-linking becomes really critical, of course. Um, so that's really our workhorse. After the Pentacam, the next instrument that we started using from Oculus was their Keratograph, uh, which now our system is the K5 or the K5M. And that is a topographer, but also much more than a topographer. Uh, it is really a dry eye diagnostic tool. They have such amazing software uh, involved in that instrument that measures things like mybography, uh, imaging, measures tear meniscus height, measures non-invasive tear breakup, and a host of other things. We don't have the time to go into all the details, but predominantly we use RK5 as a dry eye diagnostic tool. It also is a great placido topographer, but we don't really use it that much for that reason since we have Pentacamp. Oh, I, you know, there was one other thing that I mentioned about Pentacamp that's kind of new and really exciting. Uh, software has been developed over the last year measuring corneal scleral shape uh, in their CSP software. So now with the Pentacam, we're able to actually virtually design scleral lenses. And the Oculus is working with a number of companies in their scleral lens designs and will move into corneal lens designs with their um, affiliation with the Wave uh, contact lens company as well. So that's really exciting new stuff. So that's uh, Pentacam, Keratograph K5. Um, 
We also have had experience with their auto refractor called the Park uh, system, which is really interesting because it's, it is a very good auto refractor, auto keratometer, but it also has built in the ability to measure central corneal thickness through a, a, a single shine flug image of the corneal thickness. So you can screen for people who have thin corneas and start thinking, wow, are they at risk for keratoconus? Uh, should we look deeper into that? Or as it relates to glaucoma, we all know that thin corneas will influence the intraocular pressure reading and the risk for glaucoma, so that becomes great. And finally, uh, we've been working mostly in terms of research with them and with their Corvus system, which measures the biomechanical properties of the cornea and has tremendous potential, again, for keratoconus, because we know biomechanical properties are abnormal in keratoconus. Uh, it also has tremendous uh, potential in the glaucoma world, because we also know that especially in normotensive glaucoma cases, biomechanical properties have a great influence. So that's really being worked on now, not, not FDA approved for those purposes. It's FDA approved only as a, uh, a non-contact tenometer. But uh, we hope that in the short uh, future, in the near future, maybe we'll get FDA approval for biomechanical property uh, measurements. And I think that's going to open up another host of opportunities. Um, Finally, and I have only seen this instrument, but I, I have not actually used it because, again, we're waiting on FDA approval, is something they call their myopia master instrument. And this is really exciting as well. It's, it's an autorefractor, autokeratometer, but also measures axial length. So imagine in, in a practice that you're really uh, embracing uh, myopia management that you're able to screen with your autorefractor and get axial length measurements that you can be measuring as baseline and then over time. Very, very exciting uh, future applications. I hope that gets its approval sooner rather than later as well. Right. Barry, yeah. having an axial length measuring instrument in a regular clinical practice will be huge, huge, huge for myopia management. You are correct, Gretch. A hundred percent agreed. You know, I've had, shall we say, friendly arguments with people in the world of myopia management about the importance of axial length measurements. I've always been on the side of you need to measure it. Um, I always believe that if what you care about is axial length, don't you need to measure it? And all of our concern about myopia relates to the length of the eye and elongation of the eye and the relative risks uh, in terms of ocular health complications associated with it. So I always believe that if you're really going to embrace Myopia management, you must measure axial length and not assume or think that, you know, based on correlations to refractive error, which I agree are there. Um, but be able to put axial length measurements in the hands of primary eye care providers at an affordable cost is what it's all about, as opposed to having to go and spend significant amounts of money for a standalone instrument, which is what we do and have been doing for years in our practice, you know, using IOL Master. But uh, if you can have an auto refractor that measures axial length at an affordable cost, that's that's just that's the deal. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I uh, I think a lot of people are going to be looking forward to that. So you know, Barry, one thing For that sure. I noticed, one thing that I noticed too, and and I guess this is a trend that's going to be taking over. You know, sclera lenses obviously were very difficult in the past, uh, much more of an art than a science, but. Um, I had some experience with my local OD uh, here, Charlie McBride, who fit me with uh, a set of sclerals just on a lark. We wanted to try multifocal to see what kind of vision we could get. And he used the Pentacam, and I was just amazed by the entire process. Um, yeah. Know, it, it, was, it was incredibly scientific. You know, it didn't, uh, just watching the software work, I, I, and as I was watching this, I sort of was asking myself, my God, how did people do this before? <laughs> Yeah, uh, surely, you know, again, we've been fitting sclerals for really a long time. And I remember way at the beginning, you know, just like putting them all with a little fluorescein under there and saying, well, that kind of looks like 300 microns. Uh, let's see how thick the lens is, how thick the cornea is. And then you're going out to the periphery. Is it tight? Is it? And, and there are tons of people who have been very, very successful in managing scleral lens patients simply by putting le diagnostic lenses on and using fluorescein in the bowl, really being great observers. But I don't think anybody could argue the fact that quantification of fitting, which first became really excitingly uh, applicable with anterior segment OCT 
use for square lens uh, evaluations and fitting. Now we take it to the next level. If we're able to measure the corneoscleral shape and realize how, in most cases, it's not symmetric, right? So our, we, all these years we've been putting these spherical peripheries on non-spherical shapes and wondering why we're not optimizing the fit. So then we went to toric designs and that made things somewhat better. But now we realize that most eyes are asymmetric in their peripheral shape. They're not even regularly toric, they're asymmetric. They're quadrant specific or maybe even more irregular than that. So if you measure accurately corneoscleral shape like we can do with the CSP and some other instruments, honestly, that are out there as well, and then design these lenses to contour more custom wise, well, you're gonna do a better job. And now in the world of, that we'll be entering in the post-COVID you know, eye care world, the less we have to use diagnostic lenses, the better off we all will be. Uh, in fact, you know, that's part of our uh, planning for reopening, how much less we want to use diagnostic lenses, so especially in, in irregular cornea management. Yep. Absolutely. So, and I, and I kind of wonder, you know, going forward, if this is going to open up the field to people who might have tried to dabble with things like specialty lenses, but now maybe would have more confidence, you know, knowing that they could do this in a reproducible way without having to be, you know, total experts at it. Yeah, I think uh, that's absolutely correct. Um, think about it. In a way, what we're really talking about is artificial intelligence, right? It's AI fitting. You have your corneoscleral shape, your topography of the cornea and the sclera. It's put into a software. That software automatically quantifies everything, analyzes, comes up with suggested fitting based upon nomograms that were developed and tells you, here's the lens. Now you can modify it. Uh, my experience in utilizing these designs up to this point I tend to go with what the computer is spitting out as a starting point, and then, if need be, modify from there. So the ability to take these results and manually manipulate all of this stuff before ordering your first lens, I think that's going to be much, much less common. So even the experienced uh, you know, uh, people in this area are going to end up going with what the AI tells us, at least as a starting point. So it's very exciting, and I think it's going to just change the way we do things. Absolutely. So, you know, I had a question for you here. I'm putting it up on the screen. I, I can't let you go without asking you about this. The International Keratoconus Academy of Eye Care Professionals, the yeah. IKA. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Because I think a lot of people still haven't heard of it yet. Well, thank you so much, guys, for that opportunity. So I think maybe it's getting close to six years ago. Uh, there were a group of us involved in keratoconus management and realizing how much, unfortunately, there was misinformation out there in the eye care world, not just optometry, within ophthalmology, within all the allied eye care professions. And unfortunately, so many of us were seeing patients who were mismanaged, not diagnosed early enough, not managed properly, uh, and people were losing vision over time that we knew could be uh, saved. So we sat down and said, let's, let's really try to address this. And so we formed an organization that was dedicated to eye care professionals. Uh, that's the IKA, the International Keratoconus Academy of Eye Care Professionals. And our, our mission basically is to disseminate the state-of-the-art information in the diagnosis and management of patients with keratoconus and other forms of irregular cornea, corneal ectasia. And we've been able to put out numerous lectures in when we were having eye, uh, live eye meetings uh, at some of the largest meetings over the years. We've written many, many articles. And probably one of the most exciting things is a study that we began over a year ago in trying to determine the prevalence of keratoconus in a pediatric population. So <clears throat> thankfully, in, um, in association with the Illinois College of Optometry, the Illinois Eye Institute, uh, utilizing instruments donated by Oculus, uh, both the Corvus and the Pentacam, and the work of our IKA um, medical advisory group, uh, we have now run well over 4,000 eyes in school-age kids with Pentacam, and of those 4,000, 2,600, over 2,600 also are run on Corvus for biomechanical properties. 
So now we're in the process of analyzing this data. And we can tell you already that just by looking at it, uh, you know, kind of roughly, the prevalence is going to be much more common than we ever, ever thought. And it's going to really put in play the need to screen for keratoconus in the pediatric population. Because again, now we have treatments that can stop its progression. So if we diagnose this before it has a dramatic impact on vision, we have the ability to preserve vision for these people, uh, whereas in the past they may have gone on to advanced keratoconus, maybe needed corneal transplants and so on and so forth. So this is really exciting stuff. Um, we now have worldwide well over 600 uh, members, and we'd love to have more members. Membership in our organization for anybody who's interested is complimentary. All you have to do is go to our website at www.keratoconusacademy.com. On our main homepage, you can see a subscribe area. On that page, when you subscribe and you like the code that's in there for complimentary membership, you become part of our group. We share things on the internet, on our Facebook. We have an email listserv. And again, we, we have a lot of things coming out in, in the periodicals. We have uh, talks, both webinars, and, uh, and hopefully in the future, more live interactions. So thank you for the opportunity to share. We hope others will join in. Very cool. Well, Barry, we're just about out of time. Thanks so much for, for being here today and doing this. Um, you know, I'm sure going forward, we're going to talk to you again. Uh, and I'm always glad to have you here because, you know, you're always out on the, on the cutting edge. So it's always fun to sort of talk to you about what's, what's going on in eye care. Well, I want to thank you guys, uh, all of you, because, you know, I've been involved in, in working with you guys for a number of years. It's always been a pleasure. But who would have imagined how important you've become now in light of what's going on in the world? So please accept my thanks and appreciation for all you do. Well, we were in the right place at the right time. <laughs> so nothing we did. Yeah. So sometimes it all just works out, right? Yeah. Well, listen, guys. Stay safe, stay connected, okay? All right. Well, thanks so much, Barry. Thanks, Barry. Bye, guys. Bye. We'll see you later. All right. Hey, Adam, I noticed that Paul and Steve are muted, FYI. Yes, I muted them because they were making noise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I should probably unmute them. They probably feel like they're in jail or something. Um, I love it. But uh, always good, <laughs> always good to talk to Barry, though. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Barry is no slouch. He knows his stuff, and he brings a lot to the table. And I'm really grateful um, to have known him for a while and to be able to participate in conversations with him. Yep. All right. So, what time is it? So it's almost time for our next guest, who is <clears throat> which is Austin from Zeiss. So, let me. Get him going. I think I'll keep Steve and Dad in jail for a while since they probably don't have too much to contribute. But maybe, maybe I'll let them out. Let's see. Wait. Let me let me let them out for a minute. If they would. Oh, uh, with great power, Adam comes great responsibility. This is fantastic. I really do feel hey. so powerful here. All right. I thought I, I was. Uh, I thought I was on mute before. I hope. <laughs> I'm happy you muted me out. Yes, I muted you. Uh, I uh, muted both of you. You uh, and your uh, you and your noises. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, I was. I was I, I took a bathroom oh. break, so I don't know. Yeah, I realized I was peeing. I was peeing when it was on the speaker, so sorry. Um, but I yeah, have to me, tell you guys, too. guys, this is kind of somewhat important because it's live. When the lecture ends, the quiz ends, and they can't take it. Meaning the attestation with putting the number in and saying yes. Mm -hmm. So um, I told Gretchen, and I'm doing it in all the forms, but they could at any time go to the help tab click on their live lecture and the proper boxes will pop up, put the OE tracker number in, license number, et cetera, say, yes, I was there. So I was under the impression that um, Kat will know they were in the room. No, the software will know kind of they were in the room, but she can't manually do thousands of people. So this is the way they have to do it. So nobody's going to lose their lectures credits if they go and do that even two weeks later, because it'll know when they took the course. They go to the help tab again, find their live lecture, because the lecture will also be on demand. One person took the quiz. I said, no, you got to go back and take it live because you want live credits. So you understand the complexity? Yeah, no, I, I get it completely. So what they have to do is just go back whenever they can to the help tab, find their class that says live next to it, not on demand, and then just fill in mm -hmm. their number there. So they can do that at any time. Yes, yeah, um, so that nobody loses anything, but just doing the lecture, Kat's not going to be able to 
find them so easily that they to attest for them and, and they really have to attest to make sure that they you know were in the room. Yeah, I mean it's like it's a very easy thing. You know, you just pull up the help tab, you find the class, click it, fill in your 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 Arbo number and away you go. So I'm glad that there's no yep. pressure on people though. The system will remember um, yes. you know, that they were there. <laughs> so Okay, so the, we, um, the first hour was always a little challenging, but uh, it was good. Great. I was listening to your conversation with uh, Craig. I wanted to chime in, but I was too busy. He, <laughs> have him back when you have two hours to vamp. <laughs> yeah. We'll so back why, why did the course run over, Steve? The stand mm -hmm. said that he, he said when he complained that the course ran over. How did oh, that happen? Wait, what, what happened? It didn't happen. Crystal Burma's class ran for... Um, uh, 59 minutes and 30 seconds. And by the time they clicked the tab to take the quiz, it had rolled over into the next lecture. Ah, uh, right. That's not a problem, though. Yeah. They uh, go to the help tab, they do exactly what we just said, and everything will be fine. She can't help that because it's a lot. That even happens when they do it um, on demand, yeah. um, live interactive, because it has to roll over into the next lecture because that's where the quiz is generated from. So that, that always has been a problem. And uh, Crystal went, I mean, I, I can't uh, deal with her for doing a great lecture, but uh, it, it was a little tiny bit too long. She didn't leave any time for Q&A. So basically, some of the lectures are more than 50-minute hours. Yeah. Is the issue. Yep. yep. So this right. is not this okay. is not a big deal, and in fact, I'm glad that we've straightened this out now. So people, in fact, don't really even have to feel the pressure of taking to to a test at the end of the lecture. They can just wait if they want to and do right. it all and, in a batch later. And I'm gonna again uh, as I go into the rooms now, I'm gonna put that. I'm gonna change my verbiage a little bit. Yeah, and and again, you know, I'm gonna write a little. I'm gonna make a little movie when this is all over that we're gonna post when people come to the classes tomorrow. So this is all a learning curve for us. I mean, you know, with the changes that yeah. Arbo made, it was. Uh, yeah, kind of last second. But anyway, we have an interview coming up, and and let me uh, let me get that okay, going you, uh, here. So I'll mute right. myself here. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for that info, Steve. I will uh, jump in and put that in in the uh, live stream chat if it comes up. So thank you. Okay, so okay, I'm going to mute me. Good. <laughs> we'll we'll see if you can figure that out. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, so. Let's see. We have somebody on the line, Adam. I, oh, we do. Okay, Austin, are you here? I am here, Adam. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. Hi, uh, How are you doing, Austin? I'm I'm doing uh, I'm doing pretty well. It's uh, thankfully it's a it's a nice sunny day here. So uh, hopefully I'll I'll have a little time to to get around and and do a walk or something. Obviously wearing a facial coverings but uh but still get out and enjoy a little bit of sun yeah yeah we're gonna need it after this day uh, and, and i apologize that we seem a little bit more scattered here today but with the uh changes that, that cope dictated um and then suddenly we had a huge influx of people coming to the conference so it's been it's been kind of a crazy morning today <laughs> no it's uh, I, I i can i can imagine and i know uh, i know you guys are on a little bit longer for this event than uh than the event we did, uh, you know, just about a month ago. So I imagine it's a long day. So so hopefully you got a lot of coffee to get you through. Yeah, yeah, it's been it's been kind of crazy. In fact, let's talk about that conference that we did. So many people don't know about this. So let me put it up here on the screen so people can see. We all did a conference together. It wasn't for real CE. It was education, but it wasn't for Cope CE. Um, the Virtual Optometric Summit, and this was really fun. Uh, you know, we put it together with you guys in a, a hurry. I think how many days was it from? You know, idea to execution. It had to be it, less than a month. It, it 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 was it was just about three weeks. So <laughs> I I remember it vividly. We were um, uh, it was the Friday of Seco that the official announcement that Vision Expo East uh, was getting canceled, which at the time you know seemed so major, and now kind of looking back at it, seems you know relatively minor in, in kind of the grand scheme of everything that that's been going on in the world, but. Uh, it was that Friday, and the suggestion came out. You know, can we can we get this together? Um, you know, we connected with you. We connected with the guys at uh, Covalent Careers, and uh, were able to get it turned around. That uh, three weeks later, that Friday and and Saturday, we were uh, we were running this this virtual optometric summit, which uh, yeah was was great. Uh, tons of tons of great feedback. Like you said, you know, we weren't able to do CE credit, but just providing a, a space for the optometric community to come together, share ideas, you know, hear some great clinical presentations and insights. 
um, you know, by far one of the best events that we've ever had, you know, as far as an attendance and participation um, from a Zeiss perspective. Uh, you know, obviously we know this is really just challenging times, you know, to, to put it lightly for, for doctors. I, um, I had a chance to, I, I didn't catch the, the gentleman's whole name, but uh, we saw on two interviews ago who you know, was talking about for 42 days or something has been losing money. I, you know, I know that's not, I, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's just, you know, we know that that's not unfortunately uncommon across the country right now. Just, you know, practice is being put in a really difficult situation. So, just being able to to do whatever we can to you know provide resources, provide insights, and um, you know a place for for people to have a you know a little bit of distraction, get some great information, and um, like I said, really just kind of come together as an optometric community. Well, I really appreciate what you guys did. I mean, I didn't when you when you first proposed it to us, I'm like, oh my god, can we pull this off in less than thirty days? Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> you know, I, I kept my yeah, fingers I, crossed, I, and you did it. I was I was really impressed. I, yeah, I, I would lie if I said I wasn't a, a little relieved at, uh, you know, Saturday, you know, come like noon or something, kind of when we had officially wrapped up that it was, we got it done, we got it executed, everything will be kind of live and, and up and, you know, it, it is still live and up, um, I think at least through the end of the month and we'll probably continue it for, for a while longer. Uh, I imagine, uh, you know, people are still going in and checking it out. Uh, so, yeah, it was definitely a, definitely a stretch to get it all done, but, uh, a, you know, a little bit of a fun distraction, frankly, just, you know, again, given everything that's going on, being in this work from home environment uh, to really have something to kind of sink your teeth into was, uh, at least for me, a, a real joy. Absolutely. It was great. And so um, one thing that we learned at, you know, that event is that you guys were doing a, a, um, a, a breath shield uh, donation program. Is that still going on? Uh, that is still going on. So uh, we actually have a website, um, and, I, and I'll make sure to provide you the link if if, if you don't have it anymore. But uh, we're offering uh, free breast shields for any um, any practice, regardless of if you have Zeiss equipment or not. Uh, you know, we want to be able to kind of support and be able to provide some of these, you know, protective social distancing type measures. Uh, so you know, just having these these plastic. Um, you know, breast shields, nice breast shields that will uh, sit over your slit lamp oculars, um, you know, kind of help provide that extra barrier uh, between the clinician and, and the patient. So uh, they can go online, uh, just simply fill out a, a form and, and we'll process. Uh, I want to say, and, and we've been doing this uh, globally, so, you know, I, personally for me, I, I'm really proud to be working for Zeiss right now. Um, you know, the, the direction from our leadership team about, you know, we want to put our money where our mouth is. We want to be a good partner. We want to support our customers. You know, this is just another example of how we're able to do that. So I think globally, we're somewhere above 20,000 orders that have been placed. So uh, certainly wow. high demand, the team, yeah, the team has been churning these out and trying to, trying to get them out as quick as possible. So, um, uh, you know, it's it's been. I, I don't think anybody expected quite the demand, but uh, but we're happy to be able to kind of provide the uh, the need uh, or or be able to to fill a need so far. Right, and Austin, I thank you so much for that. I know that doctors are really looking for solutions to make clinical care safer, not only for themselves but for their staff and their patients. So um, I'm grateful, and I know that doctors are that you're stepping up to do that. So thank you. Um, on behalf of you and everybody on your team who's doing that. Oh, you're uh, you're most welcome. And again, you know, this is uh, one of the benefits of, of being in a company like Zeiss. You know, we've been around for 170 something years. I can't remember the exact number, but uh, uh, you know, we this isn't unfortunately the first worldwide pandemic that Zeiss has seen. Um, so, but you know, with with such a big organization, a lot of stability. Um, you know, just again, doing whatever we can to, to use the resources that we have to, uh, you know, again, we're, we're all in this together. So, um, you know, we're, we're happy to support. Great. Well, thank you for this. And I have up on the screen right now, uh, the URL, uh, that people can see. So, um, so if anyone's watching, you can go to that URL and the form is right there on the page. I scroll down a little and there it is. So people can yeah. come and get the shield. Yeah, and, and on that, uh, so there's there's two pages, and I I don't know if you're on the the med support page, but uh, we've actually put together a whole website that 
you know, the team has been updating basically on a weekly basis, um, you know, any resources that we can provide. So additional uh, webinars, clinical presentations that um, our teams have done. I know our professional education team has been running a series of webinars. I know our um, our clinical applications team has been doing some digital training. So there's a number of resources that uh, that we're continuing to post to uh, to this kind of med support um, uh, page. I think the, the URL is like zeiss.com slash meditech. I think med-support-now. Um, and so a lot of resources. I know up there right now there's some uh, instructions on you know, disinfecting devices, how to properly clean. Um, you know, I, I know, again, you know, with, with some practices that are open or at least running kind of some of those skeleton hours, you know, really trying to, to clean off the um, instruments so they can kind of get patients through a little bit quicker, but, but safer. So, uh, so stuff like that. And, and again, I know that the teams are continuing to look at, at all different kinds of solutions to, uh, you know, really look at I guess the way the way I think about it is, and and I'll be curious your your experience on this too, Adam. But you know, six weeks ago when we got at least in California the shelter in place order, I think there was a thought that you know in a month or so, whenever this gets lifted, that it'll just be like flipping a switch and going back to normal. I think we've all come to realize that that's not quite the case. And even once we kind of get the okay to really start getting back into business there's still a lot of measures that are going to need to be in place. So social distancing, you know, wearing professional or, you know, protect personal protective uh, equipment. So I know the teams are, are looking at solutions that, you know, not only can be, you know, valuable today when we're still in kind of this lockdown mode, but, you know, even over the next three, six months, you know, year, as we still kind of adjust to whatever this, this new normal looks like. Um, you know, it's, I think it's, it's premature to try to predict what anything is truly going to look like, but uh, I know the teams and our leadership have really challenged us to kind of prepare for, for, uh, for any potential scenario, for potential outcomes and, and what that kind of, you know, again, air quotes, new normal will look like. Right. You know, it's funny. I think that we're kind of in the same boat as you guys here in Oregon, because we got the orders right about the same time. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. up and down the West Coast. And I sort of feel like, you know, we were ahead of the curve on everyone else in terms of how long we've been trapped at home. And yeah. I mean, it really does feel like a, like a lifetime ago. I think March 13th was the last time I actually really left here. Um, you know, it's just, I don't know what getting back to normal is going to look like here, um, you know, and how long it's going to take. And I don't see any clear path as yet, or at least, you know, our governors haven't really haven't come up with a clear plan yet, at least out here uh, in Oregon. Yeah, yeah, no, and and I think we're in the same spot. I mean, I think our our shelter in place order technically is in effect until I believe May third. But uh, from everyone I've talked to, uh, you know, I I don't think anybody truly expects that on May third, you know, we're going to be able to, uh, you know, kind of go back to our normal daily lives. I think we're all expecting, you know, at least another few weeks of kind of shelter in place. But, you know, I, I will give credit to, um, you know, I, I know it's got to be difficult to make these decisions. But I think at, at least in California, I don't know about Oregon, uh, you know, I, I feel like, um, in particular in the Bay Area, we've, we've really had a, a been able to kind of flatten the curve, or at least, you know, not had some of the exponential growth in cases that I think uh, some other places in the country have seen. So, uh, so, it, you know, it does appear to be working. So, I think it's just trying to be patient and and understanding that you know it 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 may stay uh, stay a little stagnant for a while, but um, again, anything that we can do to to try to help um, you know practices to you know help people fit into kind of a workflow so that you know things can kind of gradually ramp back up to you know what life was like pre-COVID. Uh, you know, that's the types of things that our teams are looking at. Right. So I, I got to switch gears, though. You know, it's my my yeah. part of my job here is to sort of uh, promote and hawk stuff. And I know none of the manufacturers care. You know, they don't they don't want to talk about product. <laughs> They've told me they're like, no, no, we're not even thinking about it. But I always yeah. do. So and since I have you here and since this is your your realm, I got a question. So the SL800, putting it up on the screen right now. 
Um, how is that going for you guys? I mean, obviously right now, you know, everything's shut down. Um, but, but before, you know, the last time I spoke with you, yeah. I guess, was in, you know, a couple of weeks ago, or I guess at the, at the uh, virtual summit. But how's it been going? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we continue to get so so the SL800 um, is our is our newest little lamp. We launched that back at uh, Vision Expo West uh, for the first time. So kind of a, a quick recap. Um, you know, it it's really it's funny. One of our uh, one of our internal I, I think he's a you know, he's like a ZEISS director in New Zealand referred to it as the the Rolls Royce of slit lamps. Um, but it is a really nice device. Um, and because it, it really kind of does a lot of things that slit lamps just haven't done before. So, so a couple of things, you know, from an ergonomic standpoint, um, there's an auto magnification changer that's built in, which I actually think, you know, first of all, would do it's, you know, it's a really neat div- invention, very seamless for the clinician. But now when you add something like a breast shield in, it's a little bit more cumbersome probably to reach up and, you know, adjust the, uh, adjust the magnification on, on the slit lamp. So having that control, you know, right next to the joystick is, is really seamless. And then have an electronic quick stop brake. So not having to fumble with kind of the manual lock to, to, to set the, uh, the instrument in place, you know, so, so that's really cool from, from an ergonomic standpoint. Um, what we call our vario light technology, which basically allows you to have the, the benefits of, of both a, uh, LED light source and a halogen light source. So uh, every other slit lamp in the market today is using either LED or halogen. And depending on what you're trying to do, the uh, the benefits of, of the light source are, are um, can vary. So, you know, for anterior segment stuff, LED is really great. It's kind of that colder white. Um, but if you're, you know, looking uh, anything posterior, looking at the retina, um, you know, having that halogen is going to give you a little bit more of a natural fundus impression. So, uh, so it's cool to be able to have kind of both of those. And then, um, you know, obviously Zeiss is, is really known for our, our optical quality. You know, again, we came out with the very first slit lamp, you know, almost a hundred years ago. So, and just continue to, to build on that history of, of innovation and in optical quality. And, you know, the SL800, you know, every doctor, whenever they sit down and they look at it, they're just, you know, they're amazed. They're, they're kind of blown away by the optical quality. So, uh, like you said, it's, it's been, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a little bit harder to, to get, to get these out right now for, for people to actually kind of get their hands on. But, um, but the requests are still kind of coming in that, Hey, once this uh, slows down, once we can have somebody come in, can we get this lined up? So, uh, and, and the folks that have gotten it are really pleased, really enjoying, um, you know, just the, just really getting a sharp image, having a really just nice instrument. You know, again, uh, the slit lamp, uh, probably the most used instrument um, on a daily workflow. Uh, you know, I know it's, it, it's not always as sexy as the, uh, the ultra wide field cameras or the OCTs, but, uh, you know, but really a staple of the practice. So to have something that's, that's really quality that, you know, again, is going to last for, you know, for 20 something years, uh, you know, having, having something like that, that's, um, that's really just providing kind of a, a, a beneficial, um, you know, kind of workflow and, and again, providing some, some really great, you know, kind of clinical value, um, is something that people have been really excited about. So, so we're excited to, uh, you know, continuing to get those out the door, continuing to show those off, uh, again, when we kind of can in, in a, uh, uh, appropriate social distancing standpoint, but, uh, but it's, but the feedback continues to be, uh, to be really positive for the SL800. Excellent. And the other thing that you've been, you know, going heavily into was the OCT angiography. How's that been doing? Uh, uh, really well. I mean, I, again, so our, and, uh, I, I think you're going to have Ben on tomorrow. Who's, a you know, our global OCT, uh, guy and, you know, our, the Cirrus 6000 is, uh, I, I remember, uh, I, I, I was actually with you. Uh, I, I know you referenced the video that I think is on, on OD wires, YouTube page of, uh, just doing kind of a quick scan at, at vision expo West when we were just doing a, a prototype you know, the, how fast that, um, that instrument captures data, um, the, the quality, the clarity, um, you know, how wide of an image that we're getting, um, you know, on angiography, really, uh, you know, something to behold. And, 
And I think, you know, I, we're hearing a lot of doctors say, you know, maybe they're going to have to spend a little bit more time with patients or a little bit more time in between patients. They still want to be able to, you know, get those acquisition times down, you know, relatively quickly. So again, maybe create a little bit more distance between, uh, you know, the clinician and the patient. So anything we can do to, to kind of, uh, make those, uh, make those, uh, exams go go any faster you know using an instrument like the the Cirrus 6000 is is definitely going to make a, a big difference so um uh yeah so so a lot of positive response on the 6000 as well excellent yeah especially for angiography scans right which take a little longer um anything that you can do yeah. to cut, cut down on the time is incredibly useful yeah i think i want to say I, I think it's about half a second for just a general mac cube scan and then uh, for the OCT, you know, height, or excuse me, for the angiography, the, um, the you know, the HD angio scans, I think are, I want to say they're like 45% faster than uh, previous versions, but 43% maybe. Uh, it's kind of right in that ballpark. I, again, Ben can certainly give some good details, but uh, really a, a quick device, very, uh, very quick to, to capture, you know, just an incredible amount of data. Great. And so before I let you go, I have to ask again, because it's my job, um, specials at the show if people go to your booth. <laughs> so what, what, what do you guys have going yeah. on? Yeah. So, uh, so we're continuing to, uh, you know, we had, we had specials that we were running, um, you know, starting at, at the virtual optometric summit. We've actually continued that amount. Again, we know a lot of people aren't um, in that kind of buying mode right now, we totally get that and we want to support you, uh, how, you know, however we can. So any questions, please let us know, but, um, you know, but we are running specials, uh, you know, uh, again, for aggressive, you know, the, the types of, uh, uh, promotions that you'd expect that at an event like a vision expo east um you know we're continuing to run those right now um with some of our bundled packages we've got some extra warranty in there so i know that's really important for a lot of customers but again uh you know got some really aggressive pricing out there um some really good good options for for really any practice and again we've got such a wide um a range of tools you know from the cirrus 500 which is kind of more your your entry level it's a, it's a solid oct um, you know, not the speed of the 6,000, but, you know, uh, especially for somebody that maybe doesn't have an OCT, a great piece of technology to potentially look at. So a uh, lot of, a lot of different options. And again, um, you know, some customers are, uh, are, are using this opportunity to, to take a look and evaluate new technology. So if there's, uh, any questions we can answer, we're certainly happy to do that. And, and again, uh, you know, the, that, that pricing, uh, or we got some of those promos that'll uh, stay active, uh, you know, at least for the next probably week or so. Great. All right. Well, everyone, if you're interested, jump into the Zeiss booth and you can actually chat with folks or uh, drop them an email and uh, take advantage. So Austin, thank you so much for doing this today. No, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and, and congratulations on, on how many folks I know have registered. And, uh, you know, it's great that uh, again, at a time like this, to, to have a platform where people can come in and, and actually get that CE credit, um, that's tremendous. So uh, so hopefully it's a, a very successful next couple of days for you guys. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Austin, and we'll catch you later. All right. Thanks, sounds Austin. good. All right. Have a good one. Bye. I'm back now, by the way, if you uh, can hear me. Hey, Steve. Good. I, I am good to myself. There were some, uh, some questions in Ben's lecture about getting the quiz. He was... Uh, he was texting me and I was giving him some advice, but he said you just jumped in and said thank you. Yep. So I, you know, I've, like I said, I lost three pounds running around the uh, conference hall. Uh, <laughs> well, that's what that means. Okay, I wasn't following you. <laughs> but uh, it, it's all cool now because that the big caveat that um, that Kat didn't tell me is that the live quizzes appear as live and it's really basically an attestation. So they just have to put their tracking number in. Yep. license number and say yes they were there so there's no immediacy there's no problem jeff's a little bit of a problem people are gonna have to take the course again but that's okay um yeah so and but, uh, uh, that, but for the most part though things are going okay now and again i'm going to cut a movie tonight to explain to people yep. about making sure that they just have to sign Got those it. documents again it's it's kind of like putting signing a sign-in sheet just later <laughs> you know doing yep. it the next but day it's amazing and we have uh in the sessions now there's 1653 people good lord so, oh my uh, God. Uh, that's 
about three or four times what we normally get. So, so uh, yeah, it, it's stressful. So that, that's why things are sometimes the volume isn't good and she she fixes it or whatever she does on her back end. And uh, besides that, everything's fine. It, and now it's going to run smoothly. Usually the first hour or two, but this was a very difficult first hour or two because we didn't want to give uh, 3,000 refunds. Yeah. <laughs> well, these are also very good problems to have, and they're also very much fixable. And I think people are pretty forgiving, especially if we say there are lots and lots of people, and sometimes the system just needs a while to catch up. So everybody it's, just be patient. It's, it's everybody almost, was very, very nice. Yeah, I mean, it's almost, like, was it's almost like running out of sign-in sheets, right? So it's okay, because I'm just going to send a mass email to everyone, letting them know what to do, and their credits are safe right. with us, and they know that we're here to always fix any problems they might have. But uh yeah, I mean, the, the sheer volume that we're doing is shocking even to me. I'm glad that the system is, is holding up, uh, yeah, for now. <laughs> it is, and so if it holds up for this, uh, the, you, you, we might be comfortable that it holds up for Carrie who doesn't need a quiz or an attestation or anything like oh, that when we, when we were in the movie. I, I forgot about that. I forgot to tell everyone about that. So before we go take our break, I just want to share with everyone what we're doing next week. So, you know, in addition to everything that's going on at SeaWire, let me share this with people. I uh, put this up on the screen. So this is about really the exciting, Adam. what's that? This is really exciting. Yeah, the movie is great. It's fantastic. It's it's so um, uh, well done production well, and the message is is very very um, uh, apropos at this time. Yep. So we're having a movie screening. So as Carrie Gelb came to us, Dr. Gelb, uh, and who's actually giving a talk here as well. So everyone knows and loves him. He made a movie, a, a real honest to god documentary about eye care and its place within the healthcare system. And it's really professionally done and it's really great. Uh, and he was gonna premiere this at Expo East, but of course there was no Expo East. Uh, so he approached us and asked if we wanted to do it online and just stream it for, for folks that wanted to show up live. Um, again, it's a one night only thing. This is not gonna be on demand. You gotta show up live uh, and watch it. It's gonna be on April 29th, which is Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern. And we're gonna do a little screening in the movie. We're gonna have a little live stream going to um, where Carrie and I are going to do a little Q&A at the end. If you want to ask him questions, feel free. It's Again, you can use the same interfaces we're using right now um, for the live stream. But I just wanted to show everyone, we have um, some promos here as well. So let me, uh, let me play one of these promos so people can see what we're talking about with the movie. It's really short, so here we go. So people, I, we couldn't hear it, but everyone else could. So uh, that's that's the documentary, and um, it's you sign up right here at this web page. Let me put it back up again. It's oye, so for open your eyes, oye.odr.org, and there's a sign up sheet right there. Fill that out. You'll be registered, and then the the day of the uh, movie, we'll shoot you a link um, to where you can go and watch and participate. So it's going to be a lot of fun. the The response to it has been huge. Um, several thousand people have already RSVP'd uh, to be there that night. So I think it's going to be a really fun night where everyone can just get together and, and watch the movie. So hope to see everybody there. All right. So I think, what time is it now? So it's almost 11. So I think we're going to take a break because I could definitely use one. Um, so I'm going to play the, the greatest movie in history, other than Carrie's, of course, our trip to the Contact Lens Museum. What do you think about that? Oh, that is yep. a great movie, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like it, um, you know, because I, I still want to promote the museum. And I, unfortunately, of course, they, you know, we, we play this movie now. No one can go to the museum, right, because everything's shut. Um, but I wanted to show people at least what they have. So when this is all over, maybe people will make the pilgrimage out there, at least if they're at Pacific, right? It's right across the street. Uh, it's definitely something that you don't want to miss. Um, well, Adam, and it's also... It, it, it's in wine country, so you just don't have to spend time at the museum. Uh, figure out where there are some vineyards right there, and uh, you can do two things at once. <laughs> hey, speaking of that, Adam, you still owe me a trip to the wine country. I do. We blew it last time. Next time you're out here, we're definitely going to do it. you got to come, you know, off-season, though, like when it's, you know, you're always here in the winter because that's when sea wire is when it's at its worst. you got to come during the summer when Portland's actually a nice place to be. 
I think you need to schedule a CE wire at a time when it is not crappy weather. I cannot control that, my good sir. That is true. You well you make a good point. The way things are the way things are going, we may have another one in the summer. <laughs> so <laughs> oh. if I can come out and I can go through the bleach shower before I come into your house, I will do it. Yep, you have to have four, fourteen day quarantine. We have to put you somewhere else for fourteen days before we trust you. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway, let me get this movie going. And we're going to be back at 12 with a few more interviews. And uh, and there we go. That's 3 o'clock. Oh, sorry. 3, 3 o'clock Eastern time. 3 o'clock Eastern. Yes, 12 o'clock uh, Pacific. So here we go with the museum. And we'll see you guys in a bit. See you soon. Pat, would so. you um, tell us how you came about this idea? What prompted you and Craig to start a collection? Well, you know, uh, like most collections, you start collecting things one at a time, and then one day you wake up and you find uh, you've got a museum sitting in your home in closets, garages, and we found ourselves in that situation and then uh, decided that uh, we were just going to open up a contact lens museum. How long did it take you to curate the collection in here? A long time and we, that's an ongoing endeavor. Um, you know, Trying to do something of this magnitude while you're working full-time and everything else, uh, got full curriculum and back there it's um, it's, it's been very busy, but as you can see, um, it's just such a joy. It just brings so many smiles to so many faces when you bring older practitioners <laughs> through here. Yeah, the, because the relic in. It, yeah, <laughs> it, it really, it's so true. Why do you me? I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, we'll put you in the chair. There you go. That won't be creepy at all. <laughs> no, it won't be creepy at all. But no, you're so right. It's just uh, so many memories then come back to all of us that were touched by contact lenses. You know, it's uh, when you think about how contact lenses have changed so many people's lives of and course. changed their lives. All those keratoconus patients, and irregular cornea patients. It's it's humbling, you know, to you know be a part of you know having this history. So we we felt that uh, you know. Those are younger patients. Where do you get your lenses? You're nine years nine old. Nine years old. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Really, the younger contact lenses were. Yeah, you know, they're in so many millions of people's lives have been changed so much with these. Now, if practitioners have anything lying around their basements or garages or the oh. back room of their practices, mm -hmm. would you be interested from in hearing from them? Yes, we'd be very interested. That's where we pick up a lot of these relics. Mm -hmm. um, every practitioner, literally everyone uh, out there, has one or two items that have been given to them by an elderly patient or uh, they took over a practice that you know had been established back in the 30s or mm -hmm. 40s. And somewhere in their archives uh, are these treasures, you know, that they've not known what to do with them. They hold on to them because they don't take up a lot of space. But they don't know, where, they know they can't throw it out. Right, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. But they, they're looking for a place to send it. This is the place. <laughs> <laughs> this is the place to send it. So. There, it can be archived, uh, taken care of properly. Um, we've, Craig and I have spent, you know, hours and hours learning about curating um, an optical museum like this. It's, uh, there's a lot that goes into it. We had to then uh, apply for a, um, a nonprofit uh, organization, a 501c3 with the government. We uh, got that, so we're official. So not only are you accepting items to be displayed here, you're accepting financial contributions to support yeah, the museum. Yeah, very much so. This has been totally funded uh, through gifts and so on, and by Craig and myself. And oh, that's it. That's a good charity for next year. Absolutely. That is. It really is. It's a lovely charity for uh, individuals in the eye care profession 
that want to see, you know, the history of uh, contact lenses preserved. So uh, you can see here we uh, uh, encourage donations, and uh, so we uh, yeah, we love it. You know, when people can uh, when they win the lottery, you know, <laughs> send us uh, some of that, and uh, so we have fun. But it's. Um, we get, the, believe it or not, our biggest support from uh, patients. So they feel this incredible emotional, you know, tie to these lenses. Sure. Now this is uh, actually just part of the collection. Uh, uh, a lot of it still is in storage right now. Uh, we need a, a bigger facility when we open this up in July. We opened it up with the knowledge that uh, we've already outgrown it. Uh, it's a good that, problem to uh, have. Good problem to have, and so we're just going to keep raising, you know, funds as best we can, and uh, hope to move into a bigger uh, facility as time goes on. And then this is, like I said, part of the collection. The other collection I'm going to show you is the uh, collection of antique glasses, uh, spectacle lenses, um, probably one of the finest in uh, North America right now, um, and that's across the street at the school. Um, so um, it's, this has been just a passion for Craig and I, you know, this collecting. And, um, fortunately, we have wives that understand uh, the insanity, because uh, <laughs> that's what it is. It's truly, it's insane to be doing this. Uh, um, uh, but, you know, Craig and I have been blessed so much, like you have, like we all have, by the eye care industry. That, Very much so. Yeah, that it's just been a humbling experience to be a part of it. So this is our payback. Or this is our legacy that we'll leave, you know, so. And it's a beautiful one. It's a start. It's, yeah, a, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful start. And so we're real happy. Very, very happy with it all. Excellent. So many, many years ago, as you can imagine, the, um, it's really myself and Craig Norman who kind of put this all together. The story begins over here. I'll sort of walk you through. This is kind of the evolution of contact lenses. The, uh, all of these lenses here are made of glass. And so these were the earliest uh, contact lenses in Germany and Zeiss. So they were the three making glass uh, scleral lenses at the time. When did Ober come in? Obrick came in in the uh, 1940s. How do you know that name? <laughs> I used to live with him. Uh, <laughs> oh my, my! I was just uh, reading a, a book uh, this morning. Uh, his uh, textbook from 1945 uh -huh. on um, contact lenses. It's really one of the earliest. Yeah, and uh, that is. What a coincidence! Mm -hmm. So all are, of are these companies related? It's it's no, Muller Sohn no, and Muller Welt. No, they were different um, families. Okay. Yeah, they had no uh, no relation. And uh, so these, uh, like I said, it's the largest collection of glass uh, contact lenses in the world. Hmm. So it's um, they're hard to find. They're very rare. Uh, wonderful to feel because they're incredibly heavy. Can can I touch one? Yeah. As a matter of fact, you can touch the one that is yours. Uh, <laughs> we wanted Craig and I wanted you to have this. This is a glass uh, really? scleral lens. Wow. And uh, it's all the contributions you've made to the industry, you deserve that. Oh, you are so <laughs> kind. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's kind of neat to have. 
you can see kind of how rough the optics were. Very rough. And, uh, but, you know, they got better with time. <laughs> That's a real early one. Like what year? So, uh, this would have been probably early 1900s. Wow. So between 1900 and 1910. But you could feel how smooth uh, yeah. the glass The workmanship was, was wonderful. But, um, yeah, it's... Uh, that's definitely one we wanted you to have. Oh, very nice. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. This would be a real challenge to apply and to remove. Yeah, it really, it really is because of the size. Um, these were about 22 to 24 millimeters in wow. diameter. So they were pretty big. And then I see that they're fenestrated as Some well. Some of them were, and that's kind of unique, the number of them that were fenestrated. Um, you can imagine drilling a hole in glass can be a little bit challenging. And, a lot of breakage. Uh, yeah. But uh, I'm always surprised when I'm going through the lenses, the number of them that have uh, actually been fenestrated. And that would have been a challenge as well, not only drilling the hole, but making sure that the edges are smooth enough. Because oh, yes. That would have been quite painful had you applied a yeah. fenestrated lens that wasn't smooth. But then you look at these Zeiss lenses, the optics are absolutely perfect, and they're incredibly thin. And I always wonder how many of those broke in the eye. You know, it wouldn't take much trauma. That would have been to a shatter really big those, problem. yeah. But that was unique of the Zeiss lenses at the time. Um, they uh, they were incredibly thin. Do you know who made this one? The one that you gave me? Uh, that one, yes, I do. That one uh, was uh, from the uh, Mueller Weld Company. Wow. Yeah, that one. Look from at these. There. And then so those are the molds right those there? Those are the molds. So that and is brass me, and then... Let me take you through how, let's say like it's uh, 1920 and I'm going to fit you with a contact lens. It would all begin over here. Um, May I sit in the chair? Yes, please. Okay. You sit in the chair again. That's where I sit. <laughs> I get comfortable in here. <laughs> and um, now the molding process began by just simply mixing this compound. It's called moldite. moldite yeah. And we would mix it in one of these uh, containers. And then uh, it would be placed into a syringe. And this mold then would be placed onto the eye and the moldite compound injected through here and then it would take a perfect mold of the anterior segment. So the molding compound would harden in about 90 seconds. So you had to be real efficient with your time. You had to load this, inject it, and uh, be pretty efficient. So you have to do that on a board exam, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> 1950s, so geez. And, uh, then uh, what happened next was when you had that beautiful mold, you would mix this next compound called cast stone. And that cast stone then uh, was just like a, um, a concrete, but incredibly fine, powdery concrete. And then you would let it harden, and uh, then you would have this beautiful impression of the eye. Now, back in the day, in the, before World War II, a second mold would have to be made of brass. And the reason for that is that when the lens was actually turned into a contact lens, it um, was made of glass, and the glass would just simply, the heat of the glass would destroy the, the moldite, so it had to be turned into a brass mold. Then it was taken over here, and this is probably the highlight of the museum in the fact that we have 
the only remaining glass contact lens making apparatus in the world. This really? is it. Hmm. This is the only one left. Does it work if it you works. wanted to create a lens? Oh, you yeah. Could? Yeah, we've had it fired up, and you could see we've destroyed part of the uh, table from the firing <laughs> it up, and uh, uh, it makes a lot of pops and noises. And now, there was a, this vice was on the stand. We don't know what its function was, but uh, it must have had some function. The problem with this instrument is that nowhere can we find anything written on how to manufacture the contact lens or how they were manufactured. So we're having to piece it together little by little. Now, the... Um, if I push this, is something going to happen? Yeah, push oh, it. Push it? Yeah, push both of them. Uh, this one. Oh and my God. It still works. That's the amazing thing. We fired up these motors and um, uh, they were still working. Uh, this is incredible. So, uh, they, uh, now, the way it worked was you attach the mold, the brass mold of the shape of the eye here. Top two, I think. Perfect. Now, that bottom, yeah, no, you got it. You got them both, okay. good. And what would happen is you uh, had natural gas and oxygen that were mixed together. Those were, um, it wasn't propane. Propane hadn't been invented yet, so they actually used natural gas wow. back in that day. And so the gases were then mixed up here to the appropriate concentration, and these valves controlled the amount of oxygen versus the uh, amount of natural gas. It looks like it's a very non-precise process. Exactly, exactly, very non-precise. Then they had these two by two wafers of glass uh, that were set right here. And then this was just simply brought around once the glass had been molten and this just brought down and an impression made of the uh, contact lens. And that's the mold right there. And that's the mold. So you would of swap the, uh, that out depending upon the yeah. patient you're creating this for. And then in this little container, when I got the instrument, uh, it was just filled up to about here with asbestos. Oh, excellent. So, uh, that uh, made it all complete. Uh, so then you would bring it back here, drop this mold, and because it was flaming hot from uh, being in contact with the glass, and it would fall into the asbestos where it would be cooled. And now with these little tools here, the residual glass would be broken away and then you saw over here how the edges were rounded and then the power placed on the front of the lens with, uh, with this. Now, the only thing we can think of here is that this was actually operated by hand the, to oscillate the uh, application of the power on the front side of the lens. That's all we can actually kind of surmise. We don't know how else it was driven. And, uh, but everything came with the unit. It was intact. And it's actually from, of all places, Perth, Australia. Don Ezekiel. Yeah, Don Ezekiel. And, and if anybody would have something like this, it would be it'd him. It would be him. And uh, you'll see as you go through the museum, Many of the pieces are from Don's collection, and that was probably the largest in the world. And he gave it all to us, so we're really super fortunate to have that. And he got his basement back. I'm sorry? He got his basement back. Yes, <laughs> he had his garage. He had, uh, had it in his laboratory. But when he sold the laboratory, it went moved into his garage. So he was kind of uh, grateful, but again, sad to see it all go away. 
and uh, but to have the only one remaining. Uh, now this is for this. <laughs> <laughs> A mechanical tool then, nothing yeah. to do with creating the contact no, lens. No, no, just strictly for changing out the gas. If you wanted to, is there gas in there? Could no. you make one? No, we uh, we keep the uh, the live ones in my garage at home, uh, but these are uh, actually empty. And so you have uh, filled ones if you wanted oh, to. Yes. I mean, I don't know that oh, I put asbestos there, sure. but you could create oh, yeah, a glass yeah. lens. We're the only ones in the world that can make glass contact lenses if you need one. Have oh, you tried it? Oh yeah, yeah, we've tried it, and it's incredible. Just there's a lot of experimentation getting the temperature right, getting the just the exact amount of uh, natural gas and the exact amount of oxygen. But you could see that it uh, would be very easy to, uh, to accomplish. Now, when PMMA came along, things changed rather dramatically because now it was possible to just simply use the mold itself rather than turning it into a brass mold. And what was used at that time then were these PMMA wafers. That's actual PMMA? Yeah. I thought now, it was cardboard. No, it's, it's it has this protective coating on it, and you just peel this away, and then there's this beautiful piece of acrylic plastic. Wow. For scleral lenses. That's really cool. Very cool. And now, you know, it didn't take any temperature at all to melt that. You know, you, that was not like melting glass. So I think we may even have one here that may be, yeah, there we go. Oh, so that's so, it. That's it. So dare so I ask the question, when you were in school, did you ever see anything like this? Yes, well, with, with the way it worked in school, <laughs> our, our contact lens course was one person with keratoconus that was handed down from class to class. <laughs> and we had a, it was at Columbia University, and we had Isidore Finkelstein was the professor, a very bright guy, but that was it. And he had this one guy, and every time they had to do something to wash the lens or something, there was no sink. Fink, the Fink used to walk in to the bathroom and wash it and try it on. And this guy never succeeded, but he kept coming back for class to class, oh. and that was the contact lens course in the 50s. Oh my gosh. That's so interesting you mentioned that name. I read his name for the first time last night, uh, Fickelstein yeah. from Columbia University, and the reason I came across it, I was uh, doing a story, as I'll show you down here, on Dennis England, who helped invent the first corneal contact lens. But uh, I came across an article written by Hank Knoll from Bosch and Lowe on uh, this gentleman from, uh, from Columbia University. And it was the first time I had seen his name. And so it was really yeah, so kind that, that was the kind of neat. That was the contact lens course. Oh, wow. period. <laughs> End of story. And then whatever you learn happened afterwards. Yeah. It happened afterwards. But the academy required... In order to become a diplomat, you had to be able to fit a, a scleral lens, lens and oh. using moldite. Yeah. And oh. what happened, yeah, as basically we smuggled in some anesthetic because there's no way you can put that shit in your eye. <laughs> yeah, don't no get and say, stay still now. Because you so, can imagine if the patient's eye was moving right. during the molding process, you know, you have a pretty bad mold. Yeah, I mean, so. <laughs> what year did you earn your, uh, your diplomat? In 1965, I think. And so that was being required at that yeah, time? Yeah, it was a very large class. Uh, the, the word was, you better get it now because it's going to get much tougher to do. But that particular part was separated the men from the boys because you had to learn not only to do it, but then to adjust it. And, yeah. were, and I was always very unhandy. I figured I'd cut my hand off with the burrs yeah. that, that they used. Um, oh, my. So, uh, Wonderful. <laughs>
So we have, have glass lenses. Glass lenses and then... Yeah. Uh, really? Oh, boy. Irv Orish and I was suffered. Oh, <laughs> my. <laughs> So here we go to PMMA sclerals. PMMA sclerals, and you know, it was uh, very uh, plastic, it was very slow to get involved into the, evolve into the contact lens industry. It was only after World War II that plastic really did replace glass. Yeah, as it was the World War II. Huh. The yeah. Plastic started first out on airplanes. Mm -hmm. I see up there. Ernst Abbey. Yeah, Ernst Abbey. Does that have anything to do with the Abbey value? Yep, it sure does. <laughs> that is it right there. He was the mathematician, uh, the brains behind the Carl Zeiss Corporation, and um, he was a brilliant mathematician. He developed this machine right here. This um, was it's like a, an early lensometer? It, it looks like an early lensometer, but it's called a refractometer. And what it did is just measure the index of refraction of huh. the glass. Huh. And because when they were manufacturing glass at the time, they could never control the index of refraction of it. Uh, so each piece had a different index. and. So what they had to do is read the index of refraction and then they knew what radius to put on the front to create the power. There was a lot of math involved. There back was then. a ton of math involved back in those days. Wow. And uh, but he was the one who really kind of uh, was at the forefront of that. Now I see back here there are corneal lenses as well as scleral lenses. Yeah, it's just like um, um, CDs and uh, VHSs. You know, <laughs> there's that time uh, in space where the two cross over, mm -hmm. and um, this was uh, really it in the 1950s. Uh, it was unsure which of the two modalities was going to really take over. Was it going to stay scleral or was it going to go corneal? And so you see a number of these fun sets that have actually both in them. Now here's the uh, Theo Obrick sets uh, out of New York. Uh, the one in the back was the original Theo Obrick um, scleral lens set, and then the one in the front uh, is one of the um, later uh, sets. I like these glasses down here. The world the, of contact lenses. That is that really is cool. Bizarre. So um, W. J. made them. Well, Newton Wesley uh, was the man responsible for kind of bringing contact lenses into the mainstream. Uh, so in the early 1960s, he marketed everything uh, to get contact lenses out to the masses. God bless him. Yep, and uh, he appeared on the Steve Allen show, <laughs> and he was just this incredible kind of showman, but yet incredibly ethical, and um, I yeah, never... He was -conic. Yeah, that's he correct. Yeah. Do you have any stories? Well, yeah, he, and he had a partner, uh, George Jessen, mm -hmm. yeah. and George was a, a glad-hander type of salesperson, and Newton was the front front guy with the research type of thing. Right. And. Uh, they, they did everything, and they not only market glasses, but I remember they used to hand out ties. Oh, I've got Christmas. one. Christmas. Oh, it says contact yeah, lenses yeah. on it. Yes, I'm so, it's so funny you should make that you're the only one I've ever known right there uh, oh, from the uh, Newton oh, Wesley yeah. Company. And, uh, but he, he was just this incredible marketer. Yes. And it was just so cool what he was able to do. That's good. Somebody needs to get the word out. Well, you know, and a uh, little known fact, it was Newton Wesley who founded Pacific University College of Optometry. Is that right? I didn't yeah, know that. Yes. He, uh, it's a rather kind of long and sometimes sad story because um, he founded it uh, but then had to give it up and sell it 
uh, because of uh, World War II and the internment camp. Oh. So his two sons and his wife ended up in a, an internment camp uh, throughout uh, the course of World War II. And uh, it was here in Portland where the internment camp was. And um, uh, Roy Wesley, his son, is still alive. And um, he is on our board of directors of the museum because he's this incredible historian of uh, that era uh, of the internment camps and all the kind of injustices done. Uh, back then. So kind of a fun story to just uh, hear him talk about oh, and, I bet. Um, about his life growing up as a child in, in the camp. Right. So, and then um, over here um, we have a couple other items. Uh, one is the Micon. This was the first commercially available contact lens solution that went into the back of a scleral contact lens. What is Micon? And, um, you know, it, it's, I'm not sure, I think it's a sodium bicarbonate uh, uh, system. What does it say there? I looked oh, it up. Oh, 2% sodium. Go. You were yeah, right. I was. Sodium bicarbonate solution. So where did the name Micon come uh, from? Now, that I don't know. It was manufactured by House of Vision in Chicago. House of Vision. <laughs> House of Vision, yes. It uh, sounds like a sketchy place. It does. It, it, uh, like a haunted place. <laughs> now, uh, next to it here is another one of those Wesley Jessen things. This was a research lens. Um, and... Uh, Patients were losing their lenses um, pretty easily when they switched to corneal. So what they did is they impregnated the contact lens with little uh, graphite particles. Uh, and then you would just pick it up with a magnet. or Are find you it. kidding me? Yeah, so it was a magnetic. A magnetic contact, contact lens. Contact lens. And that's what it's actually stuck to is the magnet right there. Oh my gosh. Did that affect vision by having no, that into the no, plastic? No, it, it's sort of like putting fenestrations in the lens. They never really affected acuity very much. And uh, just a uh, clever idea. So, but they never marketed it or anything. But it's just kind of cool to have a one of their... A magnetic lens. Wow. Some magnetic. patients may like to have that option available to them. Oh gosh, I thought it was so clever, you know, but it just shows you, you know, you've got a problem, uh, you know, this is how we're going to fix it. Who was the optician that brought the, I forgot his name, that brought, made the corneal lens popular? I was... Oh, Kevin Tui? Tui, yeah. Yeah. Tui lens. Kevin Tui. That was the first one. We've got some of his early uh, things over here as we evolve from... It took lids of steel to adapt to <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, the, then we went from the sclerals into the... Uh, oh, we have a, a Tui contact lens fitting record back there. Yes. Yes, now that's kind of interesting. That's Robert, uh, Robert Ryan. Uh, Ryan. Now, Is that I a HIPAA violation, Pat? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a definite <laughs> HIPAA violation. Now, he was a famous actor oh, sure. uh, back in the 50s. And, um, and uh, another the, famous person that was Ronald Reagan. Ronald mm, Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Yep. More contact lenses. More contact lenses. So, we had some pretty interesting things. Oh, so here's the little scandal, I guess, with Dennis England. His, he yes. tried to, he applied for the first U.S. patent. In 1945, I've got the original patent. Uh, Craig, um, I've got a Xerox copy, but Craig has uh, contacted the patent office, and we're going to see if we can get the original patent, uh, that patent application. And Kevin Tui um, preceded him. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, 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 sorry. Followed, okay. uh, he followed him by uh, two years, one month. Um, was uh, two years later, Kevin Tui took out his patent, or applied for his patent. That was uh, in the 50s, I think. Yeah, yeah, 1950. And then Bill Feinblum also 
You've got a well with scleral lenses. Yeah, and there's Bill's uh, diagnostic <laughs> set. Yeah, You'll notice was. those green lenses there, and uh, apparently someone told me that uh, those were actually developed for treatment of an nystagmus. Huh. Now, Did uh, it work? That, I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't know why it would work. Again, I wish uh, Bill was still alive. And, uh, you know, there's a, a, there's a Yiddish questions. expression, it worked like a toitan bankus, like a, a leech on a dead person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so did you know Feinblum? Oh, sure. Oh yeah, well, yeah. We used to, we used to yeah, work together. He was the man. Yeah. He was yeah. uh, Bill. Uh, what happened towards the end? He uh, he he couldn't handle the contact lenses, so he referred to us. Hmm. But he was a tremendous promoter, and his main specialty was low vision. Yeah. Hmm. Right. And he was able to get his his, his face on, on Life magazine. Hmm. Yeah. And he ended up having a tremendous practice on Park Avenue. And again, the low vision didn't work. But <laughs> it was. It was, but people kept coming I've got in. got that Life magazine with that, <laughs> his story, the Feinblum story. It's yeah, actually yeah. one of the really earliest um, he, he publications. Yeah. He was, well, actually, <laughs> his direct link but between Bill promoting and me. <laughs> Afterwards, oh, so, my. so I shouldn't, I shouldn't knock him. This machine, the Yeah, it's the only one I've ever seen. It, um, you know, again, another WJ product uh, from the 1960s, and you turn those dials, and it would bring, you would build your contact lens. Each one of those dials uh, put on a different radius of curvature. Wow. So you design both the anterior and posterior surface of the lens with that little, they call it computer, but it's just roller um, device. And um, it, a very, very cool thing, but. Did you ever um, use one? No, never used one. Uh, it's the only one I've ever seen. Yeah, those, uh, those tinted lenses are also very interesting. Yeah, those are from change England. Your, yeah. Change your eye color. Yeah, <laughs> Caprice PMMA what, 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 lenses. What the, oh, God. Somebody needed his eye color changed. Yeah. I forgot his name already. Well, I recognize something George, down George there. Oh, the actor, yeah. So George he came Siegel. in, you know, he, was, he, he was young and he had to play an Arab. He had blue eyes. So he had to play an Arab in some sort of film he was in. So Columbia Pictures sent him in. He, he was in New York in those days. So we had to give him one of those lenses. So I gave him the lenses and I gave him a bottle of anesthetic. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> so we shooting because he, yes. he suffered with them. They were thick and they were terrible. Oh, wow. So he had to have dark eyes for the shoot. So. Did you see the movie? Afterward? Yeah. No. No. Maybe it didn't even come out. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it could be. <laughs> Who many? Yeah, many maybe don't didn't. make it. I see a bottle of Playa gel down there. I haven't yeah, heard of yeah, it in a long yes. time. Uh, Playa gel and, and the ones behind it, the yellow ones, are called LC65. Um, they were uh, big items back in the 60s for PMMA. And what happened in the 50s and low 60s, early 60s? These lenses were very thick, and somebody came up with the idea of what if we fenestrate them? And they put four little holes in, and they called it the vent air contact lens. Yeah. So vent air, and then became, became a marketer for the, for the thing. They did a tremendous amount of advertising, and they ended up with offices all over the country. Wow. They were. Vente was one of them. There was one other company from Chicago that also. Yeah, um, there was a Spiro Vent. Spiro Vent had and, one. Uh, you just happen to have some of it right here. <laughs> yes, yes. Some of the, here's an original Tui uh, brochure. And uh, let's see, I don't know if I have my vent air out there. See, no, then, I guess I don't. After that, the lenses were so thick that the people were terribly uncomfortable, and that's when I went into practice. Mm. And Ted, my partner, worked for Ventair down the street. Oh boy! And he sent people over to yeah. me, and then we came up with the bright idea. Says, "Hey, if they're so uncomfortable with thick, why don't we make a thinner lens?" Oh boy! So we formed a company called Micro Thin Contact Lenses, and we got one Orthodox Jew. To work in Brooklyn in a lab, uh -huh. and he was the micro thin maven. He oh, was the one that 
that did it. And we had a thinner lens. And because we had a thinner lens, we were able to succeed where, my, where Ventair failed. So we built up a very large PMMA practice in those years. How did Ventair feel about that? They didn't know he worked for us. <laughs> and then after, by that, after that, <laughs> he left there because the practice got big enough that right. we were able to... Now, to over absorb. on in this cabinet is the uh, early evolution of soft lenses. Mm -hmm. uh, soft lenses were developed by that gentleman there, Otto Wichterly in Prague, Czechoslovakia. He started working on uh, the material in the early 1960s. He actually started producing contact lenses in 1966, and those were the first soft lenses. They were called SPOFA, S-P-O-F-A, SPOFA lenses. Right there, right in front of you, is the first soft contact lens brochure ever <laughs> produced. That was in 1965. Um, and um, these uh, lenses here uh, really do represent the first team out for first soft contact lenses. I've got one hydrated there. The rest are stored dry. Wow. Um, the um, very kind of neat to have those as part of the collection. These were the original SPOFA cases from 1966. And um, about the same time, a company in upstate New York and Toronto uh, started this uh, Bionite company, you know, which was the Griffin Lens. Well, I've never um, heard of that. Yeah, that um, was the... Um, a high water content lens. It had about a 55% water, but you see it um, goes back to that same time frame as the Otto Wichterly uh, lenses. Oh, and there it says they were purchased by AO. Yep. And, and then, then became Softcon. Yep, and then became Softcon, exactly. And then BB and L marketed them very differently. They had uh, salespeople. And the first sales manager insisted that all their salespeople come in in dark suits. Uh -huh. So they were very, very formal, Very unique. Very, <laughs> very businesslike <laughs> yeah. with, uh, with the Bausch and Lomb lens. Oh, that's and now so we're into the salt tablets and the heat units. Salt tablets and then heat units. Uh, oh, yeah, this the is the, uh, the scepter unit. range of the scepter units. The first one you see right here was the original Bosch and Lohm one, uh, 1971. The FDA had no idea on how to disinfect these soft contact lenses, so this is what Bosch and Lohm came up with. If um, you look kind of closely, that heater unit there was uh, actually a baby bottle warmer. <laughs> uh, they purchased them from uh, Gerber Baby Food Company and then modified the top lid to hold a contact lens case. So you filled that up. You remember this is still water oh, that you put in there and, uh, and uh, push a button. And actually, it was a marvelous way to sterilize lenses because yeah, after that, people, the cold sterilization came in, but unfortunately, they put thimerosal mm -hmm. into the solution. And that and was this one right here. This was the first. And the red eyes started. Red eyes started uh, big time. So you'll love these names here, Paul. The uh, normal, flexol, and oh, preflex. Yeah, that will resonate yeah, with you. Names. Those are just so cool. Alcon Swirl the, Cleaner. Uh, yes. That sounds like toilet cleaner. <laughs> well, it does sound like Sorry, it. Alcon. The septor unit was something that patients had individually. However, the office had very large units. Right. So you can no, right down here. So there they are. Yeah. I remember and, those and that, glass vials. And my that fingers particular on them. one ended up with a short circuit over a weekend and our office burned down. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> the staff yeah. got to turn it off. Before they, they, uh, they lost so many an office fire. with that unit. Wow. And, that, was, uh, that was when you met me at the door and said, Dad, you can sleep late tomorrow. And I came yeah, back from the lecture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
you know, this was, um, uh, you'll notice that a lot of different cleaning systems were developed because at the time, we had to make soft lenses last a year. Right. Uh, they were replaced on a yearly basis, so a lot of heroic uh, things were developed to try to oh, extend the length of time. The, uh, matter of fact, we had one, one scheme. We met the developer woman who developed the contraceptive sponge. You remember this Seinfeld sponge worthy? Right. It was a contraceptive sponge. I remember that. And it was FDA approved, and it had the ability that if you would rub a contact lens on it, you could clean it. And we say, this is what we're going to do. So how did somebody come up with that concept that this is a contraceptive sponge, I'm going to put my contact lens on there? I mean, where did that come from? Say what? <laughs> I mean, who would think of that? So, yes. <laughs> and the chemicals, because it was a spermicide, yeah. right? So, but, I mean, but, wonder what the chemicals yeah, would do so, to so the we, lens. We just started dealing with this crazy woman uh, who, who had some company in, in Europe and Germany, and it cost us at least six figures by the time we figured out it's not going to work, and then she conned us. <laughs> and so that, another scheme. Okay, so I'm glad to hear that you that talk was... talk about waste, my West Indian land, that was even worse. But So that actually, nobody ever really did that, so she no, no, took you for a ride. Okay, I'm yeah, glad to absolutely. hear that. Absolutely. I mean, not that you were taken for a no, ride, no, I'm not I, glad, no, but I that nobody was cleaning their lenses on a contraceptive that was only, that, was only, yeah. <laughs> that was only one of the many rides. <laughs> I see CSI lenses back there, yes. and now I, what else did I see? Um, yeah, Lens those, Plus. Now we're getting into things that I remember. Yeah. Those terrible vials that you cut your hand on. Yeah. Yep. And do you have a, there it is. The crimper. The, yeah, the crimper. crimper. I remember <laughs> those things. And those oh, very yes. light, uh, the caps. Caps. Uh, that they were, were light and then you them. put it on and then yeah. when you try to pull it off. Yep. There goes your finger. Yep. And uh, so it, it's just so much fun. Then lenses, I never made it. Uh, the 3M lens. Uh, called the Advent Lens, uh, lasted in the marketplace just a few months, and it was a pure fluorocarbon contact lens, uh, very oxygen permeable. They teamed up with Allergan to promote that lens, but it never made it. Uh, the Epicon uh, was another one that never quite made it in the marketplace. And then the Nike Max site down I remember here. That. You have any Still Soft in there? Still Soft is right here. Yeah. Yep. Another one that worked beautifully. 100% oxygen permeable, but yeah. way too thick. So yeah. you, it was terribly and uncomfortable. And so hard to remove, yes. too. It was that rubbery yeah. thing. Was Dow, Dow Corning owned it. Yep, and Dow gave Corning, way to go. Man, this has got to be weird for you. Know, <laughs> yeah. All these things coming back. And <laughs> yep. just, uh, you, you wonder where all that garbage is being stored. You know, I, I always ask myself, where well, is Well, are you kidding? Stored? I mean, I, I've got these Gilbert and Sullivan operettas up here. That, <laughs> oh, my. You know, oh, so, that's, and, yeah. But I can't remember what happened to them yesterday. Yeah, right. Either. <laughs> me either. That's... Uh, the truth. Well, you've got a DMV in there. Yeah, we do. And, and it looks like you have a designer case. Yeah, we do. It was a short period where Revlon bought out one of these companies. I, I uh, Hydrocurve. Bought uh, out Hydrocurve. Or Barnes Hyde. They got themselves a really serious PR firm in New York, and they sent me around the country to talk about... Uh, their, their particular product, they were interested in, uh, in, in tinted lenses in those days and changing eye color. And, uh, but they, they got me on morning shows all over the place by using a great PR firm. And that's when you did Phil Donahue. Yeah, Phil Donahue came through that as well. Oh, these you'll remember. Now, these were called medical alert bracelets, and, uh, and they were developed for PMMA lens wearers who had been involved in auto accidents and maybe in a coma because what was happening is people were wearing PMMA contact lenses, they'd be in a two-week coma, they'd finally look at their eyes and find a huge ulcer sitting there. 
So uh, these medical alert bracelets uh, made everyone aware of the fact that they were wearing contact lenses. And then uh, these old Shiatz tenometers, you'll remember those. Uh, we, both you and I were yes. trained on those back sure. in the day. And, wow. Um, really beautiful instruments and um, obviously replaced by applanation tenometry. And uh, wow. so. You know what you need? Oh, you do have it over there. I see uh, you need a, I was looking at this uh, trial lens that you need oh, a yeah. lens cabinet. Oh, yes. I have a friend uh, at one of the practices where I worked and she had one of those old, it was a big piece of furniture oh, with the my. lens. It was oh, beautiful. My. I wanted oh, it. Oh, no. I wanted <laughs> <laughs> Those, I, you know, they sell for a lot of money now, as yeah. you can imagine, because they are just beautiful. And uh, read this uh, Barbie doll. Thing. I saw that. Ooh. Does it? Why do you? Why does it say "looking for Ken"? Ah, uh, yeah. I, I just put that in there. <laughs> it's a little sexist, <laughs> yeah, Patrick. Yeah, a little, little bit, but. Uh, uh, on, oh wait, on loan from the Craig Norman Barbie doll collection. <laughs> yeah. That's totally awesome. Uh, yeah. We need to find out what other Barbie dolls Craig yeah. has in his collection. Yeah. Yeah, we we really don't know. <laughs> And you've got eclipse glasses in yeah, there. Yeah, you know, it's part of our history. Um, 19, or 2017. <coughs> that, was, um, that was really interesting that we had done a story about how to protect your eyes during an eclipse. And there cool. were a lot, there was so much interest drawn during that very short window of time of people talking about that yeah. and, and vision and blindness and looking at oh. the sun. So it was a great... Boy, a great news hook and great PR sure for all of eye care. It was. It was a, um, a wonderful opportunity for eye care to uh, tell the story. And then we have a collection of eye cups mm -hmm. there, and this was kind of the original treatment for blepharitis. And I don't know why it went out of vogue because it's still perhaps one of the better treatments for cleaning the lids and lashes and very popular in the 30s and 40s as you can see a lot of different styles came out and well maybe it will come back into vogue because neti pots are coming back into yeah, vogue yeah, similar know. concept yep yep exactly i mean that looks like patent medicine though what is that McElroy's lotion what is that some of these were mixtures that you would put into the eye cup and uh, not sure what some of these uh, actually had within them, but you'll see in the forefront the uh, bicarbonate uh, soda uh, tablets. That's what was usually used. Baking soda? Um, yeah, yeah. Hmm. And... Uh, This is really cool. And I now, see some uh, instrumentation up here, too. it starts over Placido here. Placido discs. Uh, these are all from the early 1900s. These are all keratometers, ophthalmometers. They look like satellite dishes of today. Oh, yes. they there were do. still some in my, in my school. Yeah. yeah. Those, Just like that. Yeah, uh, the ophthalmometer yeah. position. You had, to, you had to get the axis on. Yep. And they, they rotate and... I swear that they could still be used today, you know, uh, the electronics would just have to be redone, but uh, other than that, um, they're uh, fully uh, functional. And is the old slit lamps too? Yeah, the old slit lamps and, um, you know, you really realize that very little has changed in, in the optics of eye care. Um, optics are just such a fundamental thing. So this is circa unknown for this clock, and I'm guessing 60s. Wow. Yeah, you know, some of this stuff I'm still trying to track down, you know. Um, <laughs> I need to get out to Bosch and Loam. Uh, so much of the history of optics in of this course. country originated there. And um, I've... Um, 
been in contact with their curator there and a lovely person, lovely woman. American and Optical still do? Uh, you know, that's the other one. American Optical in Massachusetts, are they still around? That I am not sure of. And uh, if they're still around, AO was a big, big company. And um, then uh, back here, we have um, um, some interesting things. One, this is our uh, uh, little humble um, uh, library. What we're trying to do is uh, also get all of the books ever written on contact lenses and um, any articles, um, brochures, anything related to contact lenses uh, we're trying to archive and, and save as well. Does the AOA library have? You know, I'm surprised the AOA does not have a very um, complete collection. Uh, they're, um, uh, I've always been kind of a little taken back by the fact that they haven't taken their kind of the history of optometry a bit more serious. And, and, and um, Indiana also, they have the the history, the historical society. Oh yeah. They should have. Yes, and uh, so we need to get involved with all of those folks. Now this, uh, here's a company you'll remember, um, uh, Milton Roy uh, company. Here's a, it's an American Optical, and uh, this was the original um, inventory system for fitting contact lenses. <laughs> And uh, they came in two diameters, 8.2 and 8.7 diameter lenses, all PMMA. And uh, yeah. then, uh, but still a fairly complete set. So and not many of those. Your mother wore them. Really? She wore PMMA for a lot of years. Hmm. And then, uh, of course, this is a bathroom, but of course we had to deck it out with all of this antique uh, <laughs> stuff. And, and uh, so is this is, is really quite fun. And um, So really anything historical related to eye care, we, uh, we jump on, uh, Craig and I. This is uh, something you might remember too, the old uh, Wesley Jessen uh, photo periscope, oh, yeah. P-E-K is what it was called. And uh, again, that was uh, another WJ product. These are the projectors I used for many, many years. I know. <laughs> I know. Sure. See, the thing is, is that back in those days, that equipment never wore out. No. And I, like you know, it's only two. Uh, I play golf. Sometimes range, I have to play by myself because, like I said, late in the afternoon, um, like you said, you and know, only two things can happen. You can play great and nobody saw you, so you pissed today. off. Hey and guys, you play lousy the, and you pissed off. Hey guys, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> back. Right, let me kill this. Okay. And then the other thing. Oops, let me kill this. Whoops, let me uh, do this and let people know that we are back again <laughs> and again. Everybody here? Yep. Yeah, we're, we're here. Is Gretchen there? Gretchen, take off. No, sure. She, she was there for a moment. Now she's gone. Well, you still got the movie on, right? The movie is yeah. off. It's awesome. Yeah, where am I seeing it? Well, you have to wait. Are we live? We are live, Gretchen. Excellent. And we have a call coming in soon. Nobody, we don't have anybody dialing in yet. I forget who's up next. I need to pull up the schedule. I believe it is Art. Excellent. So, yeah. Good, good. Well, so, he, he likely won't be on time. I've known <laughs> him for too long. <laughs> well, well, we'll see how he does. So in the in the break, I fielded a bunch of emails, uh, mostly questions about getting the credits and uh, the, you know, filling out that form. So I'm going to create a video uh, when we're done here today and then just email it to everyone and have it also play. 
yeah. at the beginning of the day tomorrow. So people well, want to There's two things, Adam. One is that when they go right after the quiz, it does take 15 to 20 seconds. They don't see the little um, circle going, and they just think it's not going to come on. So that's when they do it directly. Then the other thing is, like you just said, just do it with the help button, uh, find the, the lecture, and we don't have to worry about anything. They can do it a month later from now. Yeah, I mean, that's how I would do and, it. And, that, and that, 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 is that dependent on the speed of, of uh, their, their internet provider? I'm not no, I think there's so many people online now that it, it's the service, the uh, bandwidth of the uh, website just uh, being So, so everyone is slowed down. So it isn't even differential like, for one person I click to another. When I click on a to switch, to, when I switch on to go to a different lecture, it usually went in a, in a second. Now it's taking you know like 20 seconds for it to load in. So it, it, it's the site because I have a pretty good computer here. Yeah, so we'll uh, we'll see how it goes, uh, and I'll just let everyone know because you're right; they can wait to to fill that other form out. And in fact, what I will recommend to people in a follow up email is that if they don't see it, that a credit's posted, go back in and just make sure that everything posted with their uh, COPE ID again and so forth. So anyway, we'll we'll figure it out. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I had um, text messages, emails, um, things on Facebook, and of course the the website. So I'm, I'm actually doing it now again. Yep. And no, it just but that says you were there. Okay, there's another one. Solved the problem one time. And and Kat's all over the place also. She's uh, you know doing the same thing I'm doing. So she, she's she's uh, very good, isn't she? She any yeah. any problem I have, I give to her, and it seems to solve the problem. So and this is one we couldn't anticipate it because it, it only happens because it's it, the site's being so um, um, well uh, tested. Okay, yeah, a good problem well, to have. Yep, yep, yep. No, no, as long as people have an out and and Adam doesn't have to issue three thousand refunds, that's fine. You <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't be happy yeah. with that. No, um, it, it's it's. Um, they have an out. They can always take the test. I mean, the test. They can always a test later on, and and no problem. So, luckily, the computer does sense when they were there, what time they were in the room. So, yeah, people, people are seem... still asking the question: Is there going to be a ch another charge? We have to tell them it's for free. I think yep. most of them just can't believe that they can get something for nothing <laughs> yep. like this. You know. Well, so I don't know if you guys should post that ad for. Yeah, I'll, yeah I'll, I'm, I'm going to make a post today, and I'll let, let I'll remind people and let them know. So not not a problem. You just put something up nicely here. I'm going to. Is that a uh, picture? Uh, picture from. I where? can't. No, it's on, on the um, on your live stream about how to get Rules live feed. successfully completing. That, that's what One. you like to put up, I, I assume, Steve, right? For the yeah. courses. Yeah. Yes. So what are you so, uh, talking about? Oh, hey, Art. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing Hi, well. Art. Hi, Art. Hey. Gang's, no, gang's all, all there. Gang's all here, yeah. It's like the Bronx. It's like the Bronx again. Yeah, that's right. Well, you know, <laughs> we, you got, we got three three out of five people here that were from mainly born in the Bronx. That's right. Well, yeah. Only Adam. I don't only Adam and Gretchen. Yep. Born Tree Mine Avenue for me. Where were you at? I was three months oh, in Bryant Avenue. But, but Adam, Adam uh, was oh, people, oh. you know, you were born in, in Mount Sinai, so you were in Manhattan. So yeah, and I was at one, one in Royal <laughs> Hospital. It was, uh, it was the uh, no, Oh, yeah, the Royal Hospital on Grand Concourse. Yeah, exactly. It was near the Lewis as, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, the small world, there was something called the Royal Bakery in the Royal Hospital. And it was uh, the brother-in-law of my my aunt, I should manage my aunt through marriage. Julius was the baker there at the Royal Hospital building. Yeah, the, small the, world. <laughs> the good old days, the good old days. Yeah, you know, when you can actually walk down the streets without a mask, unless and you were as robbing. As a matter of fact, there was there was one ophthalmologist in that building called Harry Shatkin. And Harry, and Shatkin. Harry Shatkin was a very successful ophthalmologist, except he was an inverted gambler. We used to call him Harry the Horse. <laughs> and he, yeah. and he kept going to Las Vegas. <laughs> you know, you're actually <laughs> shedding too much, light, too much light on the history died. of the <laughs> <laughs> And 
He finally died in Las Vegas at the gambling table. That was how he Well, that's a good way to go. You should go doing what you love. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Losing, losing money. One thing. Um, towards the end, I was 11 years old. I left the Bronx. Everybody did have masks on, but they were the ones coming up to you. <laughs> yeah, no, right. <laughs> no, we, no, we had... Uh, I we feel like I'm sitting in an old age home, listening to you guys get cranky, <sighs> wave your cane, take it off my lawn. <laughs> no, we're talking, we're, talking, we're talking about fun times. No, it's uh, we're not cranky. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, when the Bronx finally fell, fell apart, was remember when the lights went out in the late 70s? Yeah. And yep. there yeah. were riots. Yep. Oh that's, when the, the last, that's when the last of the Jews left the Bronx and moved to Co-op <laughs> City. <laughs> that was also the Bronx. There was <laughs> that was part of the Bronx, but it was way uptown. So, uh, so, so, so Gret Gretchen and I, Gretchen and I are just going to go somewhere else. We're going to set up a different chat. Maybe we should not leave. Maybe we should talk we should about something. A dry eye in the house. <laughs> we should have a dry eye in the house. No, actually, uh, the old days were fun, but uh, you know the new days have promise. The the but, future but hopefully can, will be bright again. But uh, there's still nothing like the ice cream sodas and the sundays at Crumbs. Can't oh yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Actually, no, Crumbs. No, no. For those who don't know, Crumbs was a an institution on the main street in the Bronx. Uh, and and back in those days, you would you know I would walk probably a mile and a half to to get there. Uh, and uh, they sold nuts and ice cream sodas, all kinds of uh, amazing delicacies. Right across, it's actually diagonally across from Alexander's, which was a, a tremendous yep. department store. The good old, sure. the good old. Days. You had a, you had an office, uh, actually, not well. Yeah, right, our, right our, our Bronx office was right across the street from Crohn's. Yeah, on yeah, 188th yeah. Street. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and back in those Adam, you have that ship. great power of muting everybody. May I suggest you? Including our guest speaker. And, and, and so, one more uh, trip yeah. down memory lane. Next door to Crohn's was Shipman's Stationers. When they were still <laughs> stationery <laughs> stores. <laughs> and, and they sold toys there. And I was the worst spoiler of my thinking. kids picking up toys <laughs> at Shipman's. Okay, well, enough, enough memory lane. <laughs> We didn't have a lot to occupy us back then. Oh my God. So, uh, so what's going on? So, so this, so this is this is the the future of uh, of continuing education, and not this particularly this conversation. But <laughs> I'm going right now. The future of uh, of oh, education. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, so, I, I, you know, Art, I was I was saying, you know, we can say it because we're among friends, but with the number of registrants that we have now today, I believe. That this conference has more optometrists literally than any other conference, including the Academy and SECO. Yeah, well, actually, it's you know, if you think about it, it's not surprising when you when you think about the common sense of it. Uh, here, you can sit at a convenient time, uh, not have to travel. Certainly, in these you know times, you you obviously want to uh, isolate yourself from you know potential. Uh, you know, pathogens or, or, or infection. But even in the normal times, you know, we're busy. Life is increasingly busy. We're still using a model of CE that's antiquated. Uh, and, you know, we kind of require people to travel for meetings, whether it's state meetings or, or national meetings, in order to get credits, in order to keep your license. And it, essentially, we're being held hostage uh, because there's a significant amount of income associated with that. Not that I I'm against supporting uh, state and national organizations. Quite the opposite. I think you know, we're idiots if we don't. And this is a you know a time where that's clearly apparent. But we certainly, I think, I think it's time we need a different model uh, where yep. we can separate education from from income. Uh, here, you can take a course, you can be tested on it uh, to ensure that you've actually listened and you've you've gotten something from it and still get engaged and do it you know at a convenient time. Uh, you know, there's got to be ways of doing this, and I and I think that's something that we really need to investigate. It's it's you know, kind of foolish to well, just continue the same old thing. Yeah, I think the the AOA is going to be trying it. You know, they're, yeah, they they mentioned that they're going to have online courses, so let's see how well they do. But yeah, in well, typical yeah. fashion, however, they haven't asked Adam his advice. Well, you know, you know, with someone like, that they should go to, you know, but uh, it never happens. Well, the, the good news, 
you're going to, you're going to be shocked. I, I think you, you know, I hope you're all sitting down, but I'm seeing some signs of change at the AOA. Um, they've done reasonably well in, in this, um, you know, unfortunate situation. I mean, it's, uh, to me, maybe not, uh, not perfect, you know, but they've certainly done a reasonable job. Uh, and I think they're, they're much more open. They're not, you know, it's not the most open organization in the world, but I think they're, they're more open now than they have been in quite some time. Uh, I'm going to be doing an editorial and I don't know, I keep wanting to do it. And then, you know, something more topical comes up, but I actually went to Washington, uh, asked by the AOA to, uh, meet with the FTC. Uh, which, you know, I thought, you know, <laughs> I thought I'd be on a, an iceberg in hell before something like that happened. But, uh, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you know, a long way, baby. <laughs> yeah, based on, based on, you know, past, uh, you know, past recent history. Uh, you know, it's funny, my, you know, my history with the AOA was like, you know, it's like a, uh, a sine wave, you know, it started like on a very high, high note, uh, you know, uh, chair of the contact lens and cornea section, you know, one of the key people in the fusarium outbreak and all that. And then, you know, with board certification, it went, you know, completely opposite. And then, you know, at yeah. this point, I won't say it's quite back up full strength, but th the importance of organizations is probably more evident now uh, than I think it's ever been because we do need uh, representation. Absolutely. Here. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, th sure. I think the, big, the biggest problem we have, and I think one of the things we really need to seriously consider is we have the academy, which is academically, maybe, maybe too over the edge academically, but, you know, completely um, uh, disengaged politically, you know, and, and it's not their, their right. role. Uh, and the AOA, on the other hand, is you know politically astute. I was really impressed uh, with my visit, uh, you know, to, with the with the organization in Washington. They're really on top of it. I mean, very. I, I think the average OD, the average member of the AOA, has no idea how engaged they are. And if you look at the Academy of Ophthalmology, they literally took this COVID virus, uh, unfortunate situation, and turned it into an attack on the foundation of optometry, which is contact lenses, uh, you know, and this is a repeat of, you know, previous episodes. And the reason why they're able to do that is they combine, you know, academic gravitas with political wherewithal. And, you know, so if we could combine the, you know, I know it's, you know, most people are saying, oh, there's a pipe dream, but if we could combine the AOA and the academy into one functional organization, imagine how strong yeah. it would be and how good it would be one, for optometry. One for the very least, if they don't want to combine because everyone, no one wants to lose powers, they should, they should combine meetings. Just yep. have a single meeting where it's political at one end of it and educational at the other end and save the expense of, of optometrists having to go to two meetings a year. Yeah, and that, the that would be very helpful. The industry doesn't so get I, I, don't, I, I don't think anyone else is listening to us. Are we on? What do you mean? Yeah. Are we on the air? Yeah. We are. On yes, the you air. are. <laughs> is the, so maybe somebody's listening. Well, no, I'm not sure anyone's well, listening anyway. So. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, I, you, your, your talk about stationary stores and bakeries, I mean, it drove everybody away. So. I got two orders, Adam. <laughs> they're stationary stuff, they're very tasty. Let me tell you, there's nothing like eating, eating paper back. Even paper was tasty back in those days. But uh, no, I, you know, I, I, everybody, everybody's talking. Everyone's talking about you know the new normal and all the change and all the change. And you know, human nature is very interesting. Humans go back to what they're comfortable with, which is close personal contact. Uh, interacting one on one, you know, if you can, if you look at the future of optometry, it's going to be highly medical. It's going to be highly procedure based. Good luck trying to do that remotely. It's just, it's now. I'm not saying telemedicine and and and, and you know remote uh, access to patients is a bad thing. I think it's a very good thing. You know, certainly for follow ups and things like that. But you know, we've gone so far over the edge. We we're anticipating a new normal, and humans are not about new normals. They're about slow change. Uh, we hold on to things that we're comfortable with. So I, I think uh, I think uh, we're going to see a return to normal, but that doesn't mean we should ignore the lessons learned. For example, it's predicted that a lot of practices won't be reopening. I'm not sure how accurate that is, but I think there are some practices that won't be. Does the average optometry practice actually have any reserve uh, funds stashed away? And And my guess is, 
Probably not. You know, and and I think that's something that a lot of practices will be thinking about uh, because there's, you know, life is uncertain. So should you actually have uh, two months of operating expenses in the bank at any given time, you know, just to be able to, you know, carry forward? You know, should our associations band together to be more effective? Uh, You know, should education be remote because it's better and easier and more convenient and more effective. You know, should we come up with other ways of supporting organizations, you know, maybe uh, interaction between CE suppliers, you know, getting accreditation from state organizations. I mean, so there's so many things that this brings up and we shouldn't lose the forest uh, for the trees because of everyone panicking. You know, the first couple of weeks, I couldn't get off of, of uh, Zoom meetings and a lot of it, you can almost hear the panic uh, in in the voices of people that you were talking to, uh, and they didn't they really didn't know what to do. No one's ever planned for anything like this, obviously. Uh, and you know, I think we need to replace the panic with you know good, intense thought about you know what the profession is, how we function, where what our future is, not just you know rushing ahead without a lot of thought. Uh, you know, in terms of you know what we need to do to make sure that we remain relevant and and we continue to do what is is key for us, which is uh, provide decent patient care. So anyway, I figured I'd steer it back to, uh, to contemporary, <laughs> contemporary issues. <laughs> well, you know, Art, I got a question for you, Art. Yeah, yeah. Art, um, it's so hot in Arizona. I mean, are you finding in the big cities any uh, decrease in the virus compared to the Northeast, et cetera, or is it really um, still as prevalent? So, so, you know, it's funny, I, I've been following this very closely in part because I'm, you know, neurotic and from the Bronx, but, uh, you know, <laughs> that, that Woody Allen-esque, you know, desire to avoid the fatal diseases. So, um, so, so I've been, I've been looking at all the research papers. I've been, you know, reading the news, uh, you know, you know, voraciously trying to sift through all the political baloney and, uh, and agendized, uh, weaponized garbage. Uh, on both sides, by the way. So um, I've come, you know, to the conclusion. I don't know if heat's a factor. We're going to hit 99 today with uh, over 100 uh, in. Um, uh, I think tomorrow. I think we're 100. In fact, we have an excessive heat warning. I, I I don't know if that's a primary factor. I will tell you that. Uh, when, you know, we ventured out and you know, I've been, you know, largely sequestered, we're still open. We're open five days a week on limited hours, um, you know, for emergency. And, and our practice was always, you know, focused on emergencies. You know, that was when we opened the office. Uh, there's no uh, residency. There's no optometric residency in Phoenix. So uh, there's no residence to take emergency care like there was back in New York. So when we opened, we realized it was an unmet need. So we uh, took 24 hour seven emergency call. Uh, so for us, it was just natural for us to expand that. Uh, so, uh, you know, where the office is, it's not filled, you know, we're not, you know, seeing the same volume of patients, uh, you know, by any stretch of the imagination, but we're, we're seeing a fair number of emergency patients every day. Uh, so one of the things, um, you know, that's, you know, that part of it's been fine, but I ventured out, you know, for essentials and things like that. A lot of people out here just consider it, you know, normal. You know, they, they're just, you know, go out on a Saturday and you see people driving around business as usual. So I, I don't think the governor's, uh, you know, stay at home edict has been taken that seriously. So we've seen uh, increases lately when I was projecting decreases. You know, I thought we'd be opening, you know, on a regular, you know, normal, not normal schedule, but, you know, modified normal schedule by mid May. I'm not sure that that's going to hold true. I think it may actually push back uh, to, you know, late May, early June. Uh, we may expand, you know, some of the uh, emergencies into more urgencies and things of that sort. Uh, pressure checks that have been put off and things like that, you know, uh, you know, included. Dry eye, you know, most of it's been avoided except for, you know, really urgent issues for patients. So um, I think Arizona is an example of a late bloomer with this, unfortunately. So, uh, and I don't think the heat's going to have an effect, although we'll find out in the next two weeks. Um, you know, it's been, it's been like a, you know, like a whipsaw here, you know, some days we have 20 deaths and some days we have, you know, seven and it just goes back and forth. So, uh, you know, th- that's the worst part of this, just uncertainty, you know, it's just, it's, you can't project. Well, you can't project. And you have, a, you have an older population there as well, I assume, right? Plenty of retirees. <laughs> 
somewhat, you know, this this is one of the, it may be the fastest growing metro area in the country. It's not it's pretty close. So we have a lot of young people who have moved out. We've had mass migration from California, uh, which I think most uh, most uh, people in Arizona would prefer wasn't happening because it's changed driving habits and you know it's kind of driven the state uh, you know uh, to, in different directions politically, which I think is disconcerting for some. Uh, so we have you know we have a fair number of younger folks. Um, mm-hmm. And actually, most of the infections in Arizona are actually in the younger age group. Uh, last night, we had uh, a neighbor. You know, we have, there. I don't know how many, you know, hundreds of yards away they are. You know, we could see them around over our fence. And they were having a party till about, you know, one in the morning. Uh, and and from the sound of it, it, it wasn't a, a social distancing party. So. <laughs> I really don't understand that. I don't understand why people are choosing not to address some of this. And I, I hear it from all parts of the country, from friends. And all I say is you can't fix stupid and it can affect everybody. Right. And it, it's interesting. It's, well, and I understand if oh. you think that you aren't affected, you know, that's totally fine. You get to decide for yourself. However, the way this virus works is you can be an asymptomatic carrier and you may not get sick, but somebody else may and somebody else might die. And I think people are just being selfish. And frankly, it pisses me off. Well, you know, you're 100 percent. I, I agree with you completely. I, and I, But I think a lot of it is that this has been uh, mis, um, what's mis- misconstrued by the public and i think there's they suffer from a lack of information you know the nonsense about sneezing and coughing and contact with surfaces and touching your face uh, i'm sure that some people actually can catch the infection in that way but this is an airborne aerosolized you know virus and it's just close proximity just normal talking i mean if you look at infection patterns you look at the current data you're seeing you know massive infection rates in in places where they didn't expect it miami is certainly New York, where you would expect it, much greater than they expected. So it's it's occurring from asymptomatic patients or patients who are not yet symptomatic, just from relatively close contact, especially in confined spaces. Uh, and uh, and people, you know, are just not they just because they've gotten this mis- misinformation that you have to be sick. It's just not propagated. So I think that's part of it. And I think you're right. Part of it is just stupidity and selfishness. They don't realize that they're just continuing this. Uh, problem and and propagating it and worsening it for others and that people are dying from it. Look at if you look at the data though, and and again I'm not you know don't take this the wrong way. I'm not saying this is no worse than the flu. It's clearly worse than the flu. Uh, but if you look at the percentage of the population, uh, and I just looked at the data in Arizona, the chances of you dying from coronavirus in Arizona are somewhere around point. Zero zero seven percent. I mean, you're talking about a fraction of a percent in the general population. I may be off one order of magnitude, but it's still, you know, well, well under a tenth of a percent, not even a tenth of a percent, a hundredth of a percent. So uh, in, in terms of the general population, we're terrified of this because it's been sensationalized in the news. You know, we, we read every day about some new horror, you know, some, you know, some clotting issue and strokes in young people and other, and again, not minimizing it, horribly tragic, miserable, terrible disease. But the risk of that level of morbidity is still fairly low. Uh, and the question I think we'll ask historically, looking back in this, was this handled in the right way? Should we have worn masks? You know, we were covering our rear ends because we didn't have enough masks. We were busy sending them to China. And when, you know, uh, when this hit and, you know, it's as if we were surprised by it. And then, you know, the CDC comes out and the Surgeon General says, don't wear masks, people. And I think masks do prevent transmission of infection. And I think they do prevent uh, uh, getting infection. And if they didn't prevent getting infection, why would we be doing our our utmost to get these masks to uh, healthcare providers on the front line because they prevent them getting infected. So why would the public be any different? So if we had uh, masks available and we had been better prepared for this, I mean, the CDC to me is the biggest failure. I don't know why that idiot running it hasn't been fired. I mean, uh, if, you know, if you look at it from any political perspective, this guy dropped the ball and should have been canned a long time ago. Uh, the public health response to this has just been shameful in this country, but that's a whole other story. You know what I find interesting? I heard a blurb that uh, somebody said that if this virus 
were disfiguring instead of killing people, then the general public would take it a lot more seriously, which is no. really pathetic and true. Yeah. But put, put it in a problem, Gretchen, and I, and I think this is a, a serious issue, is that the information that people were getting is coming from a media that has been weaponized. You know, I remember when I was a kid, I'd listen to the news at night when I was old enough to stay up for the, you know, 10 o'clock news or 11 o'clock news, whatever it was. Uh, and we had John Cann McCaffrey or something, and they would read the news. Uh, I'd wake up in the morning, my parents would have CBS AM on the radio, and I'd listen to the news. Now I, I put on, you know, a, a news channel or if I'm traveling, you know, uh, whatever I'm putting on, it won't say because people will immediately assume that I'm, you know, one thing or another. Or I go online and, and agenda is literally threaded through this whole thing. So we're not really getting an accurate portrayal of what's happening. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that in part is confusing people. I don't think they trust the media anymore. So they're ignoring the media, you know, even though the media is saying, hey, this is a serious issue. You know, there's also an intelligence issue for the average, uh, you know, person. If they're not, you know, paying attention to science and they're not, you know, we've, we've kind of lost our way. When I was a kid, we were all geeks. You know, science was, was paramount for us. And, you know, now it, a lot of people are not very scientific in their approach to life. Uh, and that, and, and that's why they need leadership from healthcare providers that they can relate to and they can trust. And the media's just not been very good at, they've been, uh, you know, getting different opinions from different people, creating confusion. So I think that's part of the problem. Yep. So well, are, what do you anticipate happening in your neck of the woods, Art? I mean, you know, you're seeing uh, emergency patients. When do you think that your practice will move to more routine care? And how do you see that executing in your practice? That's a good question. So, so I, you know, I, I've, you know, I mean, you know me well enough to know that I'm, you know, fairly methodical about things. So when I saw this coming, um, I stocked up on Sani wipes. You know, Shannon thought I was out of my mind because I now, you know, own the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the number one source of Sani wipes in in uh, Phoenix, I think, because uh, that's still kind of a simple of what we do. Uh, you know, same thing with food and things like that. So. You know, when I saw this coming, I, you know, I didn't go crazy. I didn't, you know, like stock up the houses and fill to the gills with it. But I made sure we had enough to last about two months uh, anticipating this. I, you know, masks we had trouble getting, although, you know, I did have some uh, N95 masks around and we did have some surgical masks, which has carried us through. We've ordered more. Uh, so we're preparing, you know, mechanically. We're focused. We've in, we um, enforced stringent disinfection protocols early on. This has probably been a month already. So, you know, we've been cleaning touch surfaces, all instruments in front of the patients. Uh, I was talking about that um, yesterday, you know, where, you know, I, I'm part of a couple of groups. We were uh, named uh, Cooper, one of Cooper Vision's, uh, I guess, 10 best practices for 2020 this year, which was great, a tremendous honor. And, you know, uh, Cooper was, was phenomenal about it. And so we meet every week with the other practices. Uh, and, you know, many of them are, you know, some of them I think are going overboard, you know, with uh, face shields and things like that. I don't blame them. I understand that uh, we're focused more on surface disinfection uh, and um, isolation, separating patients and masks. In terms of reopening, we're you know, going from emergencies and severe urgencies to uh, more uh, urgencies over, you know, probably beginning uh, in another two weeks or so. I think we're going to start seeing, uh, again, more urgent. Uh, I don't want to misuse the words when one of the uh, the companies that shall remain nameless that's owned by Vision Source named uh, um, iWorks or whatever it is, uh, decided that they were seeing essential visits, uh, which basically means eyeglass exams uh, because they need the money. But I'm, I'm not really comment on that <laughs> but but, uh, but at any rate we're, we're not doing we're not doing routine exams uh you know probably not until you know i would say uh, the end of may uh, the beginning of june you know again it's going to be dictated by uh, the prevalence of infection in the community and, and the risk to our staff and the risk to other patients so uh again it's going to be stratified by need uh, and by severity of the problem, as well as uh, the, you know, the, uh, you know, priority that the patient has, you know, in terms of 
ongoing care that they've been deprived of or things of that sort. So, you know, it's kind of well thought out. And, and you know, as I said, the mechanics of it uh, are primarily, you know, uh, social distancing, fewer patients. We're not going to go to the extreme. I don't think I, we've been talking about it of, uh, you know, having patients wait in cars outside. I, I don't really think that's that's necessary. I think every patient's going to get a mask. We've ordered enough masks so that when we, you know, start up on a, you know, on a, a larger scale, every single patient walks in, hand sanitizer, temperatures, and this we've been doing temperature measurement, uh, you know, for weeks already. Uh, not that that's that critical, as you know, you pointed out. You know, a lot of them are asymptomatic, but still, it's one more measure. Uh, you know, just to, to protect the staff and, and protect other patients. So, I, you know, I think I think we're as well set for that as we can be. Uh, you know, I just I'm just hoping that this is something that um, you know either we develop a vaccine for pretty quickly or or uh, an effective treatment. Uh, that's going to be the key. Art, Art, did any of your staff rebel about coming to work? Uh, no, actually, you know, Paul, uh, we, we have guns here, uh, in Arizona, so we don't tolerate rebellion. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's, a, it's a joke. Uh, no, actually what we've done is we, uh, when this, you know, became very real to us, uh, we spoke to every staff member, uh, and because we were cutting back, I mean, we we're, you know, seeing far fewer patients. We had two staff members who had issues with childcare, uh, and we offered them uh, a choice. You know, they could continue working or they could be furloughed and uh, collect unemployment for a shorter period, you know, to take care of the kids and, you know, arrange for childcare going forward. Uh, and two of our employees, I think we have seven or eight, uh, took that took that route. Uh, the rest of them, you know, are working, um, you know, the, the reduced hours, but no one, you know, they're, they're, we have, you know, really cool people. I mean, they're, they're more focused on patient care uh, and, you know, just they're, they're kind of tied to the office. They like what we do. They feel, you know, connected to it. Uh, you know, we have, you know, we have really an amazing staff and, and uh, you know, patients appreciate it. And we appreciate the patients. So they're happy to, they're happy to come in and make sure that, you know, we're taking care of patients. And the other thing I didn't mention was that we're freeing up emergency rooms, you know, so that that's an important uh, aspect of it as well. I, I, the last thing I want is a poor patient to go to an emergency room uh, at this point. Thank you. The, the reason I brought it up, we, we started a topic two days ago on OD wire about an optometrist that was sharing a consultation room with a dentist who went to South Korea and she came back and he felt that there was a good possibility that she had a COVID-19 infection. And he, he felt that he wasn't safe working in the same environment as her. So he first went into the consult, into the exam room and not spend any time with her, but then he just didn't want to work. And, uh, <laughs> And what happened was he said, I'm not going to work in, the, in these environments. He was an employed optometrist. Uh, right. they, the company fired him. So now he's uh, suing them for wrongful discharge. And what should be okay. interesting about this is if he wins, it means that employed optometrists can at last start uh, saying, I'm not happy with my work environment. It could be a very yep. interesting national case. It, 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 it is. It is. You know, I've been, I, you know, I get emails from, from people all the time. It's like, you know, that's the fodder for my, you know, editorials very often. And a lot of these young uh, folks, I feel bad for them. They, they've gotten out of school. You know, they're working, uh, you know, often in, in corporate environments, commercial practices, sometimes equity capital loan practices. And some of them have been threatened. You know, if they don't, if they don't come in, they're going to lose their job. Uh, and, I, you know, I think this is a difficult time. And people have to make choices. Uh, you know, uh, again, you have to take the worst case scenario. You know, this can be a fatal disease for some, even even young people. And if someone doesn't feel comfortable coming in, they have a family, they don't want to bring it back to the kids, whatever. Uh, I think that has to be respected. But, you know, I've gotten, you know, these, you know, plaintiff wails from, from people they don't know what to do. Uh, you know, you, I guess you probably heard that uh, Miss Wonger has been put on hold, uh, you know, the, the new school in, uh, uh, in uh, Kentucky. And, 
you know, it's kind of a shame because I think it was going to be a really uh, cutting edge program. I hope it gets back on track. But the reason why is they're expecting to there to be less need for optometric care, uh, you know, in the in at least the immediate short term and maybe even, you know, midterm, uh, simply because, uh, you know, patients are not going to want to come in. I, I don't think we're, we're seeing any evidence of that, but there may be some, you know, some long term repercussions, you know, from a medical legal point of view and from, your patient volume, and certainly it's going to be difficult to be a student graduating uh, in 2020. You know, you would never have thought 2020 would be a, a difficult, challenging year, but, you know, I, I think uh, it's going to be. I was interested in school, um, or I believe Andy Bazzelli was the dean, or was going to be the dean. Yep, yep um, exactly. I was, I was doing an adjunct professor there, by the way, and that fell apart, obviously. But they were yep. going to do a lot of this stuff remotely online. Um, so they were going into a new paradigm, but you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that's still live also. So I guess that's right. just not going to happen or it's going to take a long, long time now. Yeah. I, I think the world of Andy, I think he's, you know, really a lot of people, you know, you know, said, you know, unkind things about him because he's helped open schools, but his heart's in the right place. I think his head's in the right place. You know, I, mm-hmm. uh, you know, was also pondering involvement at the school because it, it, you know, it's, it's the first time. I've seen a school that was planning on coming out with a new degree, an OMD degree. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not completely averse to that. I think, uh, you know, just like uh, we transitioned from non-doctoral degrees, uh, you know, in Paul's generation to doctoral degrees, you know, and, you know, Paul probably half your colleagues or more didn't have, uh, you know, OD degrees early on. Uh, you know, I think, you know, profession will change to reflect its scope of practice. And, you know, so certainly moving on to a, a degree that's more recognizable for medical care. I mean, wh- one of the things that's going to suffer, you know, and I'm probably going to run out of time soon. So, you know, I, I, I kind of want to mention this because I think it's important. And Gretchen, you know, this th- this is also something I think you're uh, probably going to be covering. Uh, ABB announced that they're coming out with an online refracting uh, module or, or application for use by uh, independent optometry, and uh, you know I'm, I'm I'm very concerned about it. Not the, you know the technical aspects of it. I don't know what they are. Uh, I'm not a big believer in remote refraction. I don't think it's as accurate as you know as as uh, uh, being there. I mean, I, again, if we can come up with an auto refractor that can be uh, you know magically appear in someone's uh, house, you know, that's a totally different story because it's optical and electronic. But you know, when we're, we're talking about app-based refraction, I you know I, I, I'm concerned about it. But what really worries me about this is that you know visibly and one eight hundred are going to turn around and say, oh, so. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, what you said was inaccurate and, and a poor substitute for a complete exam now all of a sudden is okay because optometry is doing it. Uh, you know, I, so one of the things that worries me about this is that we're embracing these remote uh, examination processes, you know, open, you know, with, with, you know, open arms without really thinking about the long-term consequences. Um, you know, they, they don't pay as well. They don't work as well. Telemedicine pays almost nothing. It, it's restricted under normal circumstances and everyone's like telemedicine, telemedicine. Yeah, there's a, there's a place for it, but we have to be very, very cautious uh, because it could, uh, you know, have significant uh, long-term implications for the profession that are not positive. Uh, and, you know, no one's taking the time to say, okay, is this good for patients? Is this good for the profession? You know, what, what's going to happen in the, in the long run? Where should we, you know, uh, put this and where should we go with it? So that's a, that's a concern that I have that's growing uh, as uh, everyone's trying to make a buck off of this with, uh, you know, something. The other side of the coin art is the fact that um, the insurance companies, the government, et cetera, likes to lower fee for services, and that might drive it even further. Yeah, which is which is going to be great because there'll be you know if optometry practices go under, there'll be fewer optometrists com- competing for more lower paid uh, examinations. So it's going to and and tr- you know truthfully you know you know where telemedicine works really well in the large groups. You know, so if I was uh, the CEO of a large ophthalmology group and I you know employed you know fifteen or twenty ODs and you know fifteen MDs, I'd hire one more OD who would sit on the phone all day. Uh, you know, with a with, you know someone who would do coding simultaneously, and you could probably make that uh, pay, you know, reasonably well. But for the average, uh, you know, one, two, three person OD practice, uh, it's going to be difficult. 
you know, I think it's going to be very difficult to make to make that financially viable. Hey, hey, Art, I got a question for you. You you hear a lot of things, quite obviously, right? So you you know you're, you're like the town crier with your uh, your newsletter that comes out every every week. But uh, you used to call that yenta. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, have you it's heard? True. Have you heard anything? You know, with your ear to the ground about the private equity groups right now, and what what the heck they're doing? I mean, you know, it's the small guy is picking up his little check to to keep payroll going. What are the private equity groups doing? Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, it's, uh, again, I have I have you know friends who are you know heavily involved in, in upper management, and I, I really haven't uh, spoken in detail to them. I, I'm aware that they are working together to come up with protocols for reopening practices. So, you know, they're, they're trying to add value uh, as, a, as, as groups. Uh, I, I've heard from some folks that, you know, that uh, they're making sure capital is available to keep all of the practices running, you know, and this is wonderful and this is great. But I can also tell you the reality of it is that this is like shock therapy, that the value of a practice, you know, people were selling practices at, you know, five times EBITDA. I mean, so, you know, like ridiculous amounts. Uh, and suddenly our practices, uh, most of them at least, are very vulnerable uh, and financially not that great an investment. So the net value of uh, these large capital, uh, these large equity capital group holdings, I think, has dropped precipitously uh, and won't recover uh, for a long time, if ever. Uh, I, I think the, the, the window for selling your practice and walking away, you know, not that you walk away, but, you know, that you can get out a significant amount of, of money beyond what you would you know, have dreamt uh, possible, I think those days are, are, are gone. Uh, I think some of them won't uh, survive. I, I, I think some of these, these equity capital groups will fold. Uh, they may be bought up by the bigger fish that do survive, but I don't think it's a good time for equity capital. You know, I, I, I think for some of them, yeah, I think maybe it'll do better than some of the independents that haven't planned well. Um, you know, if you think, you know, again, you think about it, it goes back to what I said before, you know, how many businesses you, that you, you, you know, that you interact with uh, work without any, uh, reserve capital, you know, it's like, would well, they have credit lines at least or something like that? You know, does the average optometric practice, independent practice, you know, have access to capital, have access to, uh, you know, funds to weather a storm? And the answer is, is no, uh, I think not. So, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see, but I, I don't think, you know, just in, in, you know, summation, not, not a good, not a good day for equity capital. Hmm. That, that said, I'm uh, buying practices now. Anyone want to sell them? I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, tr truthfully, you know who I feel really bad for? I mean, obviously, I feel bad for colleagues who, you know, are in a difficult position. But in Arizona, restaurant business has been devastated. I mean, these are, you know, if there's ever an example of, you know, no cash reserve and, and things of that sort, it's it's definitely, you know, the restaurant business because they open up yep. and they fall you know, six months later. And some of these really great restaurants just are, you know, they're announcing now, uh, you know, we're closing our doors, we're not reopening. And, you know, these are family businesses and it's just horrible. And and what happened with the PPP loans and, and you know, and, and, and just the Small Business Administration insanity. Uh, I mean, these people, you know, were handed a, a lifeline and, and they discovered that it was, you know, slippery. It's Teflon coated with oil. It slipped right out of their hands because these, you know, large corporate pigs and, and, and banks I'll tell you, we're seriously going to be considering switching uh, our banking, uh, uh, and I will never speak at a Ruth Chris ever again. Uh, so um, <laughs> I will. I not. Only, I not only, oh my God! <laughs> well, they're giving the money back. We're going to boycott Ruth Chris. So I can't imagine. Yeah. Well, well I'm, I'm not going to boycott Ruth Chris. <laughs> Actually, I like it. <laughs> I'm not going yeah. to Harvard either, I don't think. <laughs> yeah. Gretchen, go ahead. You uh, say you, um, are the restaurants in your area trying to do takeout and curbside pickup and things like that? That's what we're doing here. And I mean, it's yeah. almost yeah. too little too late, but at least some are trying. Well, yeah, exa exactly. I, I have to hand it to them. You know, they some have turned turned into mini marts. You know, they're they're you know they're selling eggs and toilet paper, uh, you know, and, and and things of that sort. Uh, what one of the inducements, by the way, to keep employees is that I had ordered a lot of toilet paper, so we gave out toilet paper to some of the employees. So, uh, 
<laughs> stay, Are you stay. You have a shitty office, Art? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, no, no. Actually, no. We're cool. We're we're fine. We. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. You teed that up so well. <laughs> yeah, that was good. I, you know, I always set you up. You know that. I always set you up for a good one. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I, they are trying, and I think that's great. I think, you know, again, we have to realize that mankind has always been faced with these things. It's not the first plague we've ever had. Uh, and, you know, we're in better position now uh, to, to weather the, the plague storm. And the part of the problem is, you know, we also have access to information constantly. We're barraged by it. So, you know, the psychology of this is very different than, you know, the Spanish flu, uh, you know, in the early 1900s. So, you know, so well, the part of are, it, you're right that mankind as a whole has faced these things many, many times, but the challenge right. For just about all of us, with the exception of much older folks, or maybe um, even Paul might. Rem Sorry, Paul. Um, <laughs> has even Paul. things like that that we've had <laughs> giant war, we've had depressions, we've had a lot of horrible things that happened a long time ago, and they were a lot more common. And technology and innovation has made our lives, on the grand scheme of things, in developed countries relatively painless. I mean, you might not have as much as you want, but you've got more than a lot of people around the world. And we don't, as as people, we don't have the resilience that we used to long, long ago when life was a bigger hardship than it is now. But, but I, have to, I have to tell you something. I just uh, actually heard a news uh, snippet from uh, one of the, I think it was the BBC. Senegal is infinitely further ahead than we are in terms of managing this as a public health crisis. They have a dollar, literally a dollar uh, immunoassay tests that are widely distributed across the country. They've had some ridiculously low number of fatalities in the middle of Africa, North Africa. I mean, like seven people have died and they have only 200 cases. They shut their airports early on. You know, so you're talking about a relatively uh, you know, third world country that has managed this very, very uh, effectively, you know. So, yeah, you know, I, I, I agree. You know, we've, we've gone through, I mean, Paul and I uh, grew up in, in the age of polio. Uh, you, oh, know, yeah. you know, I, I didn't have a friend who had polio, but I know, you know, my parents were concerned about it. And then Salk uh, and then Sabin came out with polio vaccine. You know, the first one was a, was a shot. I remember I didn't really want it, but, you know, I had no choice. And then, uh, if I remember correctly, Sabin was a sugar cube. Uh, that I think I got uh, on the Grand Concourse. They were giving out polio vaccine uh, in front of Alexander's, if I remember correctly. So, and 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 now, you know, polio doesn't exist as a disease anymore. It's gone. And there are other diseases that have been wiped out by technology. So you're right. Uh, you know, we've kind of become jaded because we've prevailed uh, over everything. And I think we'll prevail, you know, over this eventually. Uh, over this, and, why of course, and of course, you know, Senegal, I'm sure had Ebola. And yep, uh, exactly. you learn from Ebola. Uh, but exactly. the problem is we, we don't seem to learn from other countries. You know, we think we're invulnerable and, and we just got caught with our pants down with this yeah, thing. No, I agree. And, I, uh, I, I I think you're exactly right. I mean, they have dengue fever. In fact, they're using a therapy. One of their uh, one of their tech companies uh, has a treatment for cytokine storm uh, that you know they originally recognized value in managing dengue fever, and they're now uh, they have a phase two and a phase three FDA clinical trial uh, that's you know being expedited. And this is, you know, this is a company you'd never expect. You'd say, you know, what's a high-tech company, you know, in Africa, what's a high-tech country? You wouldn't think Senegal would be, you know, would, would be that. Uh, you, wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't think too many countries in, in, in Africa would be high-tech, but uh, they are. They're holding their own. So, uh, you know, hat, hats off to them. Uh, and, and you're right. We work with our pants down to a large extent. And, you know, that's that's evident. But part of it is this, you know, insane political infighting. You know, no one is willing to do anything with, you know, the other. So, you know, and, and both are guilty. And, uh, you know, it really interferes with, uh, you know, progress, public health, you know, lots of things that I think would make life uh, a lot better. So I'm, I'm, I should announce I am running for president, by the way. <laughs> um, <I'm laughs> so, so meanwhile, Art, you, you, you actually have work to do here today besides 
besides this, right? You have a class, is that right? Wait, let me look, let me pull up the schedule here. When is that? That is. Yeah, it's uh, coming up in you know after my nap, I think. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it looks like I got it up on the screen right now. 5 p.m. Eastern time. Expert dry eye, a system for success. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's actually a great course. It's uh, you know every time I give a course, you know, it's it's essentially different. If I if I if I did that same course today, it would be considerably different than it was when I recorded it. I guess probably, you know, four or five months ago, because uh, I keep on learning things. You know, that's the great thing about immersing myself in an area. Uh, where I'm kind of it in, in in the Phoenix area is I have no choice but to figure things out. And I've been very fortunate. So, you know, I, I have a fairly good handle on what it takes to create a successful, from a patient perspective, you know, patient success, uh, dry eye practice. And uh, that course really uh, is, you know, recent thinking, a different way of looking at dry eye. It uh, acknowledges uh, Kelly Nichols' uh, addition of homeostasis as a key element in uh, understanding how dry eye occurs, uh, and it discusses it in some detail to create a foundation uh, to understand how to both diagnose and treat patients. So, you know, if you're looking for a good free, uh, well, not free because I guess they think they paid a nominal amount for the CE, but you know, I've done these courses for free. I believe in sharing knowledge freely, uh, and um, uh, if you're looking to in, in integrate this within your practice, it gives you a tremendous structure and format for doing it. Plus, you know, if you follow my uh, secret sauce recipe, uh, I can tell you you'll be successful. You know, a good ninety percent of the time. It's you know that's we're getting we're getting you know, tremendous levels of success. Be prepared for the largest audience you've ever had. <laughs> what do you think, it's Steve? It's, it's, it's going to draw. It's exciting. Well, over a thousand. Well, that, uh, absolutely. We have um, we have twenty four hundred people online now, so uh, Art uh -huh. should be able to draw twenty four at least. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm no, thinking. I'm thinking. You're going to have to come well, up with with new materials, Art. They've all, already heard this. One of my problems <laughs> I used to have is I used to like to give the same lecture over and over again, and when the yeah. program chairman says change it, and I told him, look, you didn't ask Beethoven. To change the symphonies. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's not good. Well, I like to say. Are you saying art is like Beethoven? <laughs> yeah. No, it's uh, no, it's, it's actually it's actually very interesting uh, because uh, you know that's the problem I think that all speakers have, especially you know uh, some of my some of my colleagues will do. I, you know, there are areas that I have interest in infectious disease, allergy, uh, but my primary interest is in ocular surface disease. So you know, so if you if you say okay, you know, what do you want to talk on? I'll tell you, it's going to be ocular surface disease. But if you if you have me give a lecture today and then you have me do a lecture, I can use the same title, the same name. I can tell you at least 25% of it will be different in three weeks. Uh, and, you know, I have these epiphanies constantly. So, you know, I, I think when you really get immersed in stuff, you were immersed in stuff. You were super creative. You were using hypnosis. I mean, you were doing stuff that was, you know, insane back then. So, oh, Anything to turn over a book, Art, you know. <laughs> Paul, Paul hypnotized oh, yeah. me earlier. I, oh, that's right. My last year. Did yep. it work? I don't know. You don't remember if it worked? It oh, did yeah, work. Well, you know. He hit the himself. <laughs> it worked. Yeah, I've, I've, to, to, to stop eating. Well, well, my problem is I've been in, in a sweatsuit now for six weeks. And <laughs> I don't know if I'll be able to put my pants on <laughs> when yeah. the time comes to go out in public again. Well, that's, that's, one, of so, the, that's one of the problems with this, uh, this sequestering. Because you, you, you get sequestered, but your mouth doesn't get sequestered. So, no. <laughs> and you're, and you're, very, you're very close to your kitchen, which is always bad. <laughs> which is bad for it. So, uh, much better off in the office where you don't have Oreos and uh, things like that sitting around. <laughs> yep, absolutely. <laughs> well, so I think it's a good course. I think, you know, uh, I'm glad to be part of. Uh, yeah, I, your whole your whole schedule was filled with some tremendous speakers, really great courses. Uh, I'm going to take some of them uh, myself. You know, uh, there are some people I really want to hear, uh, and uh, I'm I'm really proud of you guys. I mean, you 
you went into an area that was underserved. No one was doing online CE. I tried years ago to get the contact lens and cornea section to do that. We tried, you know, we, they got all excited about it. We tried, we just couldn't pull it off. You were really the first to pull it off in a, in a big way. Uh, and look, look what's happened. It's you know, gone from, you know, kind of an experiment to the dominant form of education right now. And if all goes well, people will kind of recognize it. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, if people compete with you, you know, if some of the, the journals, you know, who do CE want to do that, that's great. You know, competition breeds, uh, you know, better, you know, you know improved uh, product. Uh, but, you know, I really do think that, you know, you've been, you know, trendsetters and we do need to get away from, uh, you know, all of the in-person uh, uh, CE. And that's from someone who, you know, who spent, you know, a good part of his life doing uh, on, you know, in-person CE, you know, and I, and I wouldn't stop. I still intend to do that when, you know, things come back. I love, uh, you know, I think there's nothing uh, better than, you know, the interaction of a, a good speaker with a, you know, with a, a good audience, you know, when, when the audience is engaged, the topic is good, the speaker is good, you know, it's almost magical and people just absorb stuff and they answer, you know, ask, you know, great questions so that, you know, there's that connection that, can't exist, uh, you know, through online CE, but you guys have gotten it closer than, you know, than anyone else has. Uh, and I can tell that by the way, from the emails I get from, you know, people who've taken the course, you know, they're interactive, they're asking questions, they're asking for materials and I get lots of them. I get several a week. So, uh, I know, I know, I know what you're doing is working. Thanks, Howard. Oh. Uh, how is our nice. in terms of allowing stuff online? Uh, we don't know each individual state. I think we have, uh, normally we allow uh, 10 hours or something online, uh, 12, 12 hours online out of 36 every two years. Uh, oh. 32. So we're at 32 every two years with 12 hours online, which isn't terrible. Uh, you know, I, I actually, most of my CE is in person, you know, so, uh, I, we go to the state meeting every year. Shanna's the CE chair. Um, so, you know, there's you know, always interesting stuff. You know what, Art, uh, Art and, though, I got to say this though, and this, you guys may not appreciate either. I've been watching the people who've been registering for the conference and even some people who requested refunds, right? With, you know, everything that's happened with coronavirus where they just, you know, they're, they're freaked out. They lost their jobs. I'm seeing a huge generational divide, right, among the older, more established practitioners and the students and the ones who are a few years out of school with $300,000 in debt um, huh. in terms of the attendees, right? Because, you know, I, I agree with you that in-person CE has been great and, you know, I, there, there are real benefits to doing it, but I, we're starting to see, you know, people really gravitating towards this because they simply can't afford to go all the, to all the meetings. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. No, I, I think that's going to be an issue. You know, our uh, our young associate, one of the things that we do is we pay for, uh, you know, several meetings and give them, I think, a stipend, if I remember correctly. That's kind of, we built that in. Um, um, so, you know, uh, you know, I think I think it's important. I think the camaraderie at meetings is important, but I, I'm not sure it necessarily needs to be tied to CE. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think these two things need to become decoupled because there is some CE that you do need to do in person, you know, things that are useful in a wet lab format. But there's this this bulk of stuff where you don't really need to do it right face to face. So I think you're right. I think if yep. they decoupled it and that's what that goes ties back to what you said about the Academy and the AOA having a joint meeting. I mean, wouldn't it be much more efficient for everyone just to cut down on the sheer number of meetings? Yeah, yeah, no, well, I, I, I think you know, yeah, you're being logical. Yeah, you are being logical, and and you know I, I and I think I, I think there's a I think we have to be logical, uh, but I you know I think change is going to come slowly. I mean the, the profession is still rather young in in a, in a professional sense, even though it's been around for over a hundred years. But you know we're used to doing things. We're very conservative. Optometry is one of the most conservative professions you know uh, in in existence. So change change comes very very slowly to us. Uh, you know, I, I think it, it, it makes, to me, it makes sense to, you know, put together a group, a uh, steering group to discuss how uh, state organizations and national organizations can coexist with online CE, the same way I think we should put together a, 
you know, a, a committee to investigate uh, merging uh, Academy uh, and uh, AOA. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, an advisory committee uh, and open minds would, would go a long way. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Sure. I don't see Vision Expo East, Vision Expo West um, coming together and doing it in Nebraska. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no, they right they, in between. They, they probably won't, but you know, but the folks from Nebraska like coming to you know Vegas and you know and New York. So, uh, you know, and this and and Expo West and Expo East, you know, are innovative, you know, good conferences. I mean, you know, they're every conference has its own its own you know essence. Uh, so I have nothing you know nothing bad to say about any of them. Some of them I, I don't speak at for you know because I'm busy doing other stuff. Um, but you know, when it comes to just the average OD and what their needs are. Uh, and meeting, you know, the mandate of the individual boards, which is to ensure that we, you know, maintain, uh, you know, uh, I guess, educational uh, connections and, and, you know, uh, an updated knowledge base. That can be accomplished more effectively, I think, online than it can be in person. You know, so the, you know, the state boards really need to change the way they you know, look at things. So, you know, that's, you know, again, that's, that's going to not happen very quickly. Uh, I mean, even, even today, you know, with, with the changes that have occurred with, um, uh, you know, uh, the, with Arbo allowing online to be credited for in person, instead of the state saying, okay, you know, we're going to do it. Arbo, you know, was given a, you know, a temporary dispensation, but some states, I think Florida, for example, you know, is refusing to go along with that. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of ridiculous. It's, you know, it's harmful to the, to the uh, OBs and it's harmful to the patients. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's not good. Yep. Hey, John, hey, hello. Like John, in. You... John, are you on? Oh, yes. We actually... Hi, everybody. Oh, hey, John, how are you, you doing? Hey Adam, how are you? Good. I, Art, I forgot we I totally we totally just you? went over time. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So, so I guess it's time for me to uh, to bid you adieu. Thanks for having me on. Uh, and, uh, great. Uh, all right. I'll great catch having you. Guys you're, guys. Tough, tough, you're, make, you're making a tough act to follow, Doctor Epstein. <laughs> no, no, you'll be no. I can, no, actually, you'll probably be you know kinder, gentler, get yourself less in less trouble than I did. Uh, so. So, so congrats, my worst words are my last words are congratulations on uh, this major accomplishment of uh, being number one PE provider, uh, and I'll see you. I'll see you in the bottom hour. So. All right, thanks, Art. Thanks, You're Art. Welcome. Thank Thank you. You. Take care. Bye. Have a good day. All right. So, John, you made it. <laughs> I made it. Wow. Thanks for joining us. I made it. No, thanks for having me. Oh my gosh, how's everything going? Interesting times. Oh, going well, going well. I'm, uh, you know, honestly, I'm. I, I hate to say it, but I'm enjoying the, I'm enjoying the shelter in place because I have all my daughters and and my wife. You know, we're all living in the same house, uh, so I'm I'm actually just kind of enjoying having all my uh, all my babies around. Now the babies again are all adults, <laughs> but I'm glad that, I'm glad they have them around. Excellent, and you're not killing each other, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we're actually making cupcakes and playing ping pong and and all you know hot tubbing it. We're we're uh, we're really struggling here. <laughs> nice, hey John. Where are you again? Can I come quarantine with you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, there's plenty of space. So so we're in Michigan. We're about 45 miles northwest of Detroit. Well, I might stop over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're we're uh, we're doing well. How, how about how about you, Adam? Doing, doing, how are you guys doing? Yeah, no, I think doing doing okay here. I mean, it's been a, it's been a pretty long six weeks, but uh, you know, so, so far so good. And uh, you know, today the uh, conference has has gone better than I thought it would. We've gotten this tidal wave of people signing up, um, and I was very afraid at five o'clock in the morning that the software was just going to completely implode. Um, but fortunately, it did not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's looking good. It's looking good. I've been I've been listening on and off uh, in between. In between frosting cupcakes, uh, again, I know it's a tough bag to follow with, with Dr. Epstein. Yeah. Art could have gone all day, by the way. If we didn't cut him off, he would be here at, you know, 10 o'clock. Yeah, and, and, the cra and the crazy thing is, is that I, I, that I would be learning so much. Uh, I, I'm just amazed at uh, his wealth of knowledge. Oh, my gosh. Well, absolutely. 
So the big question for you is, how have you been doing? You know, we, we, uh, everybody knows you know, about the AB Max now, and, and we learned about it at the last show. We didn't think we'd be speaking to you again so soon, <laughs> but fate is what it is. <laughs> and so what have you been doing since, I guess it was February when we last spoke? So we're, I mean, we are, you know, we are obviously, the, 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 the economy and the market is gone, and you know where it's gone. We don't need to retouch on that. We, I mean, that's been a lot of uh, part of your conversation. So, you know, candidly, it's been slow. So we've been using this time to, you know, to get better. So we are in the process of updating our website and, you know, increasing some of our, our marketing capabilities. Honestly, I've been in the lab working on some new products. Uh, you know, so we're, we're, we're doing well. The, you know, the good news is, is that we've, again, we've, uh, we've lived through a couple of these. Uh, you know, I, I've earned the gray hair, so I've lived through a couple of these downturns, nothing as crazy as this, but, you know, we're all, we're all doing well and uh, just looking forward to the, uh, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel here. Excellent. And so for those who might not be familiar, I know, Steve, you're, you're an AB Max user, is that correct? Yep, great product, easy to use, um, tremendous benefits. Uh, fits right into the whole dry blepharitis, my bone gland dysfunction. Uh, we do it ourselves. The staff doesn't do it, um, and it's seamless. Your your product is better than some others out there. I'll just leave it at that. No, I, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. So we, you know, so again, Adam, what we've been doing is is essentially using this time to get better and stronger. Uh, we have uh, we have some new tips that are coming out. Honestly, this is uh, probably letting the cat out of the bag a little bit early here, uh, but we've got some new tips. They're, they're, we're identifying them as the AB Max Plus tips, which are a little more abrasive uh, on really tenacious, you know, plaque and debris. Uh, hopefully, those will be released sometime in July. And uh, again, you know, to, to try and help. Uh, you know, with with all of the stuff that's going on right now, uh, you know, I wish we I wish we could have a you know a magical cure, or, you know, wave a magic wand. But the only thing we've been trying to do is is we're staying in touch with a number of of doctors and practices that have reached out and you know have been either teetering or on the fence. Say, look, we you know we have issues with cash flow right now. We know it's coming back, but you know we really can't afford to do this right now. Uh, so you know, one of the things that we did, which is which is the the promotion we're running right now, for, you know, for the CE Wire, is we're essentially extending terms to you know to those practices. So if you remember in February, one of the things we did is is if if we if a practice purchased enough tips to treat 120 patients, they would get the you know the two thousand dollar device for free. Uh, so we've extended that, and then one of the other things that we did is because we know that that again these, you know, the docs and techs, everybody's at home. We're actually giving two additional boxes of tips at no charge, so that they can practice um, and actually get certified, you know, during this during this downtime. And then as I as I also mentioned, again, we're we're kind of um, carrying that that note, as it were, for 90 days. So with a small deposit, we'll you know the 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 practices out there that want to want to start doing this type of a treatment we will you know they'll get a full system with uh, again enough tips to do 120 patients plus you know 40 other 40 other procedure packs that they can practice with on me uh, so they can be ready again to to kind of roll and then again not have to worry about paying for it for for 90 days excellent and in fact so I guess you're recommending that they practice on their family members. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Well, it, or, or or the dogs, <laughs> whatever they like. You practice on Correct. the dogs. Right. <laughs> yeah, you, it's you know actually this is there are there there is a uh, you know I guess let me explain it this way. So there dogs do get blepharitis, and the uh, this is a, an effective treatment for dogs and animals to to minimize that blepharitis as well. So again, it's kind of the same same theories and same same protocols. But yes, you you could do this on dogs, and we have had a number of vets that have used this specifically with, you know, with my with my ex partner. Honestly, before I before I left Reinerson, uh, you know, we we actually started a uh, veterinary division and started selling the uh, you know the Gen One devices to to veterinarians and and their tech. So yes, th this can be used on dogs. 
that is really good information. I didn't know that. My daughter works for a vet clinic and I, she always texts me when they're checking IOP on an animal. So I'll have to ask her if they have this type of device in their clinic and, uh, and see what they do with it. But I had no idea that you could use it on dogs. Yes. Well, um, you know, again, historically, I mean, as you know, the, the Gen 1 device tends to be a little expensive or it, and still is a little expensive. So uh, there, there, are, there was not a huge uptake in vets that, that started doing this. Uh, but with, you know, with the AB Max and or, you know, honestly, uh, an algebra brush, uh, you know, this is a, you know, this would be a very cost effective way for, you know, for not only optometrists to do the procedure on, on humans, but also, uh, you know, vets to do this procedure on, on, you know, some of their patients as well. Because the tips are, again, the tips are only $15 or $14.95. Wow. Wow. Steve, I, I would, learned. I would pay big wow. money, Steve, to see you do this to a great Dan. <laughs> um, Great Dane, maybe a poodle, maybe a uh, chihuahua. <laughs> Great Dane. I, I, I'd, uh, pay, I'd pay ten dollars to see you do it on a on a uh, what, what's the big dog? I'm trying to think. I keep using my dog, daughters on the get like is uh, like um, <laughs> Irish. No, an Irish Irish wolfhound, <laughs> about the size of a mini horse. Funny to see any of those. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, how, how do the animals sit still? I've had this done, and it doesn't hurt, but it does tickle. So I'm kind of wondering, how do you pin the animal down to, to do it? Well, they just yeah, go hold the head. Just, essentially, just hold the head. Yeah, just hold the head and, and again, you know, run, run the tip along the, along the uh, eyelid margin. Hmm. Yeah. Just slightly. Um, yeah, you know, the other thing that we were talking about with art is that um, our profession and MDs are moving towards a whole paradigm of telemedicine. Well, this doesn't fit there. I don't see how this could ever be done on telemedicine or done at home. So um, you'll keep that space open, I think. Right. So, I mean, we honestly, we started, that, that was one of the products we started to develop for, for home use. Uh, was a, you know, similar in the new lids. I mean, I'm, I know you're familiar with new lids and there's a couple other mm -hmm. products out there. Uh, we, we started to develop it. I, I kind of backed off a little bit uh, for, for a number of reasons. But, uh, you know, I, I think ultimately, there, there is a, there is space and need for a patient use device that they can use safely to remove you know that that bacterial load and get rid of that that uh, debris and, and plaque off of their at, at least off of their outer you know other outer eyelids I you know as you start to get move inward it's a little scary but <laughs> anyway um, you know what? Also, you might be testing it on the viral load. See how well it does with that. I know it's a little bit more difficult testing. Right, right. Yeah, for sure. Kidding. I have to answer this, guys. I'm, I'm in, in five rooms at the same time, so let me just answer this fellow's <laughs> question while you guys talk. Sure. sure. All right. Well, you know, John, it's uh, it's funny because a lot of the the device folks that I've been talking to, they you know, they, they come on and they're in the exhibit hall and they're scared to actually talk about these specials and trying to talk about product. But I kind of feel like a lot of people, this is the time when they want to retool and think about it, right? Because before you know it, you know, there will be a point where things do reopen again. So I'm kind of glad that you actually brought up the specials and are, are getting them out there to let people know, you know, what, what you guys are doing. Right. Well, again, you know, we're, we, we everybody's hurting and, and we know everybody's hurting. Uh, and, you know, again, we're, like I said, I, if I could, I, w I would have already waved the magic wand. Uh, you know, I'm working on, you know, some other other products that are in the, you know, in the personal protection space. You know, because of this, obviously, um, unfortunately, uh, you know, these times end up causing people to, especially, you know, weird people like me that have these, you know, kind of uh, thought processes here for for making things better, uh, you know, to, to get innovative and work on new things that can help people in the, in the future. And, and as, as, you know, even tomorrow is, you know, depending on how, how fast you bring these out. But I mean, from our side, there's nothing really that we can do other than, than try and help, you know, and pray, which is, you know, we're, we're doing that every day anyway. Um, you know, so it, if there is somebody that wants to do it, we're happy to help. I mean, we're again, that's why we're offering certifications. Uh, also, you know, to try and take advantage of the time that, that they may have available right now. So that's the other thing that we've been doing is, is some of the practices have reached out and said, look, we're, you know, we're all home. Can we do a Zoom session to get all my staff certified? So, you know, we don't charge for that. 
So if you know if a, if a practice wants to get their their techs and even their docs certified on on this type of procedure, we schedule a Zoom session. It takes about an hour. We can walk them through you know this program, which by the way, Dr. Cabot, you know Dr. Cabot has been working with us on, uh, which is just finalized. Uh, you know we 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 spend an hour with them. We certify them on you know what we're coining as uh, PCES, which is periciliary eyelid scaling. Uh, we then provide the cert, you know, certification on the certificates to, to the techs. And then again, when, when this clears, because again, it, everything passes, uh, they'll, you know, they'll be a little bit better prepared to, uh, you know, to help their patients moving forward. All right. Well, very cool. Well, John, thanks for the information today. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're doing well. And, uh, and actually sounds like you're thriving at home, unlike some of us. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, you know, again, I'm, I, I know, Adam, you and I have talked before. I mean, I, I, I miss my daughters being young. I mean, I, I just love, love, you know, the kids. And, and now that they're older, I'm, I'm loving them, you know, at just as much, if not more, because now they're, you know, they can say, Dad, stop eating the frosting, finish it on the cupcakes, you know, all the, all the other stuff that we're doing here. So, again, I am, I am, I am thriving and just enjoying the, the family time, uh, you know, because these, as you know, and I'm sure we're all feeling these these times, if nothing more, just remind us of how, you know, um, how important you know family time is, and how important just you know just enjoying the people you you love and you and that are around you, you know, making them feel important because life is short, and unfortunately, it's too short. And and again, we're seeing some of that. So uh, I mean, that's you, you just that's my perspective anyway. Yep. All right. Well, it's John- a good perspective, and I'm really glad that you are seeing the positive in this and hanging out with your kids and making cupcakes and sitting in the hot tub. Well, um, there are far worse things to be doing. So, yeah. yeah. Well, the hot, the hot tub is hot tub is pretty much a, a hose with you know with a hot water tank, but <laughs> that's the hot tub. But it's, Who again, cares? we're we're, Who cares? <laughs> we're sitting in there eating. Hey, with cupcakes and a and a little baby pool of hot water, I'm good. I'm, I'm happy. Absolutely. It's all in your perspective. Yep, it's, uh, it is. You're absolutely right. All right. Well, John, thanks so much so for I being pre- here. I appreciate your time. And uh, we'll be in touch. You know, we're probably going to be doing this whole thing again next month. So uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch one more time. <laughs> oh, no. Happy, happy to help and happy to, happy to hear you. You guys are all doing well. And it's good to see you. Actually, good to see you on the, on the, on the feed. Yep. Yeah, you can see I'm still Looking alive. Good. My hair is just a little longer, but I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> No, you're looking great. Looking suave. Oh, thank you. Suave. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John. Have a great day. Yeah, have, a, have a great weekend. Good talking to you. Thanks, Gretchen. Have a good weekend. John, nice to talk to you. Bye. Thanks, thanks Steve. Bye bye. All righty. It's 1 15. Hey. He's great. Um, you feel for some of these vendors because they, I'm sure he gets the same loans, et cetera, that the practice has got, but. You know, everything's in a standstill as far as buying stuff. People aren't going to buy stuff because not even in the office at this point, unless they offer ridiculous deals and then they're taking, uh, they're making much less profit. Uh, all the vendors, but uh, the smaller ones are the ones that are affected. The Zeises, the um, Marcos, uh, the Lombards, they can handle the uh, delay probably, but the smaller ones, uh, uh, you worry about them. Well, in fact, let's talk about the vendors for a second just because, you know, sure. we wouldn't. Wouldn't be doing this this way without them. So let me uh, bring them up again. And all right, all right. Let me put this on up. What am I hearing? Am I hearing myself? Am I hearing Fortnite? What am I hearing? <laughs> I can't hearing something in the background. I'm quiet here. Maybe myself. <laughs> Maybe I'm just, the, it's the, the things rattling around inside my head. Um, all right. All righty. So anyway, thank you to our sponsors for sponsoring this thing today. Um, it's been kind of a crazy day for everybody. I know we haven't spent too much time on our sponsors just because um, we've been sort of dealing, putting out fires with the largest volume of people we've ever had at a conference far and away. Uh, unfortunately, the system has been resilient, but thank you to our sponsors for sponsoring us and, and keeping the conference going. Um, if you look at our matrix of sponsors now up on the screen, you'll notice that we have several new ones. Uh, we can run those down just to let you know who they are and what they're up to. 
Um, but shout out to Marco for sponsoring the live stream as they've done for the past, uh, what, six years now. Um, so go into Marco's booth, check them out. We had an interview with the folks from Marco earlier, and we're going to have another one tomorrow, I believe, uh, discussing more about what's going on with the company. Because as you know, Marco merged with a couple of other companies, Lombard and EMS. So um, three companies into one. And I'm sure people are kind of curious as to what they're, they're all up, up to these days. So we're going to check them out tomorrow. Optos, again, you know their wide field uh, imaging system, and they came on as a sponsor, so you want to check them out. They're one of the sponsors, actually, and this was great. They, When I was speaking with them, again, they're not all about product. They really want to educate people, especially during this time. Um, so if you go into their booth, you're going to see a lot of educational material. Um, and thank you for, to them for sponsoring the conference um, and helping us get all this education out. Conan Medical, uh, again, longtime sponsor of both this and, and ODR. Um, we just did a couple of webinars with Craig Thomas on OD Wire. You might want to check those out too. Uh, we did them for Conan. And they are running some very detailed specials. I don't know if you guys have looked and seen in your booth, their booth, you can probably see them, but um, they were not shy about doing the typical sorts of show specials. Um, and you can take a, a good look at what those are by going into their booth uh, right now. And again, they wanted me to let everybody know you know, that as a company, they're doing okay, they're weathering this well, um, and they're really just there to try to help. So um, check them out in their booth. Mackey Health Supplement Company, and Steve, I think you had some experience with them and their products. Great stuff, uh, works well. Um, people take to it and they keep on ordering, they feel that they see better. Um, by the way, um, this product, they, they do, um, projected for macular degeneration, prevention, uh, slowing down, but we're finding a lot of visual enhancement from people, uh, even baseball players say they see things better, especially in dark light. Um, and if you listen to John Nolan's lecture, he highlights all these things in a more scientific um, double-blind study well. So it really is a great product. I recommend it for all. Excellent. Yeah, I remember we were at a trade show once and you bought like a crate of this <laughs> Of their product. Yep. From, yeah, so I and, guess. And, and people come in and buy it. I mean, they, they come in and we charge them uh, essentially the same price they get online. They uh, There's almost no profit in it, but the profit is that the patients uh, know that you're doing a good job um, to uh, to help them. And uh, the, I mean, we do, if you look at all these things we can do for macular degeneration, except for somebody who has a wet generation and needs injections. Uh, this is the only uh, game in town, maybe blue, blue blocker lenses, blue tech lenses, and, and nutraceuticals. So we have all these great testing equipment, OCTs and uh, whatever else you might have, angiographies. But once you find the problem and it's beginning, this is the only intervention we can make. And it seems to be the product that's the most powerful because it has the uh, three pigments in it. Right. Yep, recommended. Uh, great. So Luno Technology, also another company came on. Actually, this logo that I have is out of date, and by tomorrow it will be fixed, as they reminded me. They've sort of cut down on the number of brands that they advertise. Um, so, you know, they are heavily pushing solutions right now to try to help you with social distancing in your office. And so this is something that I think that it's, it's been on everyone's mind. You know, how, how do you actually do it? And if you check out their product range, um, you know, and take a look at the auto refractors and so forth. Um, they're trying to show you ways to actually get it done in practice. So if you're taking this time, you know, to try to think about what you want your practice to look like when we come out the other side, Luno has a lot of stuff that can help. So visit their booth um, to see what they're all about and contact them, uh, and they can show you a lot of what they have. Uh, Hog, as you know, makers of the octopus and slit lamps and stuff like that. So they have been uh, with us from the uh, I guess they, they had a big booth uh, in February. It's open again here, so you can take a look at what they have to offer, including the specials that they have. Um, Neurovisual Medicine Institute. So this one's a little bit different. So this uh, is a company that gives you classes, right? It's education um, about PRISM and trying to work PRISM into people's prescriptions. And again, I don't understand the optics of it. Steve, probably you understand it yeah. better than I do. Um, I do, but it's hard to explain in 30 seconds, but uh, it's a product that does work. People do feel great with it, um, I'd say a high percentage, and uh, you've used it a little bit. You were tested with it, I believe, Adam, at some show. Uh, that was um, with, the, yeah, so, uh, yep, so, uh, yeah, people have, have been trying, but what, what they do, what these guys do is they teach you an entire way of doing it, right? It's an entire philosophy, so correct, you actually yes. take the classes and try to integrate it into your practice, so kind of an interesting approach to really make this uh, 
you know, to make you a specialist in this so the people in your area can, can you know, when they find you, if, if they're looking for you, you know, you'll be up on the NVM Institute's website. Um, so geographically, people can find, find you if you're close to them. And it does set you apart. You can do things that other docs don't do, that other ODs, frankly, don't, don't know the science about. And I recommend you taking their courses. Um, Dr. Rosen's great. Okay, and tear care, and so we all know the tear care device for uh, MGD. Um, the critical thing to know about this device versus older generation devices is, first of all, it's cheaper, which is incredibly important, right? We remember the, the very first generation devices, which I think were around $100,000, um, which was, you know, d d over a decade ago. Now, you know, this one is a fraction of that. Um, and it's also tiny. If you look at the industrial design of the device, you know, it's very portable and small um, and easy to use. So as with most things involving technology, right, as time goes on, things get cheaper and smaller and faster. And that's the case here as well. Um, so check out Tear Care. Um, you know, especially because people had put off getting devices to treat MGD in their offices just because of the expense. And this could be a good entree. If you want to put your foot in the door uh, and start treating it, this, this could be a good way to do it. Um, yep. Natural view, you know, we spoke about their lenses before. We were talking about it in the context of myopia control. I know they hate when I do that, right? Because this is all off-label, but we can we can talk about off-label stuff. Um, you know, they 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 make a specialty lens um, that's a multifocal that people are using, um, you know, for for myopia management. And Steve, I you've had some experience, I think, uh, with the lens. Sure. First of all, the whole line of one-day lenses is a, a very good product line, but the uh, multifocal is certainly um, amongst the best in terms of success rate that we have. And yes, we do use it off-label for myopia control, as every other product is uh, off-label, except for the MySight lens, which is really not on the market yet. Um, it has a nice profile where it gives uh, a lot of um, peripheral hyperopic um, defocusing, which will prevent the... Uh, hopefully the uh, sclera from getting increased in size and their product was designed to do that more so than a, a regular multifocal um, that uh, the big four manufacturers make so it's also a very comfortable lens kids take to it very easily and they like it a lot better than the orthokeratology uh, where they have to sleep with the lens at night take it off and uh, and sometimes it's not as comfortable as, as certainly a nice uh, comfortable soft multifocal lens so recommend it highly we use it all the time all right, and our friends at Zeiss. So Zeiss has been a big supporter of the conference and thank, thank you to them uh, for being part of this. We spoke with Austin before about what Zeiss is doing, particularly how they're, they're giving away uh, shields for your um, uh, slit lamps. So um, we're gonna actually, I'm gonna pull up the URL later and tomorrow I'll have it up on the screen as well so people can see it again. Um, so this is obviously becoming a thing. They said they've, they've given away, I think they said 20,000 of these things already. Um, of yep, they were one of the first also. They really plunged in right at the very beginning, like I think the end of February, beginning of March, something like that. Yep. And in terms of specials, wow, they're having... What's that, Gretchen? I said that's crazy, 20,000 of them. I mean, that's that's crazy in a good way that there are so many and, you know, how great is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. But Gretchen, like our office is a small office and we have four exam rooms, so you need four um, you know, for all the docs. So it's not... Um, it's per OD, if you think about it, then there's 40,000 in the country, and some of them use multi-rooms with one doctor, so, and then you have clinics, et cetera, so, and besides the, the protection against the virus, it's great for bad breath. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you have on, on both sides. Offer that marketing tip to, to Zeiss. I bet you they'd appreciate it. <laughs> sure. But, you know, you have to think going forward that this will be the standard, and in fact, I could envision slit lamps being sold with these things right, right out of the box from now on. Sure. Or they might even be reconfigured somehow. Yep. But the installation is nothing. It's really easy. Yep. But yeah, he didn't. I don't think Austin mentioned it, but you can actually use this on just about any slit lamp. It's not just for for Zeiss stuff. So it's across the board. And you can check out their booth, by the way, just uh, if you want to see their show specials. Austin was telling me. I don't think we got into it too much. That it was very sort of similar to the, the ones that they would have had at Expo East, had Expo East been a thing. So you can check that out if you're looking for equipment. And AB Max, of course, we don't need to dwell too much on this since we just spoke with John all about it and what they're doing. And apparently the mad scientist is in his lab coming up with new inventions <laughs> as we speak. <laughs> so I love that. So cu curious to see what he comes up with. He's a really great guy. I mean, he's uh, definitely passionate about this. He was the inventor of the original device, right? He had his name on the patents. So um, he's constantly tinkering. So it's always fun to see what, what he's going to come up with.
and neural lens, so more prism. And so these, this is a little bit different. So this isn't like a class that you go to or anything. This is a device uh, that measures, you know, your need for this this uh, progressive prism. I guess it's it's called. Uh, so Steve, I don't know how this works either, right? You have this this uh, prism that's yeah. built into these lenses. Um, yeah, we were all tested with this. Um, I think at uh, Vision Expo West at, at one year, it was yep. it was amazing. And uh, unfortunately, I tested, and my particular problem did not uh, was not going to be solved with it. They were very honest. They said, "No, it doesn't work with you." But when it works, it works great. Um, and what it does is assume as you look down, you'll develop a certain amount of esophoria, and they'll develop a, a certain pattern of the lens to accommodate your particular needs exactly. And it's a small amount, but uh, the people rave about it. They, they seem to be very happy with it. Yep. Um, I couldn't be helped, so I, um, I can't comment personally. But you, you would test it, I think, right? I mean, test takes about two or three minutes. It's seamless. It's easy. Um, and they do provide the lenses for you after you have the test, and they design it exactly per what the uh, uh, test shows. You know, what's interesting to me about their product is that it's a confluence of a few technologies, right? Because, you know, Prism is something you, you learned about, right? Uh, in school, right. it's it's been around forever, but this is different, right? It's, it uses first of all machine learning in the device to actually try to figure out what your prescription should be with this prism. Secondly, it uses some very high tech manufacturing to to get the special kind of prism that they put into the lens. So it required a few different things to come together to actually um, become a, a product. So it's kind of an interesting yep. thing seeing how technology moves along and makes things that were previously not possible possible. And you can't find any other product than any of the on the market that will have the prism in the near portion of the lens and not in the distant portion and the gradation per your your problem or your, your findings. So um, rather unique and it's not um, hokey. It works really well. Yep. And Oculus, of course, big sponsor of the conference right from the beginning. So you know their instruments. You love them. I, I referred to them before as a Swiss Army knife. Um, because many, <laughs> many of their instruments have multiple functions. I mean, gosh, one of them is called the Penta Cam, right? So it can do many, many things. Um, and uh, we had on Barry Iden earlier talking about all the different ways in which, is, in which he uses these devices. So um, whether you're in, into specialty lenses or dry eye, you know, they have devices that you can use in a, in a wide variety of ways. And I mentioned the Charlie McBride, actually, you know, we were playing Mad Scientist one day. And he tried to make me up a set of scleral multifocals just for giggles. I mean, my, my corneas are fairly normal. Um, but we thought, hey, you know, could I get superpowers by, <laughs> by using a scleral lens? Um, and in the old days, you know, you'd, you'd do it manually, I guess. You'd make up these scleral lenses. But now you just use the Pentacam, and it provides you with a starting point. And the data it spits out goes right into the software to help you build a scleral lens. So it's, it's very different from the old days. Uh, Science-based health makers of Hydro Eye. So this is a supplement for dry eye. Um, you'll definitely want to check them out. Cool thing about those guys is that it's right in their name, Science-Based Health. So last time we interviewed Zach, uh, Zach Denning, and who knows an awful lot about supplements. Uh, you know, he knows more than I, I have ever forgotten, probably. Um, in, in, you know, in med school, we talked about it for a while, but, but Zach knows everything. And... Um, they use science when they are creating the formulation for their supplements. So as the science gets better, they're refining what they do, which is, I suppose, what everybody should be doing, but many people don't. Um, so you might want to check them out and go to their booth. They have a ton of literature as well. If you're interested in learning more, you know, not just to, to buy the supplements or whatever, but, but actually literature about the studies behind a lot of the supplements and, and how they were made. So definitely go check them out. Uh, Covalent Career, so this is the biggest uh, job site in eye care. So if you're looking to get a new job or you're looking to hire in your practice an optometrist or optician, this is the place to go. Uh, one key thing, they'll offer you 10% off uh, a listing if you want to put one up. Uh, go to their booth to get details on how to actually make that happen. Uh, eye Care Live, so this company, of course, has exploded over the last two months. They are a telemedicine company, so if you want to keep in touch with your patients and maybe examine them remotely, People have been doing it in an ad hoc way, you know, using Skype and so forth. This is a much more structured way um, to actually interact with your existing patient online uh, to take care of them remotely. So, you know, it's not a dirty word, telemedicine. This is something that you can use to enhance your, your own patient base. Um, this isn't something where you're out, you know, 
uh, trying to cut corners. This is actually enhancing patient care. So iCare Pro, if you have a website, and most everyone does, and you have a social media presence, which most everyone should, you probably want to engage a company like iCare Pro to actually take care of that for you instead of trying to do it on your own. Um, obviously, it's a challenge and it gets harder every day, actually. Um, you know, social media gets more and more sophisticated, but unfortunately, we don't have infinite amount of time to handle it ourselves, so these guys can do it for you, and I care is what they do, so they know what works and what doesn't in I care. so give them a shout. Lac Rivera, so they make punctal plugs, and they possibly had the longest list of discounts I've ever seen in a CE wire booth. Um, it was a menu, so definitely go into their booth and check it out. It's this gigantic PDF of all the savings that they're offering, which I really appreciated. You know, every time we do this, I nag the vendors, hey, can you give me like a PDF or something? And you know, just show me what these discounts are going to be. So they, they went for it and did it the proper way and gave me the whole, the whole shooting match. And finally, Optometry Times. And, and I will not actually say anything about Optometry Times. I will allow the great Gretchen Bailey to. Uh, well, thank you, Adam. Thanks for the opportunity to share a bit about Optometry Times and also the opportunity to join you here. Uh, I love doing this. It's a lot of fun. So for anybody who isn't aware, Optometry Times is one of the journals available for optometrists and associated eye care professionals to read. We are written by practitioners for practitioners. So it's really peer-to-peer -peer information that you're getting. We have very little staff or freelancer written content. It's all written by your colleagues. And we are designed to be easily consumed and easily digested. So when you pick up a copy of our journal or read something on the website in between patients, you can read something in between patients and hopefully apply that advice in that article to the next patient in your chair, if appropriate. Also, too, we will meet you wherever you are, however you like to consume content. You want video? We got it. You like podcasts? We got that, too. You'd rather read on the web? No sweat. Or would you prefer us to just send you stuff and you read it when it comes in in, the, in your email? Yep, we got email newsletters a few times a week, and we also have our print journal once a month. I also like hearing from new authors. So if you're interested in writing for us, my job is to help you. Drop me a line. We'll figure it out. And thanks for reading. All right. Way to go, Gretchen. Thank you. And I, and I could attest she does help. In fact, she wrote mine, and I just signed it. <laughs> oh, now come on, Steve. That is not what happened. It was no, your work. But... Our job yes, is just to make it sound good, clean it up, have yep. good grammar, and organize a little. That That's it. It's your work. I couldn't have written that. That's and all the you photoshopping did. helped a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, finally, Vision Equipment Incorporated. So this is Leo Hadley's company, and Leo will be with us momentarily. Um, he's actually our last guest of the day, I think, so hopefully he'll be No, here. no, he's not. We've got Mike Brown on. Well, Mike never got back to me, so I'm not sure. No, he did. Oh, he did? He did. He Next night, yeah. Oh, when did that happen? <laughs> it was yesterday. Sam and I added him on. So we're going to talk to Leo in about 25 minutes, and then we're going to talk to Mike in about 55 minutes. Oh, excellent. That's, that's awesome. I didn't realize. I guess I've been overwhelmed with mail. Um, every time somebody registers for the conference, people don't know this, but every time somebody registers, I get an email. So my email box is just overflowing with junk. It's just, it's, it's an unbelievable mess. If you had, if you were like type A or OCD or whatever, and you looked in my mailbox, you'd fall over dead um, because there's just so much <laughs> stuff there that's unread. So I'm, I'm glad though that he's, uh, he's gonna make it today. That's really cool. But anyway, Leo's gonna be here too. And Leo has a lot of bank owned equipment <laughs> and I wanna hear all about it. So if you're unfamiliar with what Leo does, he refurbishes equipment and resells it. Um, and he's been doing it for a very long time. And the equipment he does, um, it looks like new. And what I always got a kick out of with Leo, I should have uh, had some pictures actually, is sometimes he'll get very old equipment that, that you know intellectually is old because it has like a CRT built into it instead of an LCD. Um, <laughs> but it looks brand new. I mean, it looks like, it com like, like you were making a movie about an optometrist from 1984. Like, and this is what they use to like build the movie set because it looks like a new piece of equipment, but you just intellectually know that it's old. So he's got some amazing stuff. And the reason he does it, you know, he has it for all different price points um, for, for every office. So, uh, you know, he's been a guy that we've worked with for a long time and no one's ever said a bad thing about his equipment because he, he goes over with a fine tooth comb. 
before it goes out the door. So anyway, I'm really curious to hear about what he's seeing because, you know, Leo is actually seeing, unfortunately, sort of, he, he's on, on the battlefront, right, of what's happening to practices. He's seeing the ones that have gone down and that's where he's getting some of this equipment from. So I'm really curious to see what, what he sees. And those are our sponsors. Now you have Mike at 5.30. I hope that's Eastern time because- Yes, it is. Yeah, that's Eastern. Okay. Yep. Yeah. It is not Pacific. <laughs> oh, heck no. I'm going to be, you know, two glasses into it by then. Um, Only two? <laughs> I got to work tomorrow. I don't want to make myself sick. Um, you know, and actually tonight what I'm going to be doing as well is remaking the video. Kat actually just gave me a script. She's like, by the way, if you're making that video, here's everything that people need to know for tomorrow. <laughs> so, oh, good for her. That's I'm gonna, awesome. That was very proactive. So I'm going to, um, you know, do a little movie, a few slides so that everyone will have it. I'll e-blast it out tonight and it'll show up in, in the control panel tomorrow when people log into the conference. So they'll all have it and have no excuse for, you know, messing up. Uh, getting their credits. No drinking for me tonight. Have you been watching the NFL draft, uh, Brett Gretchen? <laughs> nope. Um, I plan to see my mom and dad tomorrow for a oh. porch visit. It's my dad's birthday, and I expect to hear all about it, or maybe my brother has. So, you know, yeah. I, I got annoyed after um, we got rid of our awesome quarterback from the Eagles, but, you know, so I'll just wait and see how it shakes out. Anyway, so you you drafted another quarterback. That's what's really cool. Good one, uh, J Jalen Hurts. He was actually uh, the quarterback before Tua Tagovailoa, whatever his name is, and you mm -hmm. drafted him. Um, so uh, it could be interesting with Carson Wentz. Well, we'll see because Wentz is uh, obviously prone to injury. I mean, we do live That's in Wentzvania, and he mm -hmm. had a great first season, um, and he took us where we needed to be. But it was Foles who took us the rest of the way, and I was really sad to see him go. So Wentz cool. does need some good support because who knows what's going to happen in the first couple games of the season. He might be kissing that's, the dark. That's exactly why they drafted him for insurance. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. So it's a big controversy. That's what you'll, you'll find out in, uh, whenever you go over. Excellent. Well, thank I, you for the heads up. I can sound like I'm paying attention when I am not. Yeah, there you go. Jalen Hurts, he actually was the, the quarterback at Alabama, which is a major, major school. And yes, I do know that. Job. Hold on. Ernie will thank me. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Ernie Bowling is a big Crimson Tide fan, what, so what? I've learned all about it. And what when I worked very closely with Joe Barr, I was an OSU fan, even though, you know, we had Penn State right here in Pennsylvania. So, you know, I know which side of, of uh, bread uh, is, it's buttered, so I'm no fool. <laughs> it literally was the only thing on TV that was sports related. That was new. Uh, I've been watching the 1947 World Series, <laughs> things like that. Uh, so finally, we had something that was new, but uh, they, they just drafted these people and they'll probably play in 2021. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Thank by, you for that uh, update. By the way, sure. get, getting back to eye care stuff, I'm putting it up on the screen yes, right now. Hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, COPE's rule changes, right? Because people have been emailing me all night, you know, what are the rule changes? So I keep directing them to this thread. This is the actual letter of COPE's rule changes about live C versus internet. And, you know, Steve, when we find out more about the changes and how much longer they're gonna go for, we'll put up the letter again um, uh -huh. tonight in this thread as well so people can see it. Um, people, you know, they, they always ask me, like, you know, how, how do we come up with the software? Like, how do we program the software? And the answer always is we program the software in response to what COPE wants, right? That's what we do. This is our, our guideline, is we, we stick as close as we can to the rule of COPE, whether it's a certain amount of time that someone has to be in a room um, to, to a, you know, what kind of test they need. We always follow their advice. And I think that's why this particular conference has, has been a little bit chaotic for us today, right? Because COPE changed the rules on us, saying no tests um, and everything counts as live. So um, yeah. So I just, I, I hope everyone, you know, sort of understands and appreciates that CUIRE was still going on, right? It was in the on-demand phase where it would have sat for months. And all of a sudden we, we had to jump back in um, and get all our lectures reapproved and get new numbers for them and then make this change to the software. And I think that's why we had that little bit of a problem today. Also the huge volume of people, I think it didn't help. Yep. So. 
<laughs> but people just don't read, and uh, we keep on putting things up. I just sent you an email where people are going into the room and say, checking in, checking in, checking in, <laughs> and I think that's good enough. Uh, I mean, they just put uh, two words in the chat box, and yeah. then I probably mess for it's, that's after putting two or three um, announcements up, having an announcement on top, and what I'm doing is one by one um, uh, private messaging them, and uh, hopefully they'll get their. But there's no problem if they don't get their credits; they can always go to the help box and find their course and take it later on. So uh, nothing's lost. Yeah, I mean that's the great thing is that they can always go back at any time to that box, and I'll I'll you know mention that in the video tonight as well. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and we don't know, it's hard for me to actually tell here just because we're on, t you know, doing this all day, how many people really have had problems. I mean, we know because I, I follow the support emails, but, you know, we have close to 4,000 people at the conference, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, this is a small subset of people. It feels big to us, right, because we try to handle the problems immediately when they come up. Um, right. But we're, we're just not sure how many people it really is, so... It's a couple of score. Maybe there's 40 problems out of, like you said, uh, uh, a few, 40 out of uh, a few thousand. So there's less morbidity than the uh, coronavirus. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, that's one way to do it. Yep. Uh, so anyway, I'll, I'll make up that uh, movie tonight. Um, the other thing that I wanted to, you know, I might actually po post something else on Odie Wire. So, you know, we can do a little... Uh, you know, usually I like to complain about stuff and what grinds my gears on the site and the way people behave, but we we had something last night that happened that I, I want to show people because I want people to try to emulate this. I don't know if you all saw this last night, um, where Charlie McBride had a patient who was on the road and needed advice, right? Um, this is an emergency case. Um, you know, he thought he had a retinal tear, and he was asking for advice, right? And, you know, fortunately, I was reading and I saw, and I know people in Carlsbad, my in-laws live there, so it's like, okay, I can figure this out, and I, and I knew a doc there. And they were able to quickly get this person over to Charlie. They made a connection. The patient was seen that night at 10.30 p.m., and they were into surgery the next morning at around 7 a.m., um, and they did have a huge tear. So, wow. you know, all's well yeah. that ends well. This person was turned away from the ER, actually. They, they went to the, the ER in San Diego, and they actually turned them away and said, oh, well, maybe the next day when the retinal specialist comes in, then you can go see them. Um, so, you know, Charlie immediately leapt into action to try to help them. Um, but this is the kind of thing that I, I wish people would do more on the site. Um, there's a, a button here, maybe I should make it a little more prominent, right, where it says find member. And this is only for people who are members of the site. You can find anybody in the site's database, um, any doctor, and just quickly look them up if you don't know you know, someone in the area. And then, you know, you can quickly, so run, running down the list, and then you can send them a private message which will trigger an email that will go to that person, right? So it's not like they have to be logged into ODWire. When you do that and you send a private message, an email gets sent to them as well. So That's great, yeah. I'm, I'm hoping people, you know, take advantage of this at least a little more. Um, you know, when they're trying to find ODs in other areas. I mean, obviously, it's nice when you know someone, um, but, you know, it's, it's also interesting being able to just sort of pull them up this way. How'd you get the, um, uh, what do you call it, the, the words to appear? We never had that before. The closed caption. Closed caption where? There's closed captioning? <laughs> I'm getting closed caption on your um, feed for a long, long time now. Oh, really? Yes. Huh. Not you can find anybody in sites database, any doctor, just quickly look at them. If you don't know, you you know someone in the area, and then... Oh, that's cool. For, yeah, so whatever <laughs> you did, keep on doing it um, for the hearing impaired. I, I, um, did, I didn't do anything. You should wow. know that. <laughs> Actually, there's a, there's a closed caption button on YouTube for the feed, so it's... It's right down there. It's uh, oh, on the yes, right yes. side, and it says CC in a box. Oh, the one on the left. Is. That's what it is. Well, what's fascinating is they must be doing it by default now because I didn't ask for it. I'm wondering if if Steve hit the button on his own browser. I probably did, and I might have had it from before because I was uh, yesterday watching a YouTube while watching TV at the same time. So. Uh, uh, that probably was it. And but it, it's interesting, though, that they're using AI to actually do the captioning in near real time. I didn't know they were doing that. 
<laughs> a little scary. And, and the spelling is perfect. It's amazing. Well, that's because I'm doing it, Steve. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, right? My, no, I'm on my laptop. Okay. <laughs> I can multitask, my good sir. You don't want to know what else I do when I'm sitting here talking to you. <laughs> Let me I try something. Things, I can play solitaire. I can handle texts. Let me just try something. Pusillanimous. It takes about 20 seconds for it to come in. <laughs> Let's see if it spells it right. You know what that means, by oh, the way? You should, get, um, you should get Reed on here. He'll spell it for you. Oh, there you go. Yep. Alexa's better. She's great. You ever ask Alexa to spell you something? No, because I usually know how to spell it myself. <laughs> Again, you don't want to play Gretchen and Boggle, trust me. <laughs> no, no, no. It's more. Okay, I'm waiting for pusillanimous to come up. Let's see. You know what that means? It means cowardly. It was in The Wizard of Oz. You pusillanimous beast, something like that. So he was talking about. Well, actually, I didn't name. know what that meant. So I learned something new today, Steve. Thank you. I appreciate that. There's, there's, you'll get a word of the day from now on for all our seminars. <laughs> I like it. I like word of the day. Also good for building your SAT vocabulary for those students who are ready for that. That's how I did it. I got I got all these words. I used to do my daughters when they were 10, 11, 12 years old in the back seat of the car, and I give them the word of the day. And one or two actually appeared on the SATs. Um, so they they actually thanked me. One was uh, lift, and one was um, what was the other one? Oh, easy one, ambivalent. Oh, that's but, an easy uh, one, at least for me. Yeah. But. You know, we are just but, full service here at CE Wire. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, it got Look the right. Even, Alexa got wrong, though. It said Alexis. Mm. I, I have to be careful. It's in the room here. She's listening to me, and she's going to turn on. <laughs> Uh-oh, that's not good. Hey, Steve, how does it look like over in the courses? Um, do we have a lot of people interacting? Do we have... Oh, much more. Um, by far and away, there's just more people. Um, Usually people were shy, and in the previous, well, five, six years, you know, four or five people would talk, be the same person, et cetera. Now it's uh, voluminous, and they all, they all want handouts, and the doctor's giving them, um, you know, either the handouts directly or they're giving, uh, directing them to uh, email to them, and uh, they'll send it to them. So much more, and I, I think it's, uh, it's actually more challenging for them. They actually ask, they ask questions rather than just stand there. Uh, but um, every single one, every single lecture, many more, but... Like I'm clicking on a lecture on now, um, what's it on, Neuro Ophthalmology, Brian Hull, who's excellent. He's got 713 people in the room, and there's three other rooms going on. Wow. Well, we are coming up to 5 o'clock, and so we've got Art Epstein. He's going to kick off two hours on Expert Dry Eye, a system for success. Mm -hmm. And then in another room, we've got James Stringham talking about beyond refraction, effects of macular carotenoids on visual performance. And then in the third room, we've got Murray Fingeret and Mike Shiglazian talking about diagnosing glaucoma, how new technology improves our diagnostic acumen. And then the fourth course is by Tim Breeze. I think yep. that's how you say his name. And Larry Wan talking about technology is expensive unless it differentiates your practice through patient outcomes. So they all sound like great courses to jump into. And remember, uh, arts is two hours. So make sure if you're ready to jump into that one, um, you're prepared to be there for two hours. It is not a one hour class. Yep. Yep. I heard it last time and I tell you at the end, it was not a dry eye in the house. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, jeez. I, yep. I need to get a rim shot sound oh, effect. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, but just put me on a seven second delay. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm going through all the lectures now. And let's go through, uh, let's see about uh, angiography. Uh, just to show you what the, the attendance is, it's just ridiculous. They have 553. Now we have 1,200 in those two lectures, and I have two more to go. Wow. Uh, That's great. I won't tell you who got the least. But, no, uh, do not do that. Well, if you want me to run down the next hour quickly, uh, so at 6 o'clock, that's hour two for Arts Dry Eye course, we have Anthony St. Ledger talking about ocular probiotics 
I think there's a little play on words there, manipulating the ocular microbiome to prevent disease. And we've got- Steve, Steve a little, little about Anthony saying he's a PhD, so it's different. Yes, Who is his, his lecture is actually, he's a PhD out of University of Pittsburgh um, in the Department of Ophthalmology, and his research is about how by giving too many antibiotics in the eye, the stuff we normally do to treat, we're killing the microflora that lives there that we don't even know about and actually making the eye and the condition worse uh, and, and the eye future uh, problems occur because we're destroying the um, bi microbiology, just like we do when we take antibiotics and we get diarrhea, the same thing is happening in the uh, the eye. And uh, his research is great. His um, grad student is doing a lecture, Ben Treat, he's doing one tomorrow on the coronavirus. He's an expert in it, and uh, he's done a lot of research, and uh, he'll give us some insight. That's, that's, that's actually today. It's coming yes, up today. It's today. Yeah. It's, oh, good. Yeah. It's competing. Yep. Well, they're, they're colleagues. One's the grad student and the other, so he's not competing. He's, he's, he's his boss. <laughs> well, yes, I see it today. Yeah. It's really, really up-to-date stuff. Yep. But we, we aim to please. We got him on at the very last minute, and he got everything together. So, yeah, I mean, this that lecture was actually put together literally, like almost literally the last minute. So <laughs> it is about as fresh as you're going to get. I bet it's well attended. Uh, uh, it's coming on. Let's see, what, what time is that? That uh, five o'clock. Yeah. yeah. So it's but, either it's either going to be well attended or no one's going to attend it because they don't want to think about it. One mm -hmm. or the other. And actually, even though it was uh, up to date, probably would put together a week or two ago, it might be out of date. He, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure when he actually uh, f finally put the the thing together because I know he waited a really long time to record it because he wanted to make sure that the data was as, as accurate and, and up to date as possible. So, he, you know, we sw always sweat a little bit yeah. when, when we get these things in at the last minute, but um, in this case, I think it was important. I saw his outline so he, and there, there was nothing about injecting Clorox or... Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't think he something has all the right data. Violet or Clorox. Yeah. <laughs> so, he, he missed some of the newer stuff. <laughs> Oh. I will honor your request, Gretchen. I'll do it right now. Oh, thank you. Well, we are going to have Leo Hadley on soon, I think. Is that right, Adam? Yeah, I thought he... He's, um, yeah, he's supposed to show up. Was he a question mark? Yeah, he's supposed to show... I think he's going to show up in five minutes. He sounded like he was incredibly like busy and, and all over the place. Because I'll be honest with you, I couldn't get it together with Leo to get his booth like up to spec until like literally today. Um, because he's he's been busy. I mean, when you hear, let me actually pull up his booth so you guys can see it, um, and then you know we can get a little head start before he gets here. So, you know, because for him it's sort of labor intensive, right? Trying to list everything that he's got, or or and and his equipment comes and goes. So, but I thought that, I thought this was interesting, and this is what I wanted to talk to him about: these these bank owned assets. Um, Which a very is a very nice way of phrasing that. Yeah. And again, he didn't uh, seem uh, he didn't seem super happy to have these things. Um, certainly not in the way that he he obtained them. But at the same time, you can see that the devices there are not low end and they're not cheap by any any stretch. Um, so I'm certain that you know there's going to be some value there for someone. Unfortunately, there's going to be a small percentage that just won't open their doors depending on their circumstances. And uh, it's not just an optometry. I, I saw something on TV that 20% of medical practices might just close the doors and go under. Yeah. Um, That's so, unfortunate. Yeah. It, well, it depends on what's coming. If you're an internist and people don't want to come to your office because they have, let's say, high blood pressure, diabetes, I don't want to go for my three-month check and your, your volume goes down, you know, 40, 50%. What, what are you going to do? especially in, in areas like where we live in Philly and New York and New Jersey, which is so expensive. Yep. So, we'll, we'll see. Okay. We just took a punter, the Jets, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Steve, you amaze me with your ability to multitask. You're on top of answering questions for people, you're popping in and out of the lectures, you're talking with us, and you're also keeping an eye on the draft. So you really are juggling a lot right now. I'm quite well, 
It's my aluminum hat that I'm wearing now, my tinfoil hat that uh, <laughs> keeps me going. <laughs> All the energy gets full. Yeah, yes, I do multitask very well. Um, I have to. Um, now, Leo um, has been getting a lot of things from practices even now because it's, it's so early in the game. It's only been closed for six weeks. But uh, like you said, it could be a lot. A, lo a lot of practices might have four doctors where one is an associate. The associate gets dismissed. They have two or three field testers or something like that. They don't need one. I could see Leo doing very well. Yeah, but I mean, if you look at those lists right now, I mean, a 2019 Topcon Maestro. So this is a very expensive piece of oh, equipment yes. and someone just yes. bought it. So it's kind of amazing. Uh, you know, I think he's actually getting his hands on things, you know, that that are literally coming up in the last month. I'm curious if that person leased it. You're not allowed to sell that, but if he had to, he had to. If he bought it, there's no problem, and, and he still has to pay the bank loan. But if you lease it, theoretically, the lease company still owns it, and you have to buy it for a dollar or whatever your deal is at the end. But uh, Leo doesn't care. He he gets the unless he assumed the lease or something like that. But that, that's a that's a great piece of equipment, and it's, uh, we we actually checked it out and wound up buying a Zeiss um, instead. But uh, it's it's really high end. Yeah. And then there's other things here, like the Optus units. Like I wonder, and, and we we can ask him about that. You know, I know that people always worry about service on those units. Um, they're rather yep. rather complicated devices, so I'm kind of wondering how that works with Leo, and he'll tell us all about it, I guess. Yep, the service contract. Is, well, I won't say why. Let Optus tell you, but uh, you're afraid not to do it because the part, there's one major part. If the laser goes. Um, it's it's super expensive, so you, you're you're better off um, taking the insurance out and, and cutting your losses. Yep, and then you see there's an OptiView iView there, which is their lower end unit, and that is probably going to be a very good value for some practice who might want to dip their toe in the water yep. without spending a fortune. So that'd be great for a new practitioner trying to get into the field and and not wanting to spend fifty sixty thousand dollars on OCT. You can get that cheaper, and and you know what? It, it's still a great machine. It's uh, there's good, better, best. It's not like it's a, a piece of garbage that doesn't tell, show you things. It's, right. uh, we had that about seven years ago, and it really, I mean, new things are better, but uh, you're not going to miss much with that. Let's put it that way. Yep. Boy, I remember when we first opened up in 1958, trip down memory lane. Oh, boy. We had a beauty parlor chair from a <laughs> beauty parlor that swung. We only had a trial set from, from school. And we had a, a trial set of contact lenses, and that was it. <laughs> and we, and a keratometer and a slip lamp. So that that was our full uh, complement of equipment. And patients I, would kept saying it's the best exam I ever had. Yep. How often did you ever hear that? <laughs> <laughs> I had this old yeah. professor uh, Jesse Rosenthal. Do you know him? You yeah. know the name? Oh yeah. From, um, he real real funny guy, nice guy, and he had a very few pieces of equipment. So when people would come in, he'd have them look in the lensometer, and he'd tell them to rotate the wheel till the mires were clear, and they would do it. And it went to zero, and he said, "Wow, that's great! With those glasses, are working fine." <laughs> <laughs> and it seemed high tech. They were looking, you know, what I'm saying they're looking at the mires in the lensometer, rotating it to zero. They're wearing their glasses, so assuming they're looking through no at nothing. There's no lens in there. So we, <laughs> If it's calibrated, it should, should be zero. So, so he had to figure out some test to do, and, and that was it. So he was a real nice guy. Oh, if you did ever see the pants. The practice we, we bought in Manhattan had a guy that had no help. He worked completely on his own, and he let it, it, patients instruct one another on an application or removal of contact lenses. So he, he had the patients do it for him uh, while he was working. Uh, but he died. Of, he died of a stroke, so it didn't help him. Not, not having to work too hard. So there you go. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah. Well, you still have the and you you have in your in your your studio. Uh, you still have that plaque. Oh yeah, let me go grab. That, I'll that go grab the plaque. plaque that, yeah, let me go find it. You, you have that plaque. That that plaque is uh, the plaque of the first. Office we opened in Manhattan on 48th Street in, a, in an I apartment really, building before we put like both the practice. Whenever I'm there for CE Wire, I, I just love that little bit of history that's there. And I think that's completely awesome. Let me go grab it. I'll show everybody. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we, 
that, that, that plaque was illegal. <laughs> uh, because we, well, I think it says, uh, OD, it doesn't say doctor on it, it says OD, right? Yep, yeah, let me show it to everybody yeah. here. Yeah, the OD was, uh, we weren't ODs. When we, we graduated, uh, the, the, we, we got a master's degree. And uh, so we didn't have a doctorate until we went back to uh, PCO and, uh, in, uh, years later to get the OD degree. Anyone that graduated from Columbia University had a master's degree. So, but we didn't want to, you couldn't put a master's degree and sound like a doctor. So uh, that's, uh, so we were practicing kind of illegally in those years, but <laughs> who knew? Luckily for us, luck, luckily for us, our lawyer was Ted Castillo's uncle, Fred Knack. And he happened to be the attorney general for, for professional conduct for New York State. Oh, boy. So... <laughs> So we were able to skirt a little bit without any problems. Hmm. We hey, had Paul, a friend at court. Good thing your name was shorter than uh, Ted's because you got your full name on there. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, the yep. benefits of a shorter name. Yep. 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 Poor Fred. Fred was Fred was a, a inveterate New Yorker. He never drove a car. He always lived in Manhattan. He was a bachelor for many years until he married uh, one of our patients. Oh, that's he, interesting. Uh, well, yeah, we all, we had intermarriage. Everyone married one of the patients. Uh, <laughs> Ted Castle married a, a patient that he saw in the clinic at Columbia. My wife was a patient. Barry's wow. wife was a patient. Uh, Jordan's wife was a patient. Only Sue Resnick didn't marry a patient. She, she was out on her own. Do you guys rule marry patients. patients before you start dating them? Oh, well, you know, we, uh, the rule was uh, the yes, students, when I used to teach uh, for my short tenure as a professor, that was a question I was always asked. Do you, did you ever date a patient? And I said, yeah, the way you know if the patient is interested, they always make the last appointment of the day to <laughs> show that they have interest. But for sure, don't take them out until they paid their bill. But didn't, See, that, didn't that you was, have to dismiss the patient in order to, to date them? Because that's ethically, you can't see somebody who you're treating, right? Well, yeah, we didn't. Uh, <laughs> that's true. Ethics. <laughs> Ethics. He, he, he only had a master's <laughs> I mean, I, here, I, here I am with the illegal plaque and he's telling you all this stuff. And, yeah, yeah I mean, my God. Uh, no ethics. I mean, yeah, you know, so you, bought, you bought that dead guy's really, practice and then lied to the patients, right? I mean, the ethics were not... I mean, I don't think ethics were invented back then, were they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so some people had some, but I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, when you came from the Bronx, you got to do what you got to do. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, I guess that answer is no, that none of you <laughs> the patient we, before you started uh, getting it, Are you kidding? If, if I wouldn't have used that aesthetic in, on the cornea before applying a hard contact lens, where, where would we be today? No. <laughs> There was no way you could put con hard contact lenses without anesthetic, and it was illegal to use it in those years. So how? I noticed you're dodging the question. <laughs> What's that? Ask the question again. I don't dodge. My question <laughs> was: Did all of you who married patients dismiss those uh, patients before you started dating them? No, uh, no, 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 not at all. Uh, <laughs> but once, uh, no, 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 they still had confidence in us. So once you got too serious about them, they knew you were human beings. And then it was time to switch. Oh, no. My wife never takes my advice oh, geez. about oh, things. Bad, 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 bad. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's, uh, that's the way it is. <clears throat> now, Steve, you didn't marry a patient, I assume. Me? She became yeah. a patient after I married her, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I gave her a great, like 50% off. It was great. You guys now, I met her, are hopeless. I, I did it perfectly. I met my wife's second semester senior year in college, and that was great. Sold my wild oats, and we got married in optometry school and lived on um, onions and butter, I think. So, <laughs> <making> <laughs> negative money.
Wow, you met her second year of college and then second got Second year of senior year. Second year. So it was 21. Two. Oh, senior year. I thought you meant second yeah. year, not second semester. Okay. No. Second got year. It, got so it. We were graduating like in three or four months. So it was perfect, perfect. Uh, she put me through school as, on a teacher's salary of $12,000 a year in those days in New Jersey. Now they get oh, 12, boy. Now they God get like her. five or six times that. Yeah, but so was happy. school was cheap. Not no more. Boy, was, yeah, okay. I was able to pay for tuition every year just working in the Catskills. Just being yep. a waiter in the Catskills uh, more than paid the tuition at Columbia yep. for optometry school every year. Rem remarkable. I, I did that also, Paul, for one year, and it sucked. Uh, you got paid a lot also. You got great tips. Uh, my uncle was the HD, I told you, at Brown's. Yeah, well, it was a good hotel, but uh, it was and this, uh, this uh, was more than a five and three house. That that yeah. you got some serious tips there. Yes, you did, but you worked um, like a dog six, seven days a week. Yes, yeah, seven, um, seven days a week. But and interestingly enough, no one got sick. You were able to work the season, a whole ten weeks, seven days a week, three meals a day, and you never and, and you slept like an animal. I mean, uh, we, we we slept in in cabins that were made out of paper. And, right. and you could you could hear next door they had the dishwashers. The dishwashers in the Catskills, one day they were lying on the street near the Bowery, and the next day they were seeing trees. They used to bring them up to wash dishes. And uh, you, you would always hear the conversations. You know, they were, they wasn't about sex. They used to talk about drinks. <laughs> that, that was their conversation. But interestingly, people just didn't get sick. I mean, they Everyone saw the season through. And the crowd was years. very demanding. Wouldn't you agree, Paul? The people you served. Oh, my they, God. Oh, my God. Were... I remember my, my last year at optometry school, Ted Castello and I worked in the Catskills for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur for that, that weekend after Labor Day. And the kitchen ran out of flanken. Flanken is short flanken? ribs of beef. Flanken. It's boiled beef, the short ribs of beef, but it's limited. So you, when it was on the menu, we had flank and then we had boiled chicken. And they, they always had boiled chicken left, but the flank and was, you ran out quickly. And some of the tables didn't get the flank and they vowed revenge. <laughs> you know, Paul, I don't, I don't know that I would eat anything that was called flank and. I mean, it sounds... The description no, yeah, and you wouldn't, food, and, and you wouldn't. You know, there there were foods in the cat schools that you wouldn't want to eat. I remember the yeah. uh, on Friday nights there was a group called the Stanley Wolf Players. These were people in the theater. You know, they were in the theater to give the a, a play for the for the guests at the hotel, and they had dinner on Friday night. And Friday night dinner consisted of uh, gefilte fish to start with. And the Southerners looked at the gefilte fish and said, what is that? Is that sponge? They, didn't, they never knew what, what, what the foods were. So they had to have a, a not a very discerning palate to eat the Catskills. But they food, gave you lots. The food was so unhealthy, Gretchen, you might as well spread it in your arteries and spread it on your thighs. Wait. Uh, oh, yeah. That's where it was going to go. So, Dad, uh, you're, and, Dad you're, <laughs> bearing, you're bearing the lead here. Did they actually eat the gefilte fish? Because I, I'm not going to believe this story if you said they did. <laughs> they, they tried it and, you know, and then spit it, it out. Their mother, <laughs> they, were starving, they were starving actors. You know. <sighs> that was their meal before the play. So, uh, no, no question. Yeah, uh, it's. Uh, I think you get a real flavor of the Catskills if you go see the movie Dirty Dancing. Oh, uh, I love that. that movie. Did you ever see that movie? Yes, I love that movie. I'm a girl of That's the yeah. So, so, a, a Dirty Dancing. Uh, that it was. It was fairly accurate. Uh, that yeah, they people used to bring their daughters up, and it was expected that you'd be dating, you know, seeing the daughters, and the and the daughters we used to help you set up the tables. In the evening, they they would would help you work so they can get get to to dance with them at, at the in the casino in the uh, social hall there. Yep, that's how you got through school. Yep, and this all be an OD wire. <laughs> yes, it'll all. <laughs> well, listen, pe people have to learn history. There's certain things that you don't get in the history books, and then uh, 
and the Casco Mountains. Are, and I think if I had a kid, if, for those years, the you learned about people. Were, Steve, you, you have to admit that you learned about people waiting on them. Oh, absolutely. The, you got really good at it. Yeah, and you just the demands and the the rule of thumb in the Catskills was make sure you have bread on the table. And yep. That that was important because you, you couldn't say serve all the people simultaneously. You but had you, you had to learn how to be a people person. It helped us to be a doctor, really, mm -hmm. because you had to learn yep, how to absolutely. feed people and and be professional. You learned who would want their melon on the table the first day they were there, uh, and who wanted this and who wanted that. And if you didn't do it, they uh, like you were still get a tip, but not as big a tip. And uh, I forget what I made, but I made enough to uh, buy a car, uh, a Corvair, <laughs> unsafe, <laughs> than, yeah. unsafe than any speed. <laughs> the, that was the Ralph Nader car. No, I'm looking at what uh, <laughs> just put up. <laughs> yep. Okay. Oh yeah. So <laughs> I think I don't think Steve's gonna. Uh, you think he's coming? No, I think I think Leo has has, uh, has ditched us. That's okay. Um, you know, we have one more person after this, and then we'll just say you know quickly talk to him, and then I'm gonna go and record this thing so that everyone will know what to do tomorrow uh, with their credits. And I won't send that email out until after the live courses are done tonight. Um, I don't want to interrupt anyone, so. Huh. Well, Odie Wire has been very quiet today. That's well, they're all class. Yeah, they're all, they're all in class. <laughs> Nobody's it's stupid. It, 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 they're going to pick up hours yeah. if they can. Yeah, so so Dad, like you have to understand that a lot, of, like no one, the live stream has been much quieter than usual too, because everybody is trying to get their classes done. If anybody sees this, they're going to be watching the archive of it tonight when it spins out automatically onto the site, um, because and thank God, so they can fast forward. Yeah, they can they can fast forward through a lot of it, um, but yeah, because everyone wants to get these live credits. Think about it; they're as good as gold, right? We're offering yeah. CE credits that are literally an order of magnitude or more cheaper than what people could get if they had to go to a live conference, if they could even leave the house. So every single hour they can get, they're pushing and pushing and pushing. So I, I totally get it. Mm -hmm. And it's consistent. Um, now we're going to 8 o'clock. I thought we were going to 7, so uh, 8 o'clock Eastern time, that is. So uh, I'll continue to post the stuff in the room about, uh, you know, get, doing the credits. but. Uh, Definitely send it out, and I'll, could Cat also send out an email to the, all the attendees about how to do it? Well, I was going to send out an email uh, to all the attendees. I have the list, so I was just going to send it out to them. Um, oh, that's good. That's fine. Yeah, that's cause, great. Because I think everybody gets my emails, right? Everybody got the, you know, they don't usually go into people's spam boxes. And then that movie is also going to be played the second they walk in to the the conference tomorrow. They they can't avoid it. It's going to be right there in the lobby. Okay, and we can do it. it. It's not a problem because they can always they can do it um, in June if they had to. Yep, Nobody exactly. Can lose credits. Exactly, and so if, if people contact us later and say, "Oh my God, I couldn't do it," Cat can just explain to them exactly how to do it again, and they can go back into their control panel uh, and get the mm -hmm. credits. So, one thing my I don't know if she could change it. Um, this is important. Instead of putting the word quiz, put the word um, attendance or so something like that. Attendance sheet or something. In, yeah, that would be great because the quiz does, um, it scares people, number one, and it confuses them, number two. Yeah, Just I'm gonna, the words in that uh, block. Yeah, I'm going to actually email Kat right now. By the way, Mike is to... joining us momentarily. Okay, cool. I'll keep an eye out, and I'll greet him when he comes on so you know he's here. Okay. Yeah, and uh, just that people still know that they can take courses on demand, but then they have to take the quiz. People understand that, I hope. You're putting that somewhere? Yeah, I did, I did. yep. <clears throat> when are we going to okay, make the announcement well, of the next show? After this is over or during? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Well, what we have to do is talk to the speakers and see when they all want to come. So 
that's going to be. Yeah, easy. you can announce all you want, but if you don't have speakers, yeah. <laughs> you're not going to go very far. Yeah, so I, we got to reach out to them and see if they want to do it and when and so forth. Uh, yeah. Well, if they, the they're going to want to do it. Why, why shouldn't they? I mean, if it's you, well, just going to do it on the weekend again? Well, if May 31st, the country's open a little bit, and some of them can move around, they might not want to do it, but uh, they can't make a decision. I don't think it will be, but um, you just don't know. So, oh, let, let's, there's a good uh, chance. Good that, idea. we got plenty of time. Yeah. We could, we could uh, on Monday, send a, a note out to all the speakers on Tuesday uh, saying that um, it was such success, people were very happy. We were complaining they can only do 16 credits. We want to repurpose it again for May 29th to 31st. Who's in, et cetera. That's it, like we did uh, this time. And then again, we still have you until the end of June. So yep. to do it one more time. Hell, I'd do it every weekend. <laughs> 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 oh, well, it, looks you know, like, uh, it looks like we might have Mike on. Mike, can you hear us? Mike, your mic's not on. <laughs> All right, how go. about now? Oh, perfect. Right. Hi, Excellent. Mike, how are you? I am doing well. How is everybody doing? Doing great. It's been a long day. Oh, We're all doing very well. Good. Excellent. Um, I, it's great to talk with you. Uh, everybody looks good, including you, Gretchen. I mean, um, your I compliment to compliments to your groomer, uh, who, whoever that is. <laughs> Gee, thanks. <laughs> well, for anybody who does not know, Mike Brown um, is in practice at a VA in Northern Alabama. He is on the Optometry Times board and he is one of the best writers that Optometry Times is lucky enough to have. He writes blogs for us every so many weeks. Sometimes he writes a longer piece, but if you haven't read his work, then you are truly missing out. So head over to the Optometry Times website, look under blogs or search his name and sit down with a cup of coffee because you'll want to read more than one. Thank you. That's very okay. kind of you. Oh, I appreciate very true. that. Very true. Well, th things are going well here. Um, I have my vanilla and sandalwood stress candle glowing here on the side. I've got a bowl of goldfish crackers, a Diet Coke, and I have my pants on. So uh, it is a very good day. It's a very good day in Alabama. You're doing better than most of us, Mike. Some of us don't have pants on. <laughs> a little bit too much information there, also. <laughs> uh, Michael, what, what is Michael? What does MHS dash CO stand for? Sure, that stands for Master of Health Science and Clinical Leadership. That is a uh, master's degree that I got from the Duke University School of Medicine. Uh, late in my career, I went back to school uh, from 2014 to 2017. Um, there's a lot of lot of backstory to that, but uh, uh, I'd always had a uh, I had been accepted to Duke as an undergrad, and uh, because of uh, the death of my father, I wasn't able to afford it, so I went somewhere else. But uh, I kind of always had a Duke shaped hole in my heart. So uh, later in my life, I was able to go back and fill it. And uh, it was really a great move. I had a, I had a wonderful time. Uh, you know, got to got to be on the student end of things again and interact with a lot of different healthcare professionals from all over the country. Uh, and it was it was a super experience. Great. And and how do you use it now? Well, um, I would say that you know, in my setting, uh, it certainly. You know, if I'm involved in a meeting uh, with, uh, you know, the leadership in our our hospital, I cer I'm certainly more attuned and familiar with uh, the issues and the lingo. Uh, I think I can hold my own, you know, a little bit better, you know, in meetings like that. And uh, just having learned a lot about leadership uh, and how to carry that out in a multidisciplinary setting, it's, it's, uh, it's made me more effective. Uh, during the time that I was in school, uh, I had to learn to be more time efficient, and I think that's carried over uh, into my work at the VA. And I'm just proud to be a Duke grad, uh, regardless. Uh, so, great. Okay. Thanks for the info. 
Yeah. Okay, so, so, Mike, what, what are you seeing out there in terms of, you know, the VA? You know, we, we've spoken to a lot of docs today in different practice settings. You're the first right. one, I think, though, that's in the VA. Uh, so what, what, what's going on? Well, we're, we're sort of like everybody else in that we're not doing, quote, unquote, routine care. Uh, we are officially there for uh, emergent and urgent care. Um, of course, your typical VA clinic is a, is a very high pathology setting. And so what we're having to do uh, right now is that we're, uh, you know, looking at our schedules. And in, in the VA, you always have this situation where demand outstrips resources. Uh, and so I, my schedule goes out, you know, eight to 10 weeks, you know, usually. And so I've been taking uh, it in two week chunks uh, and scrubbing my schedule and trying to triage and trying to figure out uh, just who exactly I need to see, you know, who, who, who needs to take the risk to come out and do a face to face exam with me. And what I've discovered, even though that, you know, we have a very high pathology setting is that I've been able to glean that list down to a pretty small number of people. Uh, and so uh, part of that is I think, you know, I have about 40% of my patients are glaucoma patients. Uh, I've, I'm in my 28th year uh, with the VA in Huntsville. So I'm, I'm kind of like the Pied Piper or primary opening gangle glaucoma. I just have this long line for as far as the eye can see, this merry band of, of uh, glaucoma patients that follow me everywhere I go. So when I started triage and I thought, well, surely I'm going to have to see a lot of these individuals and have them back for their IOP checks and, and visual fields. But that really hasn't been the case. I've been able to to really, uh, you know, I always make sure that their, their medicines are refilled. Uh, I occasionally will call and talk with them and just make sure that we're still on track um, what needs to be done. We're not doing visual fields at all. Uh, and uh, and so the oddly enough, and I wouldn't have thought about this, but now that I think about it, it makes sense. The, the patients that I'm more likely to have back uh, are actually uh, – Patients that I've been monitoring, you know, doing surveillance for their non-proliferative or you know diabetic retinopathy, uh, maybe they've got a little bit of non-centered involved DME, and and you know I need to have them back for serial uh, fundus exams and OCTs, and and the same goes true for AMD patients, uh, higher risk AMD patients, and so those those patients are more likely to go south uh, if if not uh, seen. Uh, than, than our glaucoma patients, because really they're, for the most part, pretty stable. I mean, if they're still in our hands, you know, we're, we're doing medical treatment, you know, maybe they've been out and had some surgery done and come back to us now, you know, they're, they're, they're in pretty good shape. We, um, we have the advantage of being able to mail, you know, drops straight to the patient's door. Uh, and we also have the advantage of being able to um, monitor th whether or not they're getting their refills. And so that, you know, it's not 100% correlation with compliance, but it certainly gives us a good indicator of compliance. So uh, that was a little bit surprising that I'm seeing more retina, you know, that I feel like I need to see more of the retina patients than I do the glaucoma patients. Right. So. You know, I wonder if compliance What's has your... actually increased, right, over the past several weeks, because the very last place anyone really wants to be is near a hospital now. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And so I, I, our calls are definitely down. We are having uh, some true urgent and emergent situations coming in. I mean, people don't stop having strokes or vascular occlusions and foreign bodies just because uh, there's a pandemic. Uh, but we're not seeing as many of those as we normally would uh, in normal times. So what that tells me possibly is that you know, people, well, people may be having less problems because they're staying indoors and doing less, or they may be having problems and are just scared to come. You know, I mean, that's a possibility too. Time will tell, you know, we'll, we'll, as things start to open up, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Sure. What, what kind of protective gear do you have at the VA when you're seeing patients? Yeah, so uh, what we, we are issued one surgical mask per week. Uh, for, for we we prioritized PPE, uh, and so we get one surgical mask per week. We do have a small supply of of N95 masks for when we really need them. Uh, we've been able to obtain uh, face shields. Uh, we have goggles. We have gloves. Uh, 
no disposable gowns, but yesterday I had to spend a lot of time with the patient and I just got one of my lab coats and turned it around backwards and wore it backwards and then brought it home and washed it. So, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. <laughs> Absolutely. Wow. Amazing. Yep. Have you had a shortage shortage of any supplies that you've really needed, like masks, or is that is that not a problem for the VA? Well, not in I would say not in our eye clinic. I think we I think we're okay. I know there's been reports, you know, from other VAs, but I can't really speak to that. So, but but we're we're fine uh, where I'm at. I'm good. Mike, so are you seeing a bunch of emergencies? I mean, I know you talked about it just a few minutes ago that maybe people aren't having as many because they're staying right. indoors and maybe they're scared. So what right. does your typical day look like now? What have you been doing the past few weeks? I would say that we average probably three to five patients coming in per day. Um, <laughs> and <clears throat> what's that? I think that's a lot. You think that's a lot? Okay. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't know how many how that compares, you know, to other settings, but um, so you know, obviously we're taking care of them, and um, like I said, I'm spending a lot of time doing record review, you know, and doing phone calls, and touching bases with patients, um, you know, and that's I had one patient who called me the other day and <clears throat> said, you know, my vision is going going bad and, and do you think you could get me some glasses? Well, I looked at his chart and he's someone who uh, has you know, bilateral uh, CME, post-operative cataract extraction. Uh, he's got uh, primary open angle glaucoma that I've already referred out uh, for uh, to a glaucoma specialist. And so I asked him, I said, have you, have you touched bases with any of your subspecialists since all this started, and he hadn't seen anybody since January, so I, I had him come in, and he had pressures of 54 and 32. So, and the worst worst CME I'd ever seen in my career, uh, and so we were able to get him back on track. But uh, you know, for the most part, um, you know, it's it's uh, like I said, we've been we've been calling people. We do have the means to do live televideo conferencing. Um, we, we have a, a and the VA has a platform called VA Video Connect. And of course, you know, with the relaxation uh, of the rules, you can use just about anything now. Uh, but we haven't really had a lot of, we haven't had a lot of demand for that. And, and part of that may be just our patient demographic, you know, being a little bit older, they just would rather do a good old fashioned phone call, you know, than, than try to do something on the computer. I don't know, maybe. Yeah, Mike, you, you go way back. Uh, you, you should be a direct link to Ken Myers. Did you know Ken? Yeah, I'm. Just, I'm sort of a. I would say, yeah, I know Ken, and I'm sort of a second. I would. I would call myself a second generation uh, uh, VAOD. Uh, there was that first generation that Ken was a part of, uh, and that other people, you know. Um, John Potter and, and Lyman Norman and uh, Bob Newcomb, Jerry Selvin, who's actually still working uh, for the VA. Those those are kind of the OG, you know, those are the original gangsta uh, VA ODs. And I, I'm sort of the second generation. Uh, you know, John was my re residency uh, preceptor. Uh, and he was not with the VA at that time. But uh, and then uh, later I worked, you know, closely with Lyman Norton for years and years. So that's kind of where I stand in the the, the line of succession since Ken. So what's changed uh, for optometry in the VA during your time? Well, um, I would, you know, of, we, we have, I have always been very fortunate um, being in an outpatient setting uh, mm -hmm. to be able to practice very full scope medical. Uh, without, we do not have ophthalmology in, in Huntsville, my location. And uh, early in my career, there was not a very good relationship uh, between optometry uh, and ophthalmology. And that is, that's just not the case anymore. We have a great relationship uh, with, with the ophthalmology department and our medical center in Birmingham. So that has changed dramatically. And, we, we, uh, we, and, and I've seen a change in the attitude of the residents. Uh, the residents, I think, used to sort of be poisoned against us. Uh, but now the residents are very eager, you know, to send patients back to us and only have them back down, you know, to ophthalmology if, if it's needed. And so I, I've seen that's been a very positive change. 
that I've seen, but I know it's not like that in every VA. There's an old saying that if you've seen one VA, you've seen one VA, you know, but, but I've been very fortunate in that regard. And do, do you get uh, optometry students rotating through? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we do. In fact, that's the first, <laughs> that's the, how I found out that our, our way of practice was going to change. It was, I guess, uh, Sunday evening, March the 15th. And I got a text message from our current uh, UAB extern that said he'd been recalled uh, to, to UAB uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, and UAB, I, I you know, checked my email and found out that indeed they had recalled all uh, uh, externs and they were shutting down routine dental care uh, you know, and eye care. And that was my first indication. I mean, I've been following things, of course, but I thought, okay, this is real now. Uh, and because of our close affiliation uh, with uh, the VA's close affiliation with UAB, I, I knew that it was going to change our our mode too. And that ha you know, so that really happened on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and then by sort of Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of that week, it was you know spreading that that was spreading across the country. So, uh, but but we do have uh, externs and. Uh, you know, I, I, they seem to have a good time in our clinic. Uh, you know, for those that are, those that are going to go on and do a residency, I've always called it boot camp. Uh, and for those who aren't going to do a residency, I would just, I've called it a residency in a bottle because, uh, you know, they, they get three or four months worth of intense uh, disease experience. All right. Their question just came up. Someone is listening uh, mm -hmm. and he's asking, Yes, I'm being drawn to this conversation. Well, it's great to hear at least one person is here <laughs> listening and watching us. <laughs> His question is, is he, is he teaching a course? Uh, are you giving a course? Uh, giving a course in yeah. this? No, 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 I'm not. I'm not one of the lecturers. You're not invited. How, how could you? Well, um, how could I, you I was about to invite Mike um, to do it uh, next time we run one. Um, would you be willing to do a course? And, you're fantastic. You come highly recommended. I'm Steve, by the way. Oh, uh, I, I'd be. Come on, let's give credit where credit is due. What did I just text you? I, you said, get Mike to speak because he's great, and I said I will, and I did. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, uh, Gretchen gets the um, finder's fee. <laughs> all right. So, so noted. So noted. And okay. Steve, I'd be happy to. Uh, I'd be happy to. I'll send to. you all the information um, at right. the appropriate time. Great. All right. Uh, Excellent. Uh, it just has to be an eye care. You can't do it on, um, you know, uh, uh, horror movies or things like that. <laughs> okay. I'll see what I can do. I... Great. Mike, how is your staff handling all of this? Mm. Do you have staff who are okay coming to work? Do you have some who are concerned? We're adjusting. Uh, I think everybody's a little bit more comfortable than they were a few weeks ago. Uh, we had st one staff member who was a person, a PUI, a person under investigation for a period of about three weeks. And so we were, we were kind of holding our breath. Uh, you know, they had all the COVID-19 signs and symptoms, but uh, subsequently they've tested, uh, tested uh, negative uh, on the, was it, PCR test uh, twice and uh, tested negative on the antibody as well. So, so she's in the clear, but you know, it just shows how confounding all this can be because there's just so much out there that can mimic it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody's just on edge. And uh, so that would have had a really adverse impact <laughs> on our, our operations to say the least uh, had she tested positive. So we're, we're really happy that she's okay and doing well and, and that we're, we're still going. So, but that's good to hear. So how do you think you're looking in your area in terms of opening things back up? Because not uh, just a little bit to your east yes. there is Georgia, who apparently I can go get my hair done, a manicure, and a yeah. tattoo. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I'll preface all this with saying that, you know, Alabama um, – you know, we're known for our football. I mean, there's no doubt that we're great in football. Roll uh, tide. Yeah, yeah, roll tide. So, but however, in other uh, realms of existence uh, that are arguably more important than football, uh, we have traditionally kind of been in a, in a very fast race to the bottom uh, with our neighbors uh, for whatever 
uh, quote unquote distinction that might be education, healthcare. I will say this: uh, we are doing pretty good uh, in Alabama. Um, you know, you know, again, there's the those are the confounding test the, the, or the confounding problem that the, the lack of testing and we, the numbers we have probably aren't exactly correct. But assuming that's the case everywhere, we're still relatively speaking uh, not at the bottom this time. And we're so thankful for that. We're kind of in the middle where, where we're hap very happy to be. Um, I think there's a few factors for that. Um, locally, uh, Huntsville has done very well. We um, we're a pretty smart little metro area, uh, highly educated. Of course, we built the Saturn V back in the back in the '60s, and so we still got you know rocket scientists. You know, you can throw a rock and hit a rocket scientist, and so um, so we got a pretty educated community. They can process medical information, and I would say compliance with uh, social distancing and masking up has been very good. And as a result, our numbers are are very low. Plus, plus you got to remember that rocket scientists, really smart people, tend to be introverts. And so uh, this is a time when introverted uh, people like me can just rise up, you know, and conceal ourselves uh, uh, and and maybe save the world. So I, there, there's I, I think that accounts for a little bit of what we're seeing in Huntsville. Now, as far as the success statewide, uh, our governor, uh, Governor Kay Ivey, has so far uh, resisted a lot of pressure uh, to reopen. In fact, she said uh, that, well, the, the, it's set to expire on the 30th, so we'll see. Uh, but yesterday she said, we are looking at data. Uh, we are not looking at a specific date. And so um, I, I can only conjecture as to what, uh, what the reasons for that might be. I think that you know, she is likely in her last term, uh, and I think that she would uh, prefer that her legacy uh, be one of uh, – doing the right thing uh, and saving lives rather than doing what a certain person or a certain group of people want her to do. Um, and uh, the other thing I think that helps is that we have UAB here in Alabama, our flagship uh, healthcare system. And they're the second largest employer uh, in our state after the Department of Defense. And so they wield a lot of influence. And so um, I, I, I'm, I'm, Proud of Alabama, roll tide. I mean, so far so good. We'll we'll see what happens next week, and as we kind of you know open up the valve, uh, hopefully we won't uh, you know get a second peak. But right now we're in you know we're 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 on the right uh, trajectory, you know according to that phase one you know criteria that that were put out not too long ago. So that's really good to hear. Um, and that was the best explanation of why and how you think decisions are being made in a state. I really appreciate all of that context. That's actually mm -hmm. really, really cool. And especially given that you're in an area where, where people are under pressure to open up. Right. So I'm really glad that you guys are keeping it safe. How are you handling it personally? Um, just you and your family hanging mm -hmm. out? I mean, is there... Um, you know, are there challenges there? Are things going smoothly? And I mean, we talked to a guy earlier who's loving life with his kids, making cupcakes and sitting in a hot tub. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. is that you? Are you making cupcakes and sitting in a hot tub? Well, you know, I still have the regular rhythm of getting up and going into the office. And so, um, you know, and it's a different office atmosphere, but I am still going to work, you know, most days. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that that much is kind of the same, but uh, but you know, I am taking more time off, um, you know, and it's been an adjustment. I mean, it's just, uh, it takes you out of your, your regular realm of existence and forces you to be maybe a little bit more creative. Uh, we're certainly doing, a, we're certainly watching a lot of Netflix, uh, like everybody else and, and, uh, doing a lot of reading and, uh, it's just overall quieter. You know, the, the T since I'm a big sports nut, so there's not any live sports, so the TV's off more. Uh, you know, I, I don't watch network news. I, I get my most of my news from Twitter, uh, you know, quality Twitter feeds. Uh, and so the TV's off more. And that's not a half bad thing, you know. So. Right. Yeah. How is it with um, I know that you wrote a piece for us just a couple of weeks ago about how your fashion is changing <laughs> uh, during this. Would you uh, talk a little bit about that? Because I oh, love that. Absolutely. Um, first of all, I should have made this, the switch to scrubs a long time ago. 
uh, it, but I just, you know, whether my reason is sound or not, I felt like since I, I felt like I needed to wear fewer clothes uh, when I went to the clinic because <laughs> there's just less surface area there for the any stray viruses, you know, to cling on to. So I bought some scrubs, some really nice scrubs. Uh, they're very soft, very stylish. They fit me good. Uh, and you can't wear pajamas to work. Uh, but this is the closest thing you can get to wearing pajamas to work. Um, so I, I should have done it a long time ago. Uh, my my choice of footwear also has has been altered somewhat. Uh, I noted in that article that I'm a big uh, sneakerhead and I, I love retro uh, kicks and wear them regularly. But what I'm doing now is uh, when I get to work, I'm taking those off and. You know, wow, I, this is kind of embarrassing, but I, I've got a pair of black Crocs uh, that I'm wearing now. Um, so uh, I'd always kind of poked fun at those. Uh, uh, but uh, now I'm seeing what now I'm seeing why so many healthcare professionals wear them. They're super comfortable. Um, and the, the other I, I decided to do a little bit of upgrading and improvement in my office during this time. I bought a uh, a, a sit to stand desk riser. Um, that I can, you know, I can alternate between standing at my desk and sitting. Uh, I have a badly ruptured uh, disc at L4, L5, which needs repairing, but of course I can't get it repaired right now. And and standing more during the day has really helped me tremendously. So I, I have a ergonomic mat that I have at the that I'm standing on most of the time. And so rather than having to tie my shoes to go see a patient, I'm able to just slip into the Crocs and off I go. So and 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 did you know that Crocs come in different colors? and different designs. So I'm excited oh, yeah. about that. Uh, you are excited. You are pathetic. <laughs> uh, Mike, by the way, um, just interject. I've been doing scrubs for 25 years. Yeah. Number one, I wanted to project a medical image in a private yeah. practice and yeah. it worked. Yeah. Number two, like you said, I'm comfortable because my pajamas when I go home. Right. Um, number three, the clogs that I wear are very comfortable and they, yes. they segue to be garden things after they get dirty enough. Uh, uh -huh. Great to wear on the beach, et cetera, light. So um, it worked both professionally and um, and they're deductible. They're uniforms. So, um, <laughs> that, that, yeah, that's right. I've yeah. got every color. My staff, we coordinate. They call every night to each other, and then they wear a color. I wear something different. My, my yeah. uh, associates do also. So great move, and I think that's going to be the new trend, scrubs or yeah. something more comfortable because we don't have to wear suits and ties when we're wearing masks and uh, gloves. I, I and, and when I come home, I can just, you know, there's a washer right by uh, my garage. And if I've, I've had a, a day where I feel like I might have, you know, been exposed to something, I can just ditch them and then, you know, run through the house and get in the shower. So, yep. yep. I even wear them to the gym as my, well, uh, pants. They're, they're much more comfortable than uh, mm -hmm. wearing some other things, some other uh, sweat. So you did the right thing. Yeah, and as I noted in that article, if you have to stop and buy something on the way home, you get not only – people see you in scrubs, they, they give you 12 feet instead of 6 feet, you know. So, I mean, it's like, it's like the Red Sea party, you know, when you, when you walk down the aisle. So. Another addition, which I forgot in private practice, when they see you in scrubs and you're in a store, like you say, going to buy stuff on the way home, you cultivate patients. People come over to you, what do you do, et cetera. Oh, here's my card. So in essence, I'm a brain uh, surgeon. Uh, well, uh, yes, <laughs> I, I say that when they come into you, obviously they realize that um, it's a no brain surgeon. Uh, but uh, no, but it is a, a poster advertisement also for private mm -hmm. practitioners. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So there Mike, you do, you, um, do you know Phil Morgan in the UK? I do not. I might have to connect you on Facebook because okay. he has been a Crocs aficionado for years <laughs> and has endured so much abuse from folks. And now, of course, you know that I'm just going to bust your shoes literally all the time over this. Well, I may need the support. So that that probably would be a good idea. My poor <laughs> long wife, I've, I, I don't it's not like I have a walk in closet like you would see on MTV Cribs, you know, full of retro <laughs> sneakers. But I do have probably twice as many shoes as she does. And so if I start buying Crocs, then I'm I'm worried that, you know, that there might be some marital discord resulting from that. But <laughs> but if I buy them on the sly and just keep them at the office, then that's a different situation. 
That is so pathetic. You, you, <laughs> you have a croc collection on the down low, and that's your guilty pleasure. All right. Oh, my well, God. Oh, and, my God. And with that, we, we have to let you go because we got to wrap it up here. We're actually finishing up for the day here, and I've got to go shoot okay. some videos to figure out how to tell people to get their credits because people have been yelling at us all day about not getting their appropriate <laughs> co-credits. So. Uh, but thank you so much for being here. And definitely, if you want to do the next CUI, or apparently we're doing this again in like 29 days or something. So okay. <laughs> if you feel like submitting a talk, happy to run it through for you. All right. And, uh, I'll, give it a yeah, shot. I, I, should, I'll, I'll, I should be able to get something together. <laughs> awesome. Mike, I am so glad that you were able to join us this afternoon. I always enjoy talking to you anyway. And now I'm getting to spread the gospel of Mike Brown. So thank you. I I appreciate that. It's been great talking with all of you, and it's not as good as face to face, but it's still very good. And we will be together face to face again. We will. We will. All right. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mike. All right. Thanks, Take Mike. care, guys. Talk to you soon. Right. Bye bye. Okay. So. So nice guy. So I guess Mike we. Mike is fabulous. Yeah, he, he sounds great. We should definitely should, should get him into the next go around uh, in May. So. I guess to summarize, what have we learned today? <laughs> uh, we I learned guess... that Mike Brown wears Crocs. Yep. We learned that people in the South are passionate about their football. Yep. Um, we have learned that we need to better use the mute button when Paul and Steve start reminiscing yes. about the <laughs> That is absolutely in true. New York City area. We've learned we that art, learned... art can talk indefinitely if you just let him go. That's right. I was texting him and saying, we need to make this more of a conversation than a soliloquy. And he didn't see my text until too late because I, I, was, I had questions I wanted to ask him. And we didn't have the opportunity, but he, he has a wealth of knowledge on a bunch of topics. So you just need to hit the play button for him and he's off to the races. <laughs> what else did we learn? Uh, um, we, we learned that the software can withstand several thousand people taking classes at once, which is something I didn't think it could. So congratulations, software, for not dying. Um, yeah, that's good to know. So we also uh, we learned that people we learned that people are actually watching us. Yeah. Yes. That is Maybe true. Maybe it might be only one, but that's good. Small small crowd. We've we've also learned that we need to clarify the instructions on people getting credit because that's something that we have to have fixed by tomorrow. So as soon as I get out of here, I'm going to go talk to Cat on the phone, and uh, fix up the way it reads and uh, one one more problem solved. So every time we do this, there's always something new. Um, so just yeah. make her aware, of Dr. Larry Wang's lecture, W A N. Mm -hmm. um, the quiz um, only comes up with the OE track. It doesn't have a second question. I can't get into it. Let me see if I can get into the help thing, but I don't think so. Let me go in here. Because that's just a special case of something that's not working. Yeah. It's called, uh, what is it, technology? Is expensive until it's not or something. I forgot the exact title, but it's. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's not caught. It's, yeah, something like that. Technology is, is expensive unless it differentiates your patient practice uh, through patient outcomes. Right. There you go. Yeah, it, yeah, it's not, well, it's not appearing yet because it didn't have to go to 6 o'clock. When it goes to 6 o'clock, I'll look in the um, tab in the help room. But on the regular lecture, when I clicked on the tab, it mm -hmm. gives the OE tracker number, but then it doesn't have that next question to say, right. yes, I'm here, whatever. So if you could and let Kat know, that would help me. And I'm going to go run off here okay. and try to try to get this done. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do Kat and this, okay? Okay. And I guess uh, we'll be back at the same time tomorrow, right? So yep. more, more same time, games. Same time, Yeah. Well, thank, thank you guys for, uh, for doing this today. Uh, even though it's a little weird not having you here, I got my, my friend the dog here, but uh, yeah, but I think it worked pretty well. Yeah, okay, I really great job, I'm really not to be there in person, but it was still great to be a part of it. Thank you for including me, and you oh. need to talk to Mr. Reed and let him know that he needs to say hello tomorrow. He will. He'll be he'll be around tomorrow. He wants to hang out. So and it looks like tomorrow afternoon, you know, so far we're pretty pretty uh, clear, so we should definitely have him have him come on. Alrighty. All right. Thanks, everybody. Okay. I'll see you Have a nice tomorrow. evening, guys. Okay. Thanks, guys. See you tomorrow morning. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.